click the bell icon to turn on notifications. We've made the accompanying exercise files for this tutorial available for free. Just click the link below in the video details to get these. Hello everyone and welcome to this training course for Word 2019 Advanced. My name's Deborah Ashby and I'm an IT trainer specializing in the design, delivery and facilitation of Microsoft courses, both online and in the classroom. And I've been in and around the IT industry for about 25 years now and I've been an IT trainer since 2007. Now I started my career on an IT help desk helping people fix their documents and spreadsheets before transitioning into training. And a large part of my career has been spent working as a trainer in law firms. And as anyone who works in the legal industry will know, it is a very document heavy environment. So I found myself using Word to a really high level every single day. So over the course of the years that I worked in this industry, I really got to understand how Word works, how it's used in the real world, how to troubleshoot long, complex documents, and I also picked up lots of tips and tricks to make producing documents much more efficient. Now this training course is predominantly designed for people using Word 2019, either the standalone desktop version or the latest version available through Microsoft 365. I will say, however, there is a lot of crossover with older versions. So if you're using Word 2016 or maybe even Word 2013, you should still be able to follow through this training course without too many issues. But just be aware that there are some features available in Word 2019 that aren't available in those older versions. Now this is an advanced Word training course, so I'm going to make a few assumptions. I'm going to assume that you have a working copy of Word 2019 on your PC or laptop. I'm also going to assume that you have a good understanding of basic Word functionality, either gained through everyday use or maybe from completing a Word for Beginners training course. And finally, I'm going to assume that you know the basic terminology used in Word. So terms such as ribbon, tab, group, right click, dialog box, things like that. Now this course is divided up into sections and each section is related to a particular topic in Word. And what you'll find within that section is a number of different modules or lessons. And each module contains one demo video that's usually between five and 15 minutes long. You'll find all of the files that I use in these demo videos in the course files folder. So you can download those and follow along if you want to. And then at the end of each section, there is a practice exercise that will allow you to practice the skills that you've learned in the section. So with all that said, and without further ado, let's dive into our first module where I'm going to run through with you where you can go to access help at any point during this course. Once again, my name is Deb. I'm really excited to get into this course with you. So all that's left to do is grab a drink and prepare to immerse yourself in the wonderful world of Word 2019. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. This is Deb and it's my absolute pleasure to be guiding you through this course. And currently we are in section one, which is the introductory section. And I just want to start out by running through with you where you can go within Word to get help at any point during this course. Now Word has some really good features when it comes to accessing help. So it might be that you need help on a specific command or task or maybe you just want to access some resources and read up about something a little bit more. So in this module, we're just gonna run through a few of the options that you have. So on the screen here, I just have a document that I've created and you'll see that this just has some junk text in it, which doesn't really make too much sense. But that's fine in this case, because we're not actually going to be doing anything with this text. We just need to have a document open so we can explore the help options. Now the eagle-eyed amongst you may see up here on our ribbons, we have an entire ribbon dedicated to help. Now if this ribbon isn't turned on or you can't see it in your copy of Word, it might be that you need to go into the backstage area and just enable that ribbon. So let me quickly show you how to do that if you can't see this help tab. 
So we're going to go across to the file tab and all the way down into our word options. And this is where you'll basically find all of those little options that control word and define how your copy of word is set up. Now, when you're looking to enable or disable any ribbons, you'll find these options under the customize ribbon section. And in this pane on the right hand side, this is where you'll see all of your ribbons laid out. And you'll see right at the bottom, I have the help ribbon ticked. So if you can't see this ribbon, it's probably because you don't have a tick in this box and so it's not displaying. So just make sure you do pop a tick in there, click on OK, and you should find you can then see your help ribbon. Now in this help ribbon, we just have one group. And the first option here is just plain old help. And as you can see, we can also press the F1 key on our keyboard as a shortcut to the help screen. So let's click on it. And what you'll see is that you get a help pane open up at the side. Now this pane is somewhat customizable. So if it's a bit too wide for you or even a bit narrow, if you hover your mouse over the boundary, you'll see I get that double headed arrow and I can drag in or I can drag out. And all of the help is categorized into different groups. So for example, if I click on get started at the top, you can see I get a helpful little video about some of the basics of Word. So this one is related to creating a document. If I scroll down, you'll see I also get written out instruction as well. And it goes through some of those basic things that you need to know in Word. So really very useful. If you want to go back to that main menu, you have a back arrow, which I'm going to click. And you can then dive in and have a browse through some of these other sections. So this one, for example, has numerous different subcategories. So if I wanted to know how to create a bulleted or numbered list, I can click on this. Again, I get a little video and also some written instruction. So quite a few items in there for you to have a browse through if you're looking for something in particular. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll also see that you have a list down here of top tasks. So these are popular help items that again, you might want to have a read through. So for example, if I wanted to know how to add a watermark, I'm going to come into here. Again, I get my little video that I can play. And then I have some more links at the bottom for related tasks. And if you ever just want to get back to that main home screen, you can click on the little icon here that looks like a house. And that's going to take you back to that main menu. And of course, just above, you also have a search. So if you know specifically what you're looking for, so maybe I want to uh, insert a table. I can type that in. I can see it comes up from the list. And there we go. Once I select it, it then pulls back all of the relevant topics to my search term. I can then click on that link. And once again, I'm taken through to a video and written instruction. So a fairly comprehensive help file that's available for you to access at any time simply by pressing the F1 shortcut key. Now, the other things that you have within this help group, you have a contact support button. So as we hover over, the screen tip says get help from an office support agent. So if we click on this, it's again going to open up a pane on the right hand side. And you can see I'm getting a message saying they're sorry, but they're currently unable to provide phone support. But you could, if you wanted to type in a message into here and send that off to Microsoft. Now, how quickly you'll get a reply on that, I do not know, but that option is there if you need it. You can also provide feedback on anything in Word. So you can let Microsoft know if you particularly like something or if you don't like something, or even if you have some kind of suggestion. And I will say that I do know that these are collated by Microsoft and a lot of the suggestions from their customers are integrated into newer versions. So if you do have something that you want to tell them, then that feedback button is there. We also have a show training option. So let's take a look at this. And this is basically going to show you some online training and learning content. So again, it really depends what it is that you're interested in. So maybe I was looking for some help on formatting text. I can click on this section just here. And again, it's going to take me into those help files. So this is really another way of getting to those help files. And then finally, we have a what's new button. And this is quite a useful little button because Microsoft are always changing things in these applications. 
Some are very minor updates, some are quite major, but sometimes I like to jump in here, click on what's new, just so I can see anything new that's been added since the last time that I checked. So whilst there's nothing new right now, I can see what the last feature that was released was, and that was the ability to be able to type hands-free using a microphone. So it's always worth keeping your eye on this area so you can keep up to date with any changes and new features. So that is your help ribbon. Now, another way to obtain help, which essentially is gonna jump you into the same help file, is you have this little box at the top that says search. And if I hover over, you'll see that the actual name for this box is tell me. And in older versions, it used to be called tell me what you want to do, but I think in this version, they've definitely shortened that down. And you can see that this also has a keyboard shortcut of Alt plus Q. Now what we do with this is we can start to type in a search term and it will go away and search the help files for us. So if I wanted some help on uh, themes, I can type themes into the top there. And what it's gonna give me is it's gonna show me where themes is located. So instead of hunting around the ribbons to try and find where I would change my document theme, it's actually taken me straight to it in this little shootout menu at the side. So I could come in here and I could just change my theme. Alternatively, if I didn't particularly want to apply a theme at this stage, maybe I was just looking for some help, you'll see underneath it says get help on, and then it says that there are 10 results for themes. So again, if I click on this, it's gonna pop open that help pane and jump me to the section in help that relates to themes. And I can then go through, click on my different sections to try and find what it is that I'm looking for. So that tell me box at the top can be really useful when it comes to navigating or trying to find where different commands are located on the ribbons and also for quickly accessing help. So that is it on help. Those are all the resources that you have. They are fairly comprehensive and I do find myself diving in and out of them reasonably often when I'm not sure how to do something or if I just want to read a more in-depth explanation about a task, tool or command. That's it for this module. In the next module, we're going to be doing an exercise to practice some of the things that we've been over in the introductory section. And then we're going to move on to section two, where the real work starts. So I'm going to jump over to the exercise now, and I look forward to seeing you there. For the next section, you'll want to download the course exercise files. Click the link below in the video description to get these. You can also scroll through the details to find timestamps for each section in this course. If you're enjoying this training, please leave us a comment. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. This is Deb and we are down into our first exercise, exercise one. And in this exercise and all of the exercises hereafter, we're just going to practice some of the skills that we've learnt in this section. Now, this is the introductory section, but there are a couple of things I'd like you to practice before moving on to section two. So the first part of this exercise is very straightforward. I just want you to make sure that you have Word open with a blank document on the screen, as I have here. And I'd like you to check the version of Word that you're using. In the second part of the exercise, I'd like you to search through the help files for keyboard shortcuts. I want you to find the keyboard shortcut for closing a document, and then I'd like you to use that keyboard shortcut to close the open blank document that you have on the screen. So if you want to practice that, then you can pause this video now. If you've already completed this exercise and you want to see my answer, then carry on playing the video. So let's take a look at the answer to this exercise. The first thing I asked you to do was to check the version of Word that you're using. So to do that, we go up to the File tab and we go down to the Account section. And this is where you'll find that information. And you can see here that I'm using Microsoft Office Professional Plus 2019. Let's click on Back. The second part of the exercise, I asked you to do a search through the help files for keyboard shortcuts. So I'm going to jump up to my search box at the top here, and I'm going to do a search for keyboard shortcuts. And what you'll see is below I have 10 help results for keyboard shortcuts, so let's click. 
and the top link here is keyboard shortcuts in Word. Now I asked you to search for the keyboard shortcut that will close a document. So if you scroll down through keyboard shortcuts and down to frequently used shortcuts, you'll see in here you have an option to close the document, which is Control plus W. So now we know what that keyboard shortcut is, I'm just going to use that to close this document, Control W. And that is it. I hope you got on OK with that exercise and I will see you in the next section. Hello everyone, this is Deb and welcome back to our course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're now down into section two and in this section we're going to be covering some essential skills that you should have when you're working in Word 2019. Now I know that this is an advanced course and we will be working through some of the advanced features of Word but it's really important that we just solidify the skills that we have in Word, make sure that we know those essentials, those basics, in order to give ourselves a good foundation in which to progress on from. And what I hope to show you in this particular section is some of the things that you need to have turned on, some of the things that you need to know how to access or implement in Word in order to be able to achieve some of those more advanced skills. And even if you are aware of some of these things that I'm going to show you in this section, hopefully you'll pick up some extra tips and tricks which will help you work in Word more efficiently. Because that's what we're really aiming for here. We all work in a very time-pressed environment, at least most of us do, where we want to be able to use Word in the most efficient way possible in order to get our tasks done. And that really leads on to what I want to start out in this module with, and that is talking a little bit about the ribbon, screen tips, and those all important keyboard shortcuts. So let's start out with the latter. Let's talk about keyboard shortcuts. Now, keyboard shortcuts are a great way to increase your efficiency when you're working in Word, whether you're just trying to open files, move around a document, or invoke certain commands or dialog boxes. They're just a quick way of doing that so that your hands don't have to leave the keyboard. And you might think, well, you know, I don't mind using my mouse. And that is entirely up to you. If you're really comfortable using your mouse to do things, then that's absolutely fine. But you probably would be surprised how much quicker it is if you're already typing, if you already have your hands on the keyboard. It's a lot easier just to invoke a quick keyboard shortcut as opposed to moving your hands to your mouse and then trying to carry out whatever task you're trying to do. So we're going to start out by looking at some of those key keyboard shortcuts. Now, there are so many keyboard shortcuts in Word, and if you're anything like me, you won't memorize them all. There are hundreds of them, but you will pick up a few along the way, which you'll find yourself using all the time. So let's start out by taking a look at a few of them, and then I'm going to show you where you can access the entire list, which you can then print off if you want to, and utilize the ones you need. So currently on the screen, I just have Word open. I don't currently have a document open. So let's start out by doing that. If I press the keyboard shortcut, Control N, that's going to give me a new blank document. If I wanted to open an existing document, Control O is gonna take me into that open screen in the backstage area, and I can then go in and choose to open one of my recent documents. Alternatively, I can browse for a document to open. Now I'm not going to do that, I'm happy with my blank document, so if I want to go back to my blank document, I can click the back arrow up here, alternatively the shortcut for that is the escape key. So I've got my blank document and let's just get some text in here. Now I'm not too concerned about what this text is at this stage, but this is another useful little tip. If you ever want some junk text, just some random text in a document, Sometimes if you want to maybe play around with layouts or try out some things, you don't really want to do it on an actual document. It's quite nice just to be able to quickly get some lines of text in your document so that you can do that. So a quick tip is you can type in equals rand, which stands for random, open a bracket and then define how many paragraphs you want and how many lines within that paragraph. So I'm gonna say I want 40 paragraphs of six lines each, close my bracket, looks very much like an Excel command, hit enter, and that is exactly what I get. 
Now you can see it's jumped me all the way down to the bottom of my document. So if I want to jump back up to the top, a keyboard shortcut I can use is Control Home to get me all the way back up there. And you can probably guess what's coming next. Control End key is going to jump me to the bottom. So this is essentially random text that I have in my document. I'm going to show you another way to enter random text. So what I want to do is I want to essentially undo what I've just done. So we have a keyboard shortcut for that, and it is Control Z. And I'm going to Control Z again and again to get rid of that little piece of code. So the other way I can enter random text is type in equals Lauren and then do exactly the same thing. This time I'm going to have 20 paragraphs of 10 lines each. Hit enter and I get that Lorem Ipsum test text. Control home to jump me up to the top of the document. Now when it comes to navigating efficiently around your document, again, there are a few different keyboard shortcuts that you can use. Now you're probably already aware that you can use your left, right, up and down arrows to move across one character. But if you just add in the control key, so I'm going to do control key and right arrow, that's going to jump me to each new word. And I can use the left arrow to go back again. If I do control shift right arrow, it's going to highlight those words as I go across. Left arrow is going to unhighlight them or deselect them. And if I hold down control and do my down arrow, that's going to jump me to the next paragraph and the up arrow will jump me to the paragraph above. Now, when it comes to making selections, again, there's a few important keyboard shortcuts that you should know. We've just seen one of them. We can select an entire word simply by doing control, shift, right arrow, and I can carry on doing that to select each word. And if I want to select the entire line, I just need to do shift and end to select that line. I could then move down by doing shift down arrow to carry on selecting lines like so. And of course, shift up arrow does the opposite. If I do shift home, it's going to deselect. And of course, a really important keyboard shortcut, if you just want to select everything in your document, control A will select all. So some really important keyboard shortcuts there, by no means all of them, but some ones that I personally use frequently. Let's now jump into our document and add a quick title. So we're just going to call this Lorem Ipsum. Now I want to make this title stand out a little bit. So of course we have keyboard shortcuts for some of our font formatting as well. So I'm clicked at the end of the title at the moment. So if I do control shift home, it's going to select the entire title. And then if I want to make that bold, control B is going to give me bold. Control I is going to make that italic. And if I wanted to apply an underline as well, Control U is going to give me an underline. Now, if I decided at this stage I wanted to do some more advanced font formatting, I might want to jump into the font formatting dialog box. And again, there is a quick way to do that. If we do Control D, that's going to jump us straight into that font formatting dialog box. So it might be that I want to come in here and maybe change the underline style to double underline, click on OK, and there we go. And if at this stage I want to do something like increase the font size, if I hold down Control, Shift, and then use my angle bracket, or what you might know as the greater than sign on your keyboard, I can increase my font size. And if I use the other angle bracket or the less than symbol on the keyboard, and that will take that font size back down again. Now at this stage, I'm currently working in an unsaved document. So you can see at the top in the title bar, it says document four, which tells me that I haven't yet saved this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this to a folder that I have on my PC. And a quick way to jump into that save as dialog box is to press the F12 key. And that's going to pop up my local folders. So I'm just going to select a folder to save this into. And we're going to select the section two folder. I'm happy with the name lorem ipsum docx. I'm going to click save. And there we go. We now have a saved document. Now, as I said, those are just a few of the keyboard shortcuts that are available in Word. But if you do want to see a full list of them, you can do that very simply from within Word. So right at the top here where we have this search bar, if we click in here and type in keyboard 
shortcuts, you can see just here we have 10 results in the help section within Word. So if I click on this, it's going to open up a pane on the right hand side, which is essentially going to jump me into Word's help facility. And you'll see here all of the matches that we have for keyboard shortcuts. So lots of information in here. But if you purely just want a list so you can see all of the keyboard shortcuts available, it's this top link that you're going to want, keyboard shortcuts in Word. And here we go. Now this is a pane that you can pop out. If I just grab the top and just drag it, I can then make this as big as I want to make it easier for me to read. And it's going to go through all of the different keyboard shortcuts organized into helpful topics. So you can see here at the top, it says frequently used shortcuts. If I click on this, it's going to show me all of those keyboard shortcuts available to open a document, create a new document, save, so on and so forth. So this might be something that you want to print out, or it just might be something that you want to refer to from time to time, but really useful to know where to access that information. Now, it's also worth noting that you can customize keyboard shortcuts. So if you want to essentially assign your own shortcuts to certain things in Word, then you can definitely do that as well. If we jump up to the file menu and we're in the backstage now, so we're going to go down to options right at the bottom and you'll find your keyboard shortcut customization options underneath customize ribbon. And right at the bottom here where it says keyboard shortcuts, we have a customize button. And we can now go in and look through the different categories and the different commands and set up our own keyboard shortcuts. So what you'll see is that for some of these, there are already keyboard shortcuts. So for example, if I click on File Open, you can see that we have these two current keyboard shortcuts assigned. Now I could go in and change that or add another one if I wanted to, but just be aware of this when you are setting your keyboard shortcuts. So let's quickly add in a new keyboard shortcut. I'm going to scroll down and let's say for file close. Now I'm going to add a new keyboard shortcut and this is going to be Control Shift Y. Now I can see underneath that this isn't currently assigned to anything and that is exactly what I'm looking for. What you need to be careful of is using shortcut keys that are already assigned to other things. So you want to make sure it says unassigned under here. And when you're happy with it, you can click on Assign and Close and click on OK. And now let's test to see if this works. I'm going to close this document down, Control Shift Y, and there we go. If I want to reopen the document, I can do Control O. And there it is at the top of my list. Now, Word is also quite helpful. It does show you what the keyboard shortcuts are for each command when you hover over them. And we're now moving into talking about screen tips. And that is exactly where we're going to pick up in the next module. So please join me for that. Hi everyone and welcome back to our course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're down in section two where we're just recapping some of those Word essential skills to give us a good foundation from which to build from. And in the previous module, I ran you through some of those essential keyboard shortcuts and also showed you where you can find a big long list of all of the keyboard shortcuts available in Word to help you become more efficient. And we finished up that module by talking about screen tips. And that's really what I want to concentrate on in this particular module. Now, screen tips, if you're not sure what I mean when I say that word, you've probably come across them in your everyday usage, but maybe just not have known what they're called. And all a screen tip is essentially is when you hover over any of the commands on the ribbon. So, for example, if I hover over Format Painter, you'll see that I get that little informational box pop up there. So it's essentially giving me some really useful information about what that command does but it's also showing me the keyboard shortcuts available for that command. Now it's worth noting that not every single command on the ribbon will have a keyboard shortcut, but the majority of them do. So again, if I hover over bullets, I can see there, it's telling me that I can use this button to create a bulleted list. If I hover over bold, it tells me what that command does and also shows me that keyboard shortcut. So this is a really useful little option. If you want to know what the keyboard shortcut is of a particular command, you can utilize that screen tip. 
Now again, you will notice that you don't have a keyboard shortcut listed in all of the screen tips. So again, if I hover over the numbering command, you can see there it tells me what that command does, but it's not showing me the keyboard shortcut. So just bear that in mind when you're hovering over. Now, if you're somebody who maybe doesn't like having those screen tips pop up, sometimes they can be a little bit annoying, or maybe you just want to customize the style of the screen tip, then you can definitely do that as well. And as you probably guessed, we can do that from File and Options. So you'll find your screen tip options underneath the general area. And if we take a look under User Interface Options, this first section just here, at the bottom we have Screen Tip Style. So this is where you can come in and you have three options when it comes to customizing those screen tips. So you can select to show feature descriptions in screen tips. So that's the description of what that command does. You can say don't show feature descriptions in screen tips. So that will remove it. And you can select to not show screen tips at all. So if I was to select don't show screen tips and click on OK, you'll now see that when I hover over something like Format Painter, I'm not getting that screen tip pop up. Now, I actually do like to have my screen tips turned on. So I'm going to go back here and I'm going to say show feature descriptions in screen tips. Now, another thing you can customize when it comes to screen tips is whether or not that shortcut key is shown in the screen tip. Now, again, I find this really useful, but if for some reason you don't want to have that showing, if you jump across to the advanced area and we're going to scroll all the way down to display, you can see here there is an option which I currently have ticked that says show shortcut keys in screen tips. So again, if you didn't want to do that, you could untick that box, click on OK. And now when I hover over Format Painter, I just have the description, but I don't have the screen tips. And you'll see the same if I hover over Bold, just the description, no screen tips in there. Now, it's also worth noting that you can create your own screen tips. And this is particularly useful when you're using things like hyperlinks and bookmarks. And I'm going to show you exactly how you can add information into your document in the form of a screen tip to help people who are accessing that document know exactly what to do a bit later on in this course when we talk about bookmarks and hyperlinks. But for now, that is it on screen tips. In the next module, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the ribbons. So please join me for that. Hi everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. This is still Deb and we are in section two where we've been taking a look at those essential skills that you need when you're working in Word. And in the past couple of modules, we've taken a look at keyboard shortcuts and also how to utilize and customize screen tips. In this third module of this section, what I want to focus on is a little bit more about the ribbon. Now, if you've been using Word for quite a few years, then I'm sure you're aware of this ribbon structure that we now have. This is something which came in around 2010, where we switched from the menu drop downs to our commands running horizontally across the screen on what we call ribbons. So in this module, I just want to go into a few options that you have when it comes to managing and using your ribbons. So the first thing you need to be aware of is that we have our ribbon tabs running across the top. So home, insert, draw, design, layout, so on and so forth. We also have a file tab, which isn't essentially a ribbon as it doesn't have that horizontal organization. But this is where you'll find all of what we call our backstage options. And these are the more admin tasks surrounding your documents. So things like new document, opening, saving, printing, share options, and of course, also your overall word options. Now on each tab, you'll find that you have commands organized into groups. So if we take the home tab as an example, you can see the group names listed at the bottom. So we have clipboard, font, paragraph, styles, editing, and voice. And these are obviously different on each tab, depending on the commands contained within the group. And these essentially just group together all commands that are similar to each other. So for example, in the clipboard group, I have cut, copy, format painter, and all of my paste options. 
In the font group, I have all of the commands available when it comes to formatting my fonts. So things like changing the font style, the size, the color and also things like bold, italic and underline. So these are your different groups and within them we have related commands. Something else you need to be aware of are galleries. Now you'll see these for certain items on the ribbon and it just so happens that we have one on the home ribbon and that is this styles gallery. So in the styles group you can see here I have a selection of styles that I can apply to different pieces of text but if I click the drop down, it's going to open up that gallery and it's going to show me all of the options. So you'll see this sometimes instead of having an actual command button, you'll have some kind of drop down, which is going to allow you to go into a gallery to make your selection. Something else that you'll also find on some of these groups is a dialog box launcher. And that is this little arrow that you see here in the corner of each of these groups. Now it's also worth noting that you don't have a dialog box launcher in every single group. So you can see at the end here with editing and voice, I don't have that little arrow. But if you do have a little box like this, it's going to take you into more options for that specific group. So for this one, paragraph, I now have some other options available that I can select which aren't listed as commands within the group on the ribbon. So these are always good to go into if you're looking for more advanced features or just more commands. Now I'm using Word 2019 on a high resolution laptop and you can see the way that my ribbons, my groups and my commands are organized. It's worth noting that if you have a lower resolution laptop or PC, you may find that your commands and groups look slightly different to mine. Now, the only way I can recreate this is actually to minimize my screen. So if I just minimize this down, I'm just going to drag it in very slightly so you can see what happens. So if I was using a lower resolution, you can see that now some of my options are grouped together. So now I have an editing group. And if I click the drop down underneath, I have find, replace, select, so on and so forth. If I maximize out, you'll see that at my resolution, I have those actually listed out on the ribbon as opposed to just grouped underneath an editing button. So just be aware of that. If you're following through this course and you're thinking, well, I don't see exactly what you're seeing, it might be related to your screen resolution. It's nothing to worry about, but just something to note as we work through the different modules. Now, when it comes to these ribbons as well, you don't always have to have them displayed if you don't want to. You'll notice that the ribbons do take up quite a bit of screen real estate, as I call it. And if you want to give yourself more room when you're working on a document, you can definitely collapse up these ribbons. So in the top right hand corner, you'll see here I'm hovering my mouse over it. We have some ribbon display options. So if I click that, I have the option to auto hide the ribbon to show just the tabs or to show tabs and commands. So if I say auto hide ribbon, you can see it gets rid of that ribbon and I now have more space in which to work on my document. If I want to get those ribbons back, I can just move my mouse to the top of the screen until I get that blue bar and click and it will pull that ribbon down. But what you'll see is that the ribbon isn't actually locked to the top of the screen when I'm utilizing this mode. As soon as I click back on the document, that ribbon is going to disappear again. Now that might be something that you find quite useful or it might not. Let's jump back into our ribbon options and I'm going to select the show tabs option. So this is as you would expect, it's got rid of all of the commands, the actual ribbons, but it's still showing me the tabs. So if I want to quickly access something, so maybe I want to make this entire paragraph bold, I can jump up to home, it's going to display the ribbon, I can select my option, and then when I click back on the document, it's just going to go back to showing me those tabs. Now the third option we have is to show tabs and commands. Now this is the default in general for me. I like to have all of my tabs and all of my commands showing, but again, this is entirely personal preference and really dependent. You can switch it up depending on what document you're working on. Another way to quickly collapse up that ribbon is by utilizing this little up arrow on the right hand side. And you can see there it says collapse the ribbon. I can just click that button and it collapses it. I can then go to my ribbon options, say show tabs and commands, and it brings it back. You'll also notice as I hover over, there is a shortcut key to collapse the ribbon quickly, which is control F1. So if I press control F1, you can see there we go. 
Control F1 again brings that ribbon back. Now, another thing you need to be made aware of when it comes to working in Word with the ribbons are contextual ribbons. Now, these are ribbons which you can't see until you need them. So let me show you a very quick example. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to put into here, I'm going to take off italics first of all, I'm quickly going to insert a table. So I'm going to jump up to insert, I'm going to select table, and I'm just going to do a very quick table of uh, three columns by two rows. Now what you'll see is that once I'm clicked in that table, I now have two additional ribbons appear at the top. I have a table design ribbon, which is showing me all of my options with regards to customizing my table's design. And I have a layout ribbon. Again, this is all related to the layout of my table. If I was to click outside of the table, so if I click somewhere else in the document, you'll see that both of those ribbons disappear. And this is why we call them contextual ribbons. They only appear when they're needed. And you'll see this throughout your usage of Word. If you insert a picture, if you insert a shape, if you insert a chart, once you're clicked in the picture or in the chart, you'll find that you will have contextual ribbons appear. So a really important thing to be made aware of when you're working with your ribbons in Word. Now I'm going to do a control Z just to undo all of that and take my document back to how it was. Now, another thing you can utilize when working with ribbons, and this kind of ties back to the keyboard shortcuts, is that if you press the Alt key on your keyboard, what you'll see is you get all of these different shortcuts, which essentially allows you to navigate through your ribbons using your keyboard as opposed to your mouse. So this is quite good for people who either prefer to work predominantly with the keyboard, or maybe if you have some kind of wrist injury which prevents you from working efficiently with your mouse, this might be a good option for you. So again, for example, if I wanted to jump to the insert ribbon, you can see that the letter underneath is N. So if I press N, it takes me to the insert ribbon and I get a whole new set of shortcuts that I can utilize. So if I wanted to access the inbuilt icons in Word, I can see that the shortcut key there is NS. So if I press NS, it's going to take me into my icon library. So a really nice way of being able to navigate through your ribbons and commands utilizing just the keyboard. And of course, if you want to come out of here, you can press the Alt key again. Or alternatively, if you press Escape, that will take you out as well. And the final thing I want to mention in this particular module related to the ribbons is that you can, of course, customize the way that your ribbons look. So again, if we jump up to File and go all the way down to Options, there is a section in here for Customize Ribbon. And what you'll see in here is on the left hand side, you have all of your main tabs. So we can see things like Home, Insert, Draw, Design, so on and so forth. And if it has a tick next to it, it means that it's going to display it on your ribbon. Now, this is a good point to note. Most of the time, you'll find that the developer ribbon is not selected by default. And that's because it is one of the lesser used ribbons. Now, we are going to be using the developer ribbon in this course. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a check in the developer ribbon, click on OK, and you can see that I now have a tab added at the top, which is showing me the developer ribbon and all of the commands. Now, of course, you could go into options again and go down to customize ribbon and you can turn any of these ribbons off and on if you want to. You could even if you wanted to create your own ribbon and assign to that ribbon maybe commands that you use most frequently. So I'll show you very quickly how you can do that. Just be aware that if you are using your copy of Word through your organization, this might be something that is locked down. I know a lot of companies these days don't allow their staff to create their own ribbons. So if you come into here and you find that you have new tab and new group grayed out, that it might be that your company has locked that specific functionality down. But if you do have access to these, what we can do is we can create a new tab. And you can see at the bottom, it says new tab custom. I'm going to rename this and I'm just going to call this Deb's ribbon. Click on OK. And I can now go in and create my group. So remember, all of your commands are in groups. So I'm going to select new group custom, which has been created by default. I'm going to rename this. And I can choose to give it a little icon if I want to. I'm not going to. I'm just going to call this group 
formatting, click on OK. And what I could now do is go through and add what commands I want to this formatting group. So let's look through our list of popular commands on the right hand side. I'm going to add some bullets like so. And you can see when I click add, it appears under my new group that I've created. I'm going to add font and also font color. Let's also add a line left at the top. So now I have four commands within my formatting group on my Debs ribbon. So let's click on OK. And there we go. You'll now see added at the top. I have Debs ribbon. I have my group called formatting and I have those commands that I've added. So if you do have access to this, it's actually quite cool to be able to create your own ribbons, maybe with all the commands on it that you use most frequently. And of course, if you want to get rid of that ribbon, if we go back into options and into customize ribbon, I can deselect it, which will turn it off, but it's still there. Or alternatively, I can select it and I can say remove and that gets rid of the ribbon entirely. So that is pretty much it. Just a few key features that I wanted to make you aware of when it comes to working with your ribbon. That's it for this module. I will see you in the next one. Hi guys, and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. This is still Deb and we are in section two where we've been taking a look at some of the essential skills you need to know in Word. Now, so far we've covered off keyboard shortcuts, screen tips, and we've taken a look at some options you have when it comes to working with the ribbons. In this module, I just want to talk to you about something that is very small, but very important in Word, and that is working with the rulers. Now, rulers are really important when you're working in Word documents. They enable you to see your margins. They also enable you to set things like tabs so that you can align items in your document correctly. They're also a big help if you're trying to do things like center objects on a page or line up text. So I always like to have my rulers turned on by default. Now, in this example, I've turned my rulers off just so I can show you how you turn them on. So currently I have my document with my lorem ipsum text in it, but I don't have any vertical or horizontal rulers showing. Now, in order to display your rulers, it is very simple, but you do need to make sure that you are first in print layout view. So if we jump up to the view ribbon, you can see here in the views group, I have print layout selected. So just make sure you're in that view. And then also on this ribbon, there is a group called show. And in there, we have an option for ruler. And as I hover over, you'll see that useful screen tip that says it shows rulers next to your document. You can see and set tab stops, move table borders and line up objects in the document. And you can also measure stuff. So really useful little things to have turned on. So I'm going to click in the checkbox and just turn those rulers on. So you'll now see I have my horizontal ruler running across the top of the page and my vertical ruler running down the side of the page. Now, one question I always get asked when it comes to rulers is how can you change the measurement of the ruler? Now, currently my ruler is showing in inches, but if you want to work in a different measurement, so maybe centimeters or pixels, then you can definitely jump into options and change that. So if I want to change my ruler to centimeters, I'm gonna go up to the file tab I'm going to jump down to my options and I'm going to go straight into my advanced section. Now, what you're looking for in here is you want to scroll down until you get to the display area. And it's this option that you're looking for show measurements in units of. And you can see that mine is currently set to inches. But if I wanted to, I can click the drop down and underneath there I have centimeters, millimeters, points and peakers. Now, picas is a typographic unit of measurement, and one pica is roughly equal to one six of an inch, in case you're interested. Now, I'm not gonna use picas, but I am gonna change this to centimeters. Click on OK, and you'll see now that my ruler has changed to show in centimeters as opposed to inches. 
So if you haven't done already, please jump into that view ribbon, make sure that you have your rulers turned on and make sure that you have the measurements set to something that you find meaningful and can work with. That's it on rulers. I will see you in the next module. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. This is still Deb and we are still in section two where we're taking a look at some of those essential skills that you need in Word. Now in this module, I want to move on a little bit and start to talk to you a little bit about finding and replacing formatting. Now you may have used find and replace previously in Word, but it's not just for replacing text. You can also use find and replace to locate specific types of formatting throughout your document and even replace that formatting with something else entirely. Now, just before we get on to that, I just want to briefly remind you of how we utilize the find and replace feature. So what you see on the screen here is I have a Word document open and it's called staff list. And this is a very small, very basic little table that just lists some staff members, their job title, the department they work in and where they're located. Now, this is a very small table. It would probably be quicker for me to maybe go through and manually make the changes I need. But imagine if you have a much larger table or piece of text and you want to find something in that table or text and you want to replace it with something else, it's going to be a lot quicker for you to use the find and replace functionality. So for example, in this document, it might be that I want to change those locations to make them a little bit more concise. So wherever I have the word United Kingdom, I want to change that to UK. And wherever I had the word United States of America, I want to change that to USA. So this would be a perfect scenario for utilizing find and replace. So you'll find your find and replace options on the home ribbon across all the way on the right hand side in the editing group. You can see you have a find and a replace and you'll see there as I hover over, I get the screen tip with the keyboard shortcut of control H. So I'm going to utilize that control H to bring up my find and replace dialog box. So essentially what I want to do here is say what I want to find and then say what I want to replace it with. So let's just start out with United Kingdom and I'm going to replace that with UK. I'm going to say replace all. It's made three replacements and you'll now see in the document that that has replaced successfully. Let's do the other one. So we're going to look for United States of America and we're going to replace that with USA and replace all. So very quickly, I've been able to make those bulk changes to my document. So a really useful little utility. So that might be how you're used to using find and replace. What I want to show you now is how you can take that on a stage further and find and replace formatting. Now, when it comes to finding and replacing formatting, you need to think about whether it's going to be more efficient for you to utilize find and replace or more efficient for you to do it manually. And there are definitely some scenarios where doing it manually is going to be quicker for you. For example, if you have a document and throughout that document, you have some instances of bold text and you just want to change it all back to normal text. So without the bold applied, it's probably going to be quicker for you just to do a control A on your document and then deselect bold, which is going to put everything back to normal text. So in those kind of situations, it's going to be quicker to do it manually. However, there are times when find and replace can really help you save time by applying formatting changes faster and easier than manual formatting. So let's take a look in this example as to how we can utilize find and replace to replace certain pieces of formatting in our document. So I'm working in the Lorem Ipsum document and what you'll see is if we go through this document, I've made some changes to it. You can see that I now have in blue font, and underlined the word Lorem Ipsum Management Corporation. And I have that fairly frequently throughout the entire document. What you'll also notice is that I have a section just here that's indented very slightly from the rest of the text and is also showing in italics. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to utilize find and replace formatting to make some changes to this document. 
So let's imagine the scenario. It might be that I've done this document, I've sent it to my manager, and he's come back and said to me, it all looks great, but I don't want you to have the words Lorem Ipsum Management Corporation in blue or underlined. I just want them to show in bold. And he's also said to me that he doesn't want the word Lorem Ipsum Management Corporation. He wants it to say Lorem Ipsum Management Corp. Now, because I have this word throughout my document, it's probably going to be easier for me to utilize find and replace formatting to make these required changes. So let's take a look at how we might go about doing this. I'm going to pull up that replace dialog box again. Remember, keyboard shortcut control H. And what you'll immediately notice is that find and replace keeps in it the last search terms that you used. So I'm just going to clear those out. Now, the first thing you need to do here is you need to click on this more button because at the bottom, this is where you're going to find the replace formatting option. And the first thing we need to do is we need to let Word know what it is we're looking for. So in the find what box, I'm looking for the words Lorem Ipsum Management Corporation. But the thing I'm looking for is in blue, it's in bold and it's underlined. So I need to tell Word that I'm also looking for those properties. So I'm going to go down to the format box and I'm going to go to the font option. I want to say that I'm looking for bold text. Font color is blue and the underlined style is the solid line. Click on OK. So now in the find what box is looking for the words Lorem Ipsum Management Corporation, bold, underline with a font color of blue. So I've specified exactly what I'm looking for. I can now go in and tell Word what I want to replace it with. So my manager said that he just wants this to be in bold, but the same color as the rest of the text. But he's also said that he wants it to say corp as opposed to corporation. So I'm going to say replace with Lorem Ipsum Management Corp. And again, I'm going to jump in to my formatting options. I'm going to go to font and I'm going to specify the properties that I want to replace. So I just want this to be in bold and I'm going to say font color. I want to be set to automatic. Click on OK. So now you can see all of my properties, what I'm looking for and what I'm replacing it with. If I click on replace all, I can see it's made five replacements. And if we look in the document behind, you can see that now I have Lorem Ipsum Management Corp as opposed to corporation. It's removed the blue font color. It's removed the underline, but it's showing in black in bold, which is exactly what my manager asked for. So pretty simple to replace the formatting. Let's look at one more example. Now I've sent this document back to my manager. I've made the edits that he's asked for, but he's come back again and he said, actually, halfway through the document, we have this paragraph that's slightly indented from the rest and is showing in italics. And what he said to me is he wants to have italics removed and he wants the indentation to be removed so that's in line with the rest of the document. So what I would probably do here is I would make sure that my mouse is clicked at the start of this paragraph where we have that indentation. And I might just want to check how much these paragraphs are indented by. And I can do that by simply jumping up to the home ribbon and launching the paragraph dialog box. And in here, if I look down at the indentation section, I can see that where I'm currently clicked is indented on the left at 0.6 centimeters. So that's useful information for me when I'm trying to find and replace the formatting. So let's cancel out of here and let's do a control H to fire up our find and replace dialog box. Now again, what you'll see in here is that it will hold in it the last searches that you did. And I want to remove this, so I'm going to just delete out where we have Lorem Ipsum Management Corp, but you'll see that it still holds that formatting underneath. So I need to make sure that I click the no formatting button at the bottom just to get rid of that. And I need to do it for both the find what and replace with. 
So now I have a clean search. What am I looking for this time? Well, I'm not looking for any text specifically because this applies to this whole paragraph that's indented. So I'm going to click in Find What and I'm going to jump straight down to Find Format. And this time I'm searching specifically for text that is indented 0.6 centimeters. So I'm going to go to the paragraph option. And now I can set what I'm looking for. So my indentation, I'm going to set to 0.6 centimeters. That is what I'm looking for and click on OK. Now I can also see that these paragraphs are showing in italics, so I might want to add that in as well, just to really refine what I'm looking for. So I'm going to jump to format again, and this time we're going to go to font, and I'm looking for everything that's in italics. So now I'm doing a very specific search for all text that's indented on the left 0.6 centimeters and showing in italic font. And what do I want to replace this with? Well, let's jump down to formatting, go into font. I want it just to be regular text and click on OK. Let's go down to formatting again and into paragraph. And I don't want there to be any indentation. So essentially, I'm going to set this to zero centimeters. Click on OK. And now I haven't actually defined a piece of text, but I have defined those properties that I'm looking for. So now if I click on replace all, it's made one replacement and you'll see now that that entire paragraph has been changed to regular font. And it's also now in line with the rest of the document. So of course, there are lots of different ways that you can utilize this by looking under this format option. So this can be a really great way of very quickly and efficiently replacing certain items in your document that are formatted in a specific way. So that's it for this module. In the next module, we're going to stay on this same train of thought, and I'm going to show you how you can find and replace special characters. So please join me for that. Hi everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We are midway through section two and in this section we've been learning some of those essential skills when it comes to working with Word. And in the previous module we took a look at how we can utilize the find and replace to find and replace formatting within a document. I want to move on from that idea now and we're still going to stay with find and replace but we're going to talk about how you can find and replace special characters. Now, special characters are characters that are not alphabetic or numeric. So some examples of special characters would be things like quote marks, question marks, paragraph marks, tabs, things like that. All of those are considered to be special characters in Word. And Word has the ability for you to search for special characters and also replace special characters in a document, which can be really useful. So what I'm going to do in this module is just run through with you a few of the different ways that you can find and replace special characters. Now, I've got a document on the screen, and this is just some text that I've pulled from Wikipedia about William Shakespeare. And if we have a look through this document, it's not very long, but we do have some things that would be considered special characters. So you can see here, after the word William Shakespeare, in this first line of the first paragraph, we have a copyright symbol. We also have some curly brackets, we have a hyphen in here, we have some quotation marks down here, and as we move down you'll see there's lots of other things in this document which are considered to be special characters. What you also might notice with this document is that I have some rather large spaces in between each of the paragraphs. I can see here that I've probably got double line spacing. So the first thing I want to do with this document is I want to change the double line spacing to single line spacing. Now something that's going to help me with this and something which I turn off and on periodically when I'm working in long documents is the show hide paragraph marker button. So up on the home ribbon in the paragraph group, you'll see here you have an icon which looks like a paragraph marker. And if we hover over and take a look at the screen tip, you can see that it's called Show Hide. You can see the keyboard shortcut is Control plus Asterix. 
and it says that if we toggle this on, it's going to show paragraph marks and other hidden formatting symbols. And then it says this is especially useful for advanced layout tasks. So if we toggle this button on simply by clicking, you'll see that I can now see where all of those paragraph markers are. So I can see that, yes, in fact, in between each of my paragraphs, I have two paragraph markers. And essentially what I want to do here is say to Word, I want you to find every time I have a double paragraph marker and replace it with one paragraph marker. So let's take a look at the first way that we can replace special characters. Now we're going to need to jump back into our replace dialog box. So once again, you can either click on the home ribbon and click on the replace button in the editing group. Or alternatively, you can use the control H keyboard shortcut. Now I'm going to remove what was in my last search and I'm going to click my mouse in the find what box. Now in this case, I'm looking for double paragraph markers. But how do I actually input that into the find what field? Well, if we go down to the bottom where we have our replace options, you can see I have an option for replace and then special. And if we click that, we have about 20 or so options that we can use for our find. And if you look at the top one, it says paragraph mark. So I'm going to select it and it puts in essentially what we call the caret code for a paragraph marker. Now, currently, it's just a single paragraph marker. I'm looking for double paragraph markers, so I'm going to do exactly the same thing. Go down to special and select paragraph mark. So now I'm saying search for two paragraph marks and replace with one paragraph mark. Click on replace all. It's made four replacements. And if I now check out my document, you can see that I now have single line spacing between those paragraphs. Now, something that you'll also see is that this first paragraph is now very close to that line above. Ideally, what I would want would be to have a little bit of space in there. So I could jump in and just do that manually, as I've just done. But if I wanted to replace those double paragraph markers, but keep the space at the top, I could do this in a slightly different way. So let me do control Z to undo and come back to my two paragraph marks. So you can see here, essentially, I do have two paragraph marks because I've got one after William Shakespeare and one just below the line. So if I didn't want these to be affected, I could essentially select the document from the first line of the first paragraph down and then do my find and replace. So we know how to do this. I can do control shift end and that's going to select everything below where I'm clicked. I can then do control H. My options that I selected previously are still in there. I'm going to say replace all. It's made three replacements. And there we go. Now I've managed to remove them in the body of the document, but I still have a space between that first paragraph and the horizontal line. For the next example, I'm just going to toggle that show hide button again to turn off those paragraph marks. Now the next thing I'm going to replace in this document are these hyphens. Now another way that you can do find and replace of special characters is that you can come in and highlight exactly what it is that you want to find in the document. So I'm going to highlight in that first line that dash in between his birth date and the date he died. I'm going to do control H again. And you can see automatically in the find what box, it's selected what I've got highlighted in the document. I'm going to say replace that dash with a different type of dash. So I'm going to go down to special. And you can see here I have M dash and N dash. Now, if you're wondering what the difference is between these two, it mainly relates to the size of the dash. An M dash is a dash that is the width of the letter M. And I'm sure you can imagine what an N dash is. It's a dash that is the width of a letter N. So it's slightly smaller. Now I'm going to replace this very small dash that I have in there with an M dash. And once again, it puts in the caret code for that M dash. I'm going to say replace all. It's made six replacements. And there we go. If you look now, you can see that that dash is a lot bigger. 
So now that I've replaced that dash, looking at my document, I can see that mm, actually that dash does look a little bit strange. It is a little bit too big, particularly if I look in the name Stratford upon Avon, that looks a little bit strange to me. So what I've got in my documents now are M dashes. So if I want to go in and replace them all, I can say Control H. I'm going to remove what I have in Find What and Replace With. And in Find What, I'm going to say Find all of the M dash and replace with N dash, which is a slightly smaller dash. Click on Replace All. It's made six replacements. And if I now take a look at my document, I can see that, yes, that looks a little bit better. So it's definitely worth having a look through all of these different options that you have underneath special characters. You can replace things like tabs, column breaks, fields, footnote marks, manual page breaks. All of those kinds of things are available within the Find and Replace dialog box. Now, something else I might want to replace in this document is this copyright symbol. So in the first paragraph, we have William Shakespeare, and then we have that copyright symbol just there. And it might be that I want to replace the copyright symbol with the trademark symbol, the tiny little TM. Now, if I go into my replace dialog box and click special, I can see that I don't actually have an option in here to find the copyright symbol and replace it with the trademark symbol. So how would I do that? Well, let's come out of here. And something that's super useful when it comes to doing things like this, you'll find under the insert ribbon and in the group on the end where we have symbol, click on more symbols. So this is going to open up the symbol window and you can see we have two tabs at the top. If you click on special characters, it's actually going to show you all of those special characters and it also lists out their shortcut key. And I can see in there that I have copyright symbol, and I also have the trademark symbol. So I can see copyright is alt control C and trademark is alt control T. So I'm going to utilize that shortcut key in my find and replace. So I'm going to cancel out of here and I'm going to select this copyright symbol. I'm going to do control H to bring up replace. And you can see because I've highlighted the copyright symbol, it's input it into find what. And this time, I'm just going to use that shortcut key to select the trademark symbol. So Alt Control T. And there you go. It's put in TM. I can now say Replace All. It's made four replacements. And that is how you can utilize those symbol keyboard shortcuts in your Find and Replace. So this is a really useful little option for you to review. And you'll see that they don't all have shortcut keys, but some of these main ones do. So that's another way that you can find and replace special characters in your document. That's it for this module. In the next module, we're going to take a look at the navigation pane. So please join me for that. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. This is still Deb and we are in section two where we've been taking a look at some of those essential skills that you need to know in Word. And in this module, I want to talk to you a little bit about navigating around your document, in particular using the navigation pane. Now, I want to start out this module by just highlighting something that I get asked about all the time, and that is the existence of browse object in the later versions of Word. Now, if you don't know what I mean by browse object, if you ever used Word 2013 or versions older than that, you would have noticed a really helpful little facility to help you navigate around your document. It was called browse object and you would find it underneath the vertical scroll bar in the bottom right hand corner. It was essentially two arrows and a little globe icon. And if you clicked on it, it would allow you to jump to certain objects, certain things within your document. And it was a really useful little facility that I know a lot of people found really helpful. Now, unfortunately, it was eliminated in Word 2013. So if you look down now at my vertical scroll bar, you'll see that I don't have any of those little icons. However, in the versions after 2013, there has been a partial replacement for this utility by way of utilizing the navigation pane and also the go to dialogue. 
So I'm going to show you both of those utilities, but I would say for those of you that did love the object browser, these are definitely not as convenient as the old functionality. So we're going to start out by taking a look at the go to dialog. Now, before we jump into there, there is something that I just want you to check and turn on. In the status bar at the bottom in the left hand corner, you can see that it's showing me what section I'm currently clicked in, what page I'm currently on. So I'm currently on page one of five pages. It's telling me how many words I have in this current document, and it's also telling me the language that I'm using. Now, these are really helpful pieces of information, but they aren't necessarily turned on by default for you when you're using Word. So if you right click your mouse in a blank area of this status bar, you'll see you get the customized status bar menu pop up. And anything that has a tick by it is currently being displayed in that status bar. So I want you to go into here and I want you to make sure that you have a tick next to section and also a tick next to page number. And if you want to turn on some of these other features, then you're more than welcome to. So now we have those turned on, let's take a look at the go to dialog. We're going up to our home ribbon and we're going all the way across into the editing group. I'm going to click the drop down next to find and you'll see that we have a little option here called go to. The keyboard shortcut for this is control G. And if we take a look at that screen tip, it says what's faster than scrolling? Jumping. Go to lets you jump right to a specific page, line, footnote, comment or other place in your document. So in many ways, this is very similar to the old object browser. So let's fire up go to and see what we have in here. So you can basically see this is just another tab within the find and replace dialog. And what this will allow you to do is to quickly jump to various different objects or elements within your document. So for example, I have a five page document and if I wanted to jump very quickly to page three, I can make sure that I've selected page in the go to what list. And then I can enter my page number three, click on go to and it's going to jump me straight down to page three. I could also do the same with sections. Now, currently I haven't sectioned up my document. I just have one section, but if you did have multiple sections, you can enter in your section number and it will jump to that section. I could choose to jump to a specific line. Now this might be when you want to turn on line numbers. So I'm going to jump up to the layout tab and in this first group page setup, you can see one of the options that we have is line numbers. Now I have a few different options I can select in here, but essentially all I want is a number next to each line in the document. So I'm going to select continuous and you can see now that my document has line numbers. So now if I want to jump to a specific line number, I can enter in the line number in here. Let's say 50, click on go to and you can see underneath it's jumped me to line 50. Now that may or may not be an option that you want to use, but it's good to know that it is there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to turn off those line numbers. I can also navigate or jump to any bookmarks that I have in the document. We don't currently have any in here just yet. Any comments, footnotes, endnotes, fields, tables, lots of different things that we can jump to. For example, I could select graphic and then I can enter a graphic number. Now, the only graphics I have in this document are essentially the logos in the header on each page. But if I wanted to jump forward three graphics, I could type in three, click on go to, and it's going to jump me to the third graphic from wherever I was currently clicked. I could choose object, which gives me a little drop down menu, and I can then select from the drop down what object I want to jump to. So if I have something like an Excel chart inserted into my Word document, I can select Excel chart, click on next, and it's going to jump me to that particular chart. So lots of different options in this drop down menu for you. And we can also navigate by headings and I can enter in a heading number. So if I enter in, let's say heading four, click on go to, and it's going to jump me to heading four. So you can utilize that go to dialogue in order to navigate around your document. 
Now that's all well and good, but sometimes I find this a little bit cumbersome to use. Sometimes I don't know the heading number that I want to jump to. Sometimes I don't know how many graphics I want to jump forward. I just want to navigate through. And that is where the navigation pane is probably going to be more helpful to you. So let's close out of go to and we're going to turn on the navigation pane. So we're going to go up to the view tab and in this show group, you'll see that the bottom option there is navigation pane. And the little screen tip says that this is like a tour guide for your document. Click on a heading, a page or a search result and it will take you right there. So let's put a tick in the box and you'll see my navigation pane opens up on the left hand side. And we have three main headings up here, headings, pages and results. And then we have a search document bar just above. Now what you'll see under headings is it will essentially import all of the headings within your document into the navigation pane. Now I will say that this relies on your document being styled correctly. And what I mean by that is that you've used heading styles throughout your document because the navigation pane is only going to pick up anything that has a style applied to it. Now you may or may not be familiar with using styles in your document, but if I just click at the start of this title just here and jump back to the home ribbon, I'm talking about this group here, the styles group. And you can see currently I have a gray box surrounding the style, which is currently applied to the line that I'm clicked in. So currently this is a heading one style. If I click on the first item just here where it says names of the employee and employer, I can see that that has a heading two style applied. And it's really important to style up your documents, particularly if you're going to do things like tables of contents and particularly if you want to be able to navigate around using headings. So essentially in this navigation pane, I have everything in here that I've applied a heading style to, and that enables me to very easily jump to specific points in the document. So if I want to jump down to point 10, other paid leave, I can just click on that heading in the navigation pane, and it's gonna navigate me to that particular page. What you'll also see in here is that these are expandable and collapsible items. So if I didn't want to see any of these subheadings, I only wanted to see the heading ones essentially, I can just minimize up everything. And I currently only have one heading one in this document, which is that first heading. So what I might want to do is maybe collapse up all of the heading three so that I'm only seeing heading ones and twos. So I can do that like so. And that makes the list a little bit easier to read and I can then navigate to wherever I like. Now I'm going to expand these again. Another useful feature in this headings area of the navigation pane is that you can reorganize your headings very simply from here. So if I go down to let's say point three just here where it says job title or brief description of the job, I have two subheadings underneath their job title and brief description of the job. If I then decide that I want brief description of the job to appear before job title, instead of going into my document and cutting and pasting and moving things around, I can simply just drag and drop above where it says job title. And what it will do is it will essentially move not only the heading, but the entire paragraph associated with it. So it's a really great utility for reorganizing items within your document. The next heading along is pages. So again, we can navigate specifically by different pages in our document. And this is pretty much what it says on the tin. We have all of the pages of our document listed out. And if you want to jump to a specific one, you simply click on it. And then finally, we have results. Now there's nothing in here at the moment because this is going to display the results of any search that I've done in the search box above. So what I can do here is I can enter in search terms to navigate to specific parts. So if I type in the word abroad and click on the magnifying glass, you can see it jumps me to page two where I have the word abroad and it's highlighted it in yellow. And of course you can customize this option if you don't want it to highlight, if you just want it to jump to the specific place in the document. If you click the little drop down at the end of the search field, you have an options button. 
And this is where you can choose some of the options with regards to your search. And you can see that the only one that I have highlighted in here is the highlight all. So if you didn't want it to appear in yellow, you would just uncheck that box. You can also see in here that you can choose to match case. You can find whole words only, and you can also do things like use wildcards. Let's click that drop down arrow again and take a look at some of these other options. We have access to advanced find in here. So again, that's just going to open up that find and replace box in case you want to do a more intensive find within your document. Replace is going to jump us to our replace dialog. And then again, we have that go to option that we were just looking at. Now, one thing I will say with this go to option, if you do find this useful and you find yourself using it a lot, as we no longer have quick access to it via the object browser in Word 2019, what you could do is add go to to your quick access toolbar. So let's close out of here. I'm going to go up to find in the editing group and where we have go to in the menu, I'm going to right click and I'm going to say add to quick access toolbar. And you'll see now that on the quick access toolbar, we now have the go to option. So this makes it super easy. Whenever I want to invoke that dialog box, I can just click on the quick access toolbar to bring it up as opposed to browsing to the home tab and going to find and then selecting go to. And then finally at the bottom, we have some specific things that we can find in our documents. So again, if I wanted to look for specific graphics or tables, let's start with graphics. It's going to jump me to the next graphic from wherever I was clicked. And for me, that is the logo for this company in the header. And I could also select tables and it's going to jump me down to the only table that I have in this document, which is on that final page. Now I'm going to do one final search in here. I'm just going to type in the word job into the search box and click the magnifying glass. You can see that I have seven results and it's highlighting the headings where those results appear. If I click on the results tab, it's going to show me the line of text where that search term appears. And because I have seven results, I can use my up and down arrows to navigate to the next result. And you can see as I click the down arrow, it's moving through my document to the next instance of my search term. Once you're finished with the search, if you just click the cross to clear out the search results, it's going to take you back so you can start again and type in another search term. And the final thing related to the navigation pane, if you don't particularly like the position of the navigation pane, you can move this. If I click the little drop down arrow for task pane options, I have a move option. And when I click that, my cursor changes to that double headed arrow and I can just click and I can pick up the navigation pane and I can literally drag and drop it to wherever I like. So I'm going to drag it over to the side because I prefer mine to be on the right hand side. When you're done with the navigation pane, you can just click the cross in the top corner to close that down. So that is how you utilize go to and the navigation pane to navigate around your document. And it's also the alternatives that you have available if you've been used to using the object browser in Word 2013 or previous versions. That's it for this module. I will see you in the next. Hi guys, this is Deb and welcome back to our course on Word 2019 Advanced. We are coming towards the end of section two now. And in this section, we've been taking a look at those essential skills that you need to know in Word. And this section wouldn't be complete without reviewing some of the options that we have for spelling and grammar checking. Now, I don't think I need to tell you how important it is that when you have a document that maybe you are sending to a client or maybe your manager or even your colleagues, it's important to run a spell check once the document has been complete. If you don't do this and you end up sending out a document that is full of spelling and grammatical errors, it really doesn't look very professional and it makes it look like you've rushed your document. It doesn't give the greatest impression. And a spelling and grammar check is something which you should be doing at the end of your document. So once it's complete, one of the final things you want to do before you send this document to somebody else or maybe upload it to cloud storage is you want to run a spelling and grammar check.
Now in Word 2019, the spelling and grammar checker is slightly different to previous versions of Word. So let's dive in and take a look. Now, when it comes to reviewing your document prior to sending it out, you'll find your spelling and grammar checker on the review tab. And it's not immediately obvious as it no longer says spelling or spell checker. It's in the proofing group, which is this first group on the left hand side. And the one you're looking for is check document. And you can see here as we hover over, we get that screen tip, which tells us we're about to go into the editor. And of course, we have a shortcut key of F7 to quickly invoke that spell check. So let's check out our document and see if we have any issues that we need to fix. So now in 2019, what we get is this editor pane pop up on the left hand side. And of course, as with the navigation pane, if you don't like the position of this editor, you can just pick it up and you can drag and drop it somewhere else. Now, I'm fairly happy with it over on the left hand side, so I'm going to pull it back to there. Now, what the editor has done is it's taken a look through my document. And remember, my document isn't that long. It's about five pages and it's pulled up all of the issues that it's found. So currently I have seven issues that I need to review in my document and it's been divided down into corrections and refinements. And you can see that we have spelling, grammar and conciseness. And these are actually color coded red, blue and this kind of brown color. And these colors correspond to how those errors show up in the document. So, for example, if we scroll down and find our first error and here it is just here, you can see that we have a red wiggly line underneath the word dependence. Now, what these colors actually mean, the red line indicates a misspelled word. And you can see I have actually three of them on this particular page. A blue double underline indicates a grammatical error and a brown dotted line, which you can see just here, invites me to review the conciseness of the sentence. So that's what they look like in your document. But fortunately, we don't have to scroll through our document looking for these errors. We can utilize the editor to quickly jump through and fix these particular errors. So let's deal with spelling. First of all, I'm going to click where it says spelling and straight away it opens up this spell checker. Now this looks very similar to spell checkers in previous versions of Word. It's highlighted the first misspelled word that it's found in the document, which is dependence. And it's now providing me with some suggestions to replace that word. So I can see that, yes, this top one is the one that I want. So I'm going to click dependence to replace that word. It replaces it then automatically moves on to the next misspelled word. And I can see here that, yes, I have in fact spelt enroll wrong. So I'm going to utilize the suggestion again click on it to replace the word. And my final one here is training. I have too many ends in that word. I'm going to select the suggestion to replace that word. So once you've gone through and corrected all the errors, you'll get a green tick next to that item. So I know that in terms of spelling, my document is now good to go. So I can now move on to check my grammar. I can see that I have three errors in here that I need to review. So let's click on grammar. And if I look at this particular sentence that it's picked up where it says there are no collective agreements, the suggestion here is the word agreements. And I can see that it's spelt correctly. But what I'm thinking here is that it doesn't particularly recognize the quote marks that I have around the words collective agreements. Now, in this case, I'm good with those quote marks. I want them there. So I don't want this to register as a grammatical error. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down underneath and I'm going to select ignore once. And it will move me on to the next check here. It's picked up the sentence. You will receive an additional day's holiday for each five years of continuous employment. And quite rightly, it's recognized that I haven't spelt days quite correctly. I've missed out the apostrophe. So I'm going to change that and utilize the suggestion. And then finally, when it comes to grammar, it's picked up the sentence must inform Jane Doe by telephone as soon as possible, but no later than two hours prior to your workday start time. And again, it's recognized that I've put workday as two words and it's made the suggestion of all one word. So I'm going to say yes, change that. And once again, once you've been through and reviewed everything, you'll get a green tick to let you know that you're good when it comes to grammar. 
Now, finally in here, we have a nice little option called conciseness. So this essentially reviews your sentences in your document and works out if you could have written something a little bit more concisely. I know a lot of the time I am very guilty of adding in extra words into sentences that don't really need to be there. So this is a great one to help keep your document on point without any unnecessary waffle. So let's see what it's picked up. I'm going to click on conciseness. And it's pulling back this sentence. So it says, while you're working outside the UK, in addition to your pay, you'll be paid all of your accommodation costs, food allowance, and any agreed reasonable expenses. Now you might think that that sentence sounds okay, but what Word is telling me is that I don't really need the word of in this sentence. So this might sound better if it says, in addition to your pay, you'll be paid all your accommodation costs, food allowance, etc., etc. So it's removing unnecessary words from a sentence to make it more concise. So I'm going to say, yep, sounds good to me. Let's select all and replace that. So I've essentially finished reviewing my document and it's popped up a readability statistics box, which just shows me some really nice statistics with relation to how many words, characters, paragraphs and sentences I have in this document. It's also given me some averages, which is quite nice and also the readability of my document graded against different scales. Now, you don't necessarily have to have this readability statistics turned on. So if you don't like that popping up once you've finished your spell check, I'm going to show you in a moment how you can turn this off. But for the time being, I'm going to click on OK. Word is telling me I've finished reviewing, so I'm going to click OK. And I'm now pretty certain that my document is error free when I send this out. Now, just before we leave this editor, let's just quickly jump into the settings at the bottom. Now, when I click on settings, it's just going to essentially jump me into word options and to the proofing area. And we're going to go through a lot of these options in the next module. But the section I want to highlight here is this section just here. So when correcting spelling and grammar in word, it's always worth reviewing these options to make sure everything is set up as you would like it. So I like Word to check spelling as I type. So essentially when I'm typing a word, if I misspell it, I like it to underline it straight away in the document so that I know. I also want it to mark grammar errors as I type and also frequently confused words. Now at this next option, it says check grammar and refinements in the editor pane. So this is the editor pane that we've been using. If I unchecked this box, it's only going to show me spelling errors. It's not going to give me the grammar and conciseness. And then finally, I have that show readability statistics. So if I don't want that to pop up, I can just untick that particular box. And if you wanted to right at the bottom, we could do something like hide all the spelling and grammar errors in this document only. So if you have a particular document where you don't want to show any errors in it, you can select it or even set it for all new documents and then select hide spelling errors and hide grammar errors. Now, I'm not going to do that because I like to see when I've made a mistake and click on OK. Now I'm going to close down the editor pane. And just one final thing I want to point out here when it comes to spell check as you type and let's type a sentence and spell something wrong. So I'm going to say the document is attached and you can see I've spelled document wrong. So I have my red wiggly line indicating a spelling error. Now I don't have to wait until the end to review any spelling errors. What I tend to do is if I'm typing in a document, I like to correct my spelling errors as I go. If I see that I've misspelled a word, if you right click on the word, your first option you get is spelling, which allows you to correct it as you're typing. So here I can see that I have my suggestion is document. I can select it and it's corrected immediately. Now that might be something that you like to do or alternatively, you might just like to bash out your document and then just check the whole thing at the end. It is entirely up to you. And finally, before we leave this module where we've been talking about proofing, let's just look at these other two options that we have in this proofing group, thesaurus and word count. Now the thesaurus lets us select an alternative word that means the same thing. So for example, if I highlight the word accommodation in my document and click on thesaurus, 
it's going to give me a whole host of other options which basically mean accommodation. So I find this useful sometimes when I'm writing a paragraph, I find myself repeating the same word and it just doesn't sound particularly great. So it's nice to have other options available. So that's a nice little option. And then finally, we have word count. So again, this just gives us some statistics in our document in relation to how many pages, how many words we have in the document, characters with spaces, characters no spaces, paragraphs and lines. So again, I find this particularly useful if maybe I am writing something like a blog post and I've been given a word limit, so maybe I can't go over a thousand words. This helps me keep track of where I'm up to. And of course, in addition to this little word count pop up box, you also have that down in your status bar if you have word count turned on. So that is it when it comes to proofing tools, checking your document for spelling, grammar and conciseness. I hope you found that useful and I will see you in the next module. Hi guys, this is Deb and welcome back to our course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're coming towards the end of section two where we've been reviewing all of those essential skills when working in Word. And in this particular module, I want to run through with you some options that you have when it comes to autocorrect. Now, autocorrect is a super useful feature for automatically correcting misspelled words, fixing things like capitalization and also invoking special characters. And it's so good, you may not even have noticed when you're busy typing away frantically in a document that it's actually working as you type. So let me show you what I mean and let's take a look at autocorrect in action. So currently I just have a blank document open. I'm going to click in my blank document and I'm going to misspell the word the. I'm going to type in H-T-E and let's just zoom in a little bit so that's a bit easier to see. Now when I press space you can see the word autocorrects it to the word the. The same thing with the word can, if I type in A-C-N, which can happen if you're typing very quickly, and it will auto-correct the word. And there are a whole host of commonly misspelled words that Word recognizes and will auto-correct for you as you're typing. And we're going to delve in and take a look at some of those in a moment. But just be aware that that's always chugging away in the background as you're typing your document. Now, aside from words, there's also some other things that Word will autocorrect for you as you're typing. So, for example, if I was to type in first and hit the space bar, you can see that it becomes superscript. The same thing if I was to type second, third, so on and so forth. Now, some other examples of autocorrect in action would be utilizing symbols in your document. So, for example, if I wanted to add the copyright symbol, if I type in curly bracket C curly bracket, you can see again that is set up to autocorrect to the copyright symbol. If I type in bracket E bracket, that's set up to correct to the euro currency symbol. And if I type in TM, that's going to correct to the trademark symbol. And these are all set up within autocorrect options as defaults. Now, something else that's also set up to autocorrect is links and website addresses. So if I was to type in www.google.com and hit enter, you can see that automatically it corrects it so that it is now a hyperlink. And if I hold my control key down, I can click and that's going to take me across to Google. So all of these things are set up by default in your autocorrect options. And of course, as you can imagine, you can customize this and add your own autocorrect options. And we're going to take a look at those now. So you'll find all of your autocorrect options underneath the file tab. And we're going to jump all the way down to options and we're going into the proofing area. And the first option that you have in the list is autocorrect options. So we're going to click on our button. Now there's quite a few different tabs in here. Let's jump across to the autocorrect tab. And this is where you can set up exactly what you want Word to autocorrect. 
and you'll see that there is a whole host of options already listed in here or words that it's going to auto correct. So some of these checkboxes that we have at the top, you can see it's going to correct two initial capitals. So if you accidentally type in two capital letters at the beginning of the word, it's going to correct that. It's also going to automatically capitalize the first letter of sentences. So again, if you've typed a period or a full stop and then you accidentally hit a lowercase key, it's going to capitalize it through autocorrect. It's going to capitalize the first letter of table cells, names of days, and it's going to correct the accidental usage of the caps lock key. Now, this is a big one for me. I am always accidentally hitting that caps lock key. And if I'm looking down at my keyboard before I know it, I've typed an entire sentence in capital letters. So with that option ticked, it's going to auto correct that for me and I don't need to worry about it. Then underneath that, we have the option replace text as you type. And this is where we can set up what we want to auto correct. Now, some of these you've already seen me use. The top one here, if you remember, we typed in curly bracket C, curly bracket, and it auto-corrected to the copyright symbol. The same with the euro symbol and also the trademark symbol. And if we scroll down, you'll start to see all the different things that are set up to auto-correct. And we have in here a lot of words that are commonly misspelt when you're typing fast in a document. And of course, you can add your own ones into here. So let's add our own autocorrect option. So maybe I find that I have to type my name fairly frequently in a document. And instead of typing out my full name, maybe I just want to be able to type in my initials and that's gonna essentially autocorrect to my full name. I'm gonna click on add to add that to the list. Let's click on okay and OK again, and let's check to see if that works. I'm going to type in my initials, hit the space bar, and it auto-corrects to my name. So the scope of items that you can enter into autocorrect is really wide. You can really make yourself a lot more efficient by utilizing short versions of words, phrases, or sentences to input them into your Word document. Now, one other thing I want to show you here, I often have problems typing in the pound currency symbol. Obviously, I'm in the UK and we use pounds, but I find a lot of the time I'm working in American dollars because a lot of my clients are based in the US. And I have an American laptop and I also have my options set to American keyboard layout. Now, because of that, typing in a pound currency symbol is quite difficult for me on my keyboard. When I press the key that has the pound on it, which is just above the three key, it doesn't actually input a pound. If I show you now, if I type in what should be a pound, I actually get a hash symbol or the pound symbol as it's called in America. So a lot of the time, if I have to type the pound currency symbol, I find myself inserting a symbol which isn't particularly efficient. So this is something that I like to have set up as an autocorrect option. So let me just show you how I do that. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to insert the symbol. So we're going to go to the insert tab across to symbol in that end group. And you can see it's my first one just there because I use this most frequently. And I'm just going to input that into my document. So I'm going to select the symbol. Now I could control C to copy it, but I don't actually need to. If I go to file options, and back into my autocorrect options, you can see that it's automatically picked it up. So what I can do is now type in what I want to type in order to achieve that pound symbol, which is curly brackets P in this case. Click on add, click on OK, and OK again. And let's see if that works. And it does. So for me, that's a really great way of solving the problem that I personally have of not being able to type a pound symbol on the keyboard that I'm using. Now let's jump back into file, options, proofing and autocorrect options and take a look at some of these other tabs. So these are all your autocorrect options and you can go through and add in as many as you like. We then have math autocorrect. So if you're someone who works with a lot of mathematical symbols, you may want to check out this section and also add in your own autocorrect options. 
We then have an auto format as you type, and you will have noticed some of these in action in the examples that I showed you in the document at the beginning. So we can see our option there to auto correct fractions. You can also see the internet and network paths with hyperlinks. So if you remember when we typed in www.google.com, it auto corrected to a hyperlink. Ordinal, so that was when we were typing first, second, third, and it was changing them to superscript. And there are lots of other things in here. So things like straight quotes with smart quotes and also hyphens with a dash. So it's worth coming into here and just checking which options you want to turn on. Now this is the auto format as you type. So this will correct as you're typing these things in. You also have an auto format tab where we have many of the same options. So definitely go through and check all of those. Now, one other important point to note when it comes to autocorrect is that you can override any autocorrect options. So let me show you an example of this. I'm just going to type a quick sentence into this document. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Now, I don't know if you noticed when I started to type that sentence, I actually typed a lowercase t for the word the. And of course, Word auto-corrected that to capitalize that first letter. Now, what about if I actually wanted that to be a lowercase t? Well, when the auto-correction has been applied, if you hover your mouse over the corrected letter, so in this case, the t, you'll see you get this little auto-correct options drop down. And if I click that drop down, I can choose to undo the automatic capitalization this one time, or I can choose to stop auto capitalizing the first letter of sentences. So selecting that option is essentially going to turn it off within word options. So if I now go onto the next line and type the same sentence, it's not auto correcting. Now I'm going to undo that option because I like it when it auto corrects for me. And then, of course, the final option you have in here will just jump you into all of those autocorrect options to make any further customizations. A couple of final things I want to show you in here. We're going to stay in our Word options and we're going to go down to Advanced. And in Editing Options, I just want to highlight to you this option just here, Show Autocomplete Suggestions. Now, Autocomplete is a little bit different to Autocorrect. There are some words that Word will automatically recognize as you start to type them, and it will offer you a suggestion for completing that word. Now, I actually really like this option, so I have a tick in the box, so this might be something that you want to turn on. So let me show you what this does. Let's click on OK. And if I was to type a word, let's say Monday, you can see as I get partway through the word, I get that little suggestion just above, press Enter to insert. I can just hit enter and it will complete that word. And it will work the same for most of the days of the week. It also works for months of the year, but it's worth pointing out that not all of them it works for. It works for the longer ones, but something like May doesn't autocomplete and neither does something like March. But longer words, you'll get that little suggestion and you can just hit enter to complete them. So if when you're typing, you do see that little screen tip pop up, just be aware that you can hit enter just to complete that word, saves you a little bit of time. So that is it on autocorrect and autocomplete. In the next module, we're going to take a look at how you can group objects together. So please join me for that. Hi everyone, this is Deb and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're almost at the end of section two and in this section we've been reviewing some of those essential skills that you should know in Word. And in this module, I want to talk to you a little bit about grouping objects because this is a really important and often overlooked skill. Now, any time that you insert something into a Word document, so that might be some kind of shape or maybe a picture or even something like a chart or a table, that is essentially considered or classed as an object in Word. 
And when an object, whatever that may be, is inserted into a Word document, it is an independent object, i.e. it's not linked to the other objects on the page. So an example of this would be the document that I have open on the screen. So this is just a little meet the team document, which is made up of a number of different objects. We have some shapes, some circles, and those circles have been filled with an employee's photograph. And these shapes are considered to be individual objects. And for each of these employees, we also have a text box underneath that contains the details, their name, their department. And these text boxes, again, are individual objects. And you can see as I click on them, I'm essentially selecting that particular object. We then have these connector lines to show how Marcus is linked to everybody else in the organization. And again, if I click on these arrows, and these are just connector arrows, these are also individual objects. Now, when I say these are individual objects, I mean they're independent of everything else. So if I wanted to resize Marcus's picture, if I click on it and then I drag out the handle, it's just going to resize Marcus. It's not going to resize anything else. Control Z to undo. Now, when you have individual objects on a page, that's all well and good if you want to make edits to that particular object. But there will be times when maybe you want to group together all of the objects on a page so that you can do things like resize. Currently, if I wanted to resize this entire diagram, I don't really have the ability to do that because every time I click on an object, it just selects that individual object. So essentially, I'm only resizing that individual object. It's not allowing me to resize everything in one go. So what I would need to do here would be to group my objects together. Now, there are a couple of different ways that you can do that. The first way is that you can go in and utilizing your shift key, you can select all of the individual objects and then group them. So let's do that. Now, this process can be a little bit tedious depending on how many objects you have on your page. I'm going to select the first one. I'm going to hold down shift. I'm going to select his text box and let's go through still holding down shift as we make our selections. And don't forget those connector arrows as well. So I've now got essentially all of my objects selected. What I can now do is group them together. And there are a couple of different places I can go in order to access my group options. You'll see that because I have objects selected, I now have two different contextual ribbons appear at the top, drawing tools and picture tools. And it actually doesn't matter whether you go into drawing tools or picture tools because the option that we need is available on both of these ribbons. In the arrange group, we have a group option. And you can see here if I select group, so you can see that that has now grouped all of those objects together. They're no longer individual, they're there as a group. Now I'm just going to control Z to undo that because there is another way that I can group objects together without jumping up to my ribbons. Once I have all the objects selected, if I right click on one of the objects in that right click menu, I also have the group option in there. And it pretty much does exactly the same thing. So essentially now everything is grouped together as one object and I can resize this diagram as one single object. Now remember, if you want to keep the aspect ratio, so if you don't want these pictures to distort as you resize, if you hold down the shift key as you drag any of these handles in, and there we go. I can also pick this object up and I can place it wherever I like within this document. Now you will notice that the text inside these text boxes is now being cut off. So it might be that I want to do some rearranging with that text, maybe make the font a little bit smaller, but pretty much everything else has resized nicely and we don't have any distortion. Now, once I have my objects grouped, if I want to now work on them as individual objects, of course, I also have an ungroup option. So let's just right click, go down to group, and you'll see now the one that we have available to select is the ungroup option. And now everything is back to individual objects. So I'm going to go in and I'm just going to decrease the font size in these text boxes and I'll be right back with you. 
Now another really nice method that's available in Word for selecting all of your objects prior to grouping or ungrouping is using the selection pane. And this is actually my preferred method, particularly if I have a document that has lots of objects that are overlapping each other. Sometimes when you're using this manual method of selecting your objects by clicking and holding down your shift key, if you have lots of objects kind of stacked on top of each other, it can be really difficult to grab objects that are underneath other objects. So an easier way of doing this is utilizing the selection pane. So I'm going to click on one of my objects so that I get my contextual ribbons. And again, I can utilize either the drawing tools or the picture tools format tab. And in the arrange group, you'll see that we have an option there for selection pane. And the screen tip says, you can see a list of all of your objects. This makes it easier to select objects, change their order or change their visibility. So let's click to open up that pane. I'm going to make this a bit wider. Now I had this pane open earlier and I've already started to rename some of my objects. If you look at the objects just here where it says text box 2, oval 9, overlay oval 7, oval 3 and straight connector 11, these are essentially the default names that Word will give your objects. So they're not particularly meaningful. And sometimes if you have a lot of objects on the page, it's a bit hard to know which one you're selecting from this pane. So what I like to do is go through and rename all of the objects so I can easily identify them, which is exactly what I've done with these ones at the top. So the first one, middle arrow connector, if I click on this, it's going to select that middle arrow connector. We have left arrow connector and you'll see the selection in the document, right arrow. We have Vivian Fisher text box. So that is the text box that contains her information. We have a text box for Darius, one for Sarah, and then I still have these to rename. So let's go through. I'm going to click on text box two, and I can see that that is Marcus's text box. So I double click and I can simply go in and say Marcus Lee text box and hit enter. If I click on oval nine to see what that is, I can see that that is the photo for Vivian Fisher. So again, I can double click on oval nine and I can rename this object. Vivian Fisher photo, hit enter. So I'm going to go through and rename the rest of these and I'll see you back here in a moment. So there we go. I now have all of my objects with meaningful labels, which makes it super easy for me to make selections of individual objects using this selection pane. So as I mentioned before, this is great if you have objects that are stacked on top of each other and are quite hard to select manually. You'll also notice in the selection pane, you have this little eye icon to the right of each of the objects. So this allows you to essentially show or hide specific objects. So for example, if I click on the I next to Marcus Lee text box, you can see that now that is hidden. Click again and it brings it back. So again, this is good if you need to see an object that's underneath another object. You can also use this selection pane to essentially move your objects forwards or backwards. So an example would be Sarah Cox's photo. If I wanted the photo to be over the top of the Sarah Cox marketing text box, I can do that by just dragging the object in the selection pane. So all I would need to do is grab Sarah Cox photo from the selection pane and I'm going to drag it and I'm going to place it above where it says Sarah Cox text box and let go. And you can see now that it's brought that layer, essentially that object to the front. Now I'm actually going to drag that back down because I want the text box in front. So when it comes to utilizing this pane for grouping, this makes it super easy. All you need to do is select the top object, hold down control and select the rest of the objects. So sometimes that is a lot easier than trying to fiddle around in the main document. Once you've got them all selected, you can go up to your format ribbon and use your group option 
Alternatively, you can right click and you have your group option in here. And there we go. And now that these objects are grouped, if you look over in the selection pane, you can see it's created a group, again with a very generic name, but I'm going to double click and I'm going to rename this Meet the Team and hit Enter. So a few really useful options there when it comes to grouping objects. I hope you found that useful. In the next module, I'm going to talk to you about how to align objects accurately in your document. So please join me for that. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. This is Deb and we are in the final module of this section, section two. And in this module, we have been looking at all of those essential skills in Word. And in the previous module, we were looking at how you can group and ungroup different objects that you have in your Word document. And I'd like to progress that idea on a little bit and talk to you about aligning objects in your documents. Now, aligning is really just the process of making sure that all of the pictures, shapes, charts, whatever it is that you might have in your document, are all lined up nicely in relation to other objects on the page and also on the page itself. And many people don't realize that there are lots of tools available in Word that really help you align these objects accurately. So the document that I've got on the screen here is just our Meet the Team document. And I have three pictures of employees and also some labels for those pictures. And currently, these pictures and labels are very much scattered haphazardly around the page. So it might be that I've just created these and inserted these pictures into my document without too much concern with how they're lined up. But now I want to put these in a nice neat line and position them underneath this title. Now, the most obvious thing which people reach for is just by doing this manually. So I could grab one of the pictures and I can drag it and position it where I want it to be and kind of have a good guess, which may or may not be accurate as to where the center is, so on and so forth. But I don't really need to do that. And I can take all of the inaccuracy out of this process by utilizing words alignment tools. So let me show you how they work. So what I'm aiming for here, first of all, is that I want to get all three of these pictures in a row with even spacing in between each. I'm not going to worry too much about where they're positioned in relation to the page. I just want them in a nice row lined up with each other with equal spacing. So all I need to do is, first of all, make my selection. So I'm going to hold down shift and select all three of the pictures. And it's worth noting when you are aligning objects, you do want them to be ungrouped. Now I'm going to jump up to my picture tools format ribbon. And in the arrange group, we have an align drop down. And this houses all of your alignment options. So I can align the selected objects to the left hand margin, to the center or to the right hand margin. I can align them to the top of the page, to the middle or to the bottom. And I can distribute them horizontally or vertically. Now I want my pictures to be arranged in a line horizontally. So the first option I'm going to choose here is a line middle. And there we go. They are now lined up in relation to each other to the middle. But one thing that's glaringly obvious here is that I have quite a large amount of space between the middle and the last picture and a small amount of space in between the first two pictures. So I'm going to want to jump back into my alignment tools. And this is where I can utilize the distribute horizontally option. This will ensure that I have an even amount of space in between all of my selected objects. So there we go. I now have these pictures very quickly lined up and looking good. Now, with regards to how these are positioned on the actual page, if I zoom out a little bit, they're actually not too bad. They're fairly close to the center, but I'm pretty sure that they're not exactly center aligned and middle aligned. So essentially what I want to do is I want to align this group of pictures to the dead center of this page. So the first thing I need to do here is group my pictures together so that they're one object. I'm going to right click, go to group and select group. 
And there we go. So now I have them grouped together. I can now align this as one object utilizing my alignment tools. So I'm going to say align middle. And you see that jumps down very slightly and also align to the center to center them vertically on the page. And now when I scroll out, I know that these three objects are not only aligned in relation to each other, but also in relation to the page. So I have these grouped together, they're in the middle of the page, but when I re-look at this document, I think to myself, actually, I want these three pictures to be underneath the Meet the Team title. So I might be tempted here to jump back into my alignment tools and maybe select something like Align Top. But if I select this, you'll see that I don't really get the result that I wanted. It's going to align my object to the top of the page, regardless of if I have text in there or not. So I'm going to control Z to undo that. And if I jump back into my alignment tools, I don't actually have an alignment tool that's going to accommodate any text that I have above what I'm trying to align. So in this particular situation, I'm probably going to want to move this object manually into the position that I want. And in order to help me do that and ensure that everything is still lined up, I'm going to first turn on Use Alignment Guides. Now, alignment guides are super useful. When you have them turned on and you pick up a picture or an object and try to move it, you'll see they start to appear. There are these green lines which run across the page telling you when you've centered or lined up your object with other objects on the page. So currently this alignment guide is telling me that this is in the dead center. If I move across slightly, it's telling me that it's lined up with the end of the meet the team text. And I could do the same on the other side. It's lined up with the end of the meet the team text. If I was to move this down, you can see there, because I have those two green lines intersecting, that is the dead center of the document. So utilizing these, it means I can safely drag this up and it doesn't matter if I go off course a little bit, because when I get to the position I want to put it in, I can just utilize my alignment guides so that I know that this is dead in the center, like so. So now I have these labels for each of my staff members. So once again, I'm going to pick these up and I'm just going to drag this one up to here and I want it to be about there. And I'm going to let go. Now notice that when I place that particular object, I didn't get any alignment guides come up to assist me. So when you're doing more granular work like this, it can be useful sometimes to turn on grid lines to help you align some of your objects. And there's a couple of different ways that we can turn on grid lines. We can do it from the view ribbon. In the show group, we have a grid lines option. If I select the tick, it's going to give me some grid lines. I could also do it from that format menu from picture tools or drawing tools. So if I click on one of the pictures and go up to my picture tools format tab, in that align drop down, I have a view grid lines option. And this can then really help me when it comes to aligning some of these other items. So I'm going to drag this label up. I'm going to position it just there, and then I'm going to grab the final label. And I'm going to position it just there. And I've used that line in my grid so that I know that there is the same amount of space between that line and the bottom of these text boxes. Now, one thing that you'll also notice when you're moving objects around, and I'll just select this text box as an example, is you'll see as I move, it's not particularly smooth. It's kind of jumping all over the place a little bit. There's a little nudge in there as you drag the object around. And that is because by default, Word makes objects snap or jump to an underlying grid laid across the document. And that is why when you're dragging these around, it's attempting to snap it to that underlying grid. And this can cause some issues sometimes when you're trying to align objects because you don't have as much control as to exactly where you place things because it's constantly going to move it to the next underlying grid line. Now you can turn this snapping feature off. Again, if we jump up to the format ribbon and go into our alignment options, you'll find these options underneath grid settings. 
And there's a couple of options that you want to make sure that you've got turned off to kind of override that grid snapping. And that is this one here, the snap objects to other objects. We take a tick out of that box. And I'm also going to remove the grid lines from this screen. Click on OK. And now you'll see that when I move my object around, that is so much smoother because it's not constantly trying to snap. So it gives me a little bit more control when it comes to placing my objects on my page. Now I'm going to jump back into those grid settings and I'm just going to turn back on object snapping and snap objects to grid when the grid lines are not displayed. So now that I've turned those back on, you'll see we get that jumpy movement again. But a quick way of overriding this is to hold down your Alt key as you're dragging your object around. So instead of going in and turning on and off those options, you can just do that in order to override that snapping utility. And of course, if you need to make any granular changes, so if you prefer to have a little bit more control, if you select an object, you can use your arrow keys to move that particular object. Now again, because I have snapping turned on, you can see as I move, it definitely jumps. So if I want to be super granular, I would again go in and I would turn off those snapping options. And then when I utilize my mouse, I get much more control as to where I'm placing that particular object. Now, one final point to mention here, and it relates to those grid lines, which I'm just going to turn back on, is you can adjust the spacing of your grid line. So you're not just stuck with this one grid style. If you go back into your alignment options and down into grid settings, you can change the horizontal spacing and the vertical spacing of these grid lines. So if I want a little bit more space, I can put these up to, let's say, eight centimeters, click on OK, and I get a different type of grid. So entirely up to you how you want to display those. Hopefully that's given you a good introduction as to the plethora of alignment utilities that you have available to you within Word to really help you align those objects on your page and make your document look really professional. That's it for this module. We have one final exercise and then we are on to the next section. So I will see you over there. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We've made it down to exercise two. And in this exercise, we're gonna practice some of the skills that we've learnt in section two, which was all about those basic word skills that everybody should have. And I want to start out this exercise by showing you my answer. So on the screen, I have a document and the title is Seven Facts About Henry VIII. I have some paragraphs of text and also some numbered items. And then right at the bottom, I have another heading titled The Wives of Henry VIII, and I have eight circles all perfectly lined up. And what I want you to do in this exercise is basically recreate what I have here. So let's take a look at what I'd like you to do. So this is the same document, but you can see as we scroll through, it's in a less tidy state. So what I want you to do is utilize some of the skills you've learned in this section to replicate the neat version. So the first thing you need to do in this exercise is open the document titled Exercise 2 from the Exercises folder. I'd then like you to toggle on Show Hide so you can see all of the paragraph markers in this document. I'd then like you to go through and replace all double paragraph markers with single paragraph markers. Once you've done that, I'd like you to scroll down to page 2 and I'd like you to align these circles on the page so that they're distributed evenly and aligned to the center. I'd then like you to group the four circles together and duplicate them and position the second row so it's neatly under the first. And then just to finish up, I'd like you to give your document a spell check. So quite a few different tasks there. Please feel free to rewatch this video and pause where needed as you practice each task. So I'm going to show you my answer now, so you might want to pause this video, but if you're ready, let's proceed. So let's run through the answer to this exercise. The first thing I asked you to do was open exercise two and then turn on show hide markers. So we're going up to the home ribbon into our paragraph group and clicking show hide. So I can now see all of those paragraph markers. 
What I then wanted you to do was to find all of the double paragraph markers in the document and replace them with single paragraph markers. So for this, we need to invoke find and replace, and the shortcut key for that is Control H. Now for this, you need to click in the find what box, and then from your special options at the bottom, you need to select paragraph mark twice to find those double paragraphs. I then want to replace them with a single paragraph mark and replace all. I can see it's made five replacements. I'm going to click on OK and close down Find and Replace. The final part of this exercise was to align these circles and then duplicate them. So the first thing I'm going to do is select all of my circles by holding down my Shift key. And then up to the Drawing Tools ribbon, the Format tab, and we're going to go to our alignment options. And the first one I'm going to select here is align middle, and then I'm going to distribute them evenly. So back up to align and distribute horizontally. I now want to duplicate these four circles. So the quickest way to do that is to group these circles together. So whilst you have them selected, right click and select group. I'm then going to press the control D keyboard shortcut to duplicate and then I'm going to move these circles into position. And remember, I can select both groups of circles, go up to align, and make sure that they're both aligned to the center. And finally, I just ask you to do a quick spell check of this document, which we do from the review tab, check document. I can see I have one spelling error just here, so let's check it out. And I can see it's picked up the word Solent. Now, I know in this case that this is fine, so I'm going to say ignore once. And my spell check is complete. So those are the steps that I wanted you to take in order to recreate this document. The final thing I might want to do here, just to make this document a bit cleaner, is turn off Show Hide. That is it for exercise two. I will see you in the next section. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We've made it down to section three and in this section we're going to be talking about how you can work with different views in Word. Now views are just the way that you are viewing your document and in Word we have different views that you can toggle between and they each display your document in a slightly different way. Now, which one you choose to use very much depends on what you're trying to do at that particular time. So what we're going to do in this section is we're going to go through all of the different views that you have. I'm going to show you the difference between them and also highlight when would be the best situation to use each view. But in this first module, I really just want to introduce you to the options that we have on the view ribbon. So I've got a document open at the moment, and this is an employment contract, and I'm currently clicked on the view ribbon. So let's just take a look at the different elements which make up this ribbon. So the first group here is our views group, and, and this is really what we're going to be focusing on in the next few modules. This is where you can come to switch between all of the different views that you have available. We have read mode, we have print layout mode, web layout, outline, and draft. Now by default, more often than not, you're working in print layout view, which is the one that I have selected now. And this is by far the best view when it comes to editing your document. Now I'm gonna go into each of these different views and the advantages and disadvantages of them over the next few modules. But just be aware that this is where you come on the ribbon to switch between your different views. It's also worth noting that this isn't the only place where you can come in order to switch views. If you cast your eyes down to the bottom right hand corner of the screen, right down in the status bar, you'll see you have a zoom slider, but then you also have access to different views down here. So we have web layout view, print layout view, and also read mode and focus mode. So two different areas where you can switch between views. The next group on this view ribbon is the immersive group. Now these two options here, focus and immersive reader, you'll only have these if you are using Word 2019 or Word as part of Microsoft 365. These are newer features 
And again, they're related to how you're viewing and how you're reading your document. And once again, we're going to go into these in the following modules. The next section is page movement. And again, this is a reasonably new addition to Word. So in general, by default, when you're reading or working on a document and you scroll your mouse, it's going to scroll vertically. That's what we're all used to when we're working in a document. However, we do have now another option called side to side. So if I was to select that, you can see now if I use my mouse, I'm actually reading this document as if I had these pages on my desk in front of me. I'm reading them side by side as opposed to scrolling through vertically. And I'm going to jump that back to vertical. We then have our show group and we've pretty much seen a demonstration of everything in this little group in the course so far. I've got my rulers turned on both vertical and horizontal. We've seen what happens when we turn on grid lines and also we've utilized that navigation pane in order to navigate around our documents. The next group is the zoom group. So this is related to zooming in and out and moving around your document. So I have my zoom option here where I can jump in there and select how much I want to zoom in by. So if I say 200%, we're going to zoom right in to there, which makes things a little bit easier to read. If I want to jump back to the default of 100%, I have a dedicated button for that as well, which is going to pop me straight out again. I can choose to view just one page, multiple pages, or I can select page width. So it's going to zoom in as much as it can without cutting anything off of the document. We then have the window group. So this is related to how you arrange your different word windows on your page. And then finally on the end here, we have switch windows. So when you click this, it's going to list all of the open Word documents that you have. So now currently I only have one document open, so that's the only one I'm seeing. But if I had multiple, they would all be listed down here and I can just click to very quickly switch to that particular document. And then finally on the end here, we have a macros button where I can view any macros I have set up and also record a new macro as well. And we'll be covering this later in the course. It's also worth noting that when it comes to zooming, you do have a zoom slider in the bottom right hand corner next to those little view shortcut buttons as well. So I could utilize my slider just by dragging in and dragging out in order to change the zoom on that particular document. Also, when it comes to zoom, if you are using a mouse that has a scroll wheel, if you hold down the control button and move your scroll wheel, you see you can zoom in and out on your document like that as well. So that is pretty much it. I really just wanted to give you an overview in this module of all of the different commands and options that you have available on this views ribbon before we do a deeper dive in the next few modules. And that's exactly what we're going to do in the next module where we're going to delve a bit more into these different views. So please join me for that. Hi guys and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're down into section three where we're taking a look at the different ways that you can view your document in Word. And in the previous module, we had a quick run through of all of the options and commands available on the views ribbon. And what I want to do in this module is really focus in on reading documents. Now, sometimes, particularly if you work in a job role that requires you to read lots of long documents, so maybe you're a lawyer who's constantly reading contracts, or maybe you're a writer who needs to go through and review your work. Sometimes it's quite nice to be able to switch into a view mode that's going to allow you just to read your document. That is, it's going to remove all distractions and it's going to give you more screen space, more real estate so you can read your document a little bit easier. And fortunately, Word has a view that's going to allow you to do just that, and it's called Read Mode. So let me show you how it works. So I'm going up to the View ribbon and across to the Views group, and we're going to switch into this one just here, Read Mode. And straight away, you'll notice quite a drastic change. The thing that's most obvious is that all of our ribbons have disappeared. So anything that could possibly distract us has been removed from the top of the screen or collapsed up, I should say, leaving us with a lot more space to read our document. 
The document's also zoomed itself in to the maximum without cutting off any of the words or the sentences. So the text is nice and big on the screen, making it easier for me to read. Another thing you'll notice is that it's put it into a two column layout. So instead of just reading vertically, I'm now reading across the screen. So this is much more like a book. So here I'm seeing pages one and two. And if I want to move to the next two pages, I have an arrow over on the right hand side, which I can click. It's going to slide along like I'm turning the pages of a book and I can read the next two pages. Now, of course, I don't have to use my mouse to click on these arrows. I can also use my arrow keys to move through the different pages in this document. Now, whilst the ribbons are collapsed up when you're working in this view, you do still have access to them. If you look in the bar running across the top, we still have access to file, tools and view. So if I click view, if I want to switch back into print layout view and essentially edit my document, I can just select edit document and it's going to jump me back to print layout view. Let's go back into read mode and click view again. Now there's lots of things in this view menu that we can do whilst we're working in read mode. So we can switch to focus mode. Now I'm not going to do that right now because we are going to cover this a bit later in this module. I can bring up the navigation pane. So if I want to search for something in this particular document, I can do that. I can choose to show any comments that have been added into the document. Now I currently don't have any, but if you do, it will show all of your comments alongside your document. I can choose the column width. So currently I have the default column width set, but if I switch to narrow, I now have three narrow columns as opposed to two wider columns. And if I select wide columns, I basically just get one column. Now I like the default, so let's switch back to that. I can also change the page color. So currently I have this set to none, so I just have black text on a white background. But you also have the choice of displaying it in sepia or even in inverse. So we have a black background with white text. Now you might not personally like these, but sometimes, particularly if people have sight issues, these different color backgrounds can be a lot easier on the eye and make it easier for you to read your document. So it's worth having a little experiment with those. We then have some layout options. So I have column layout set, which I quite like, but I can also choose paper layout, which essentially puts it back very similar to print layout view where we're scrolling vertically. And let's put mine back to column layout. I have a syllables option. So this shows the breaks between syllables in your document. So let's click that. And what you'll see now is that the syllables of each word are separated by a little gray square. Back up to view and let's just turn syllables off. We have a text spacing option and this basically increases the amount of space in between the characters and also the lines. So again, if you find it a little bit easier to read a document like that, then you can jump in there and you can turn on text spacing. Now I'm going to turn mine off to put that back. And then finally, in this view menu, we have a read aloud option. So this will read out all of the text and will also highlight each word as it's read. So again, this is a really great option with regards to accessibility. If you're someone who is maybe partially sighted, then essentially you can have Word read your document back to you. Written statement of employment particulars, employee. This statement lists the terms and conditions, particulars, of your employment with us. So lots of different options for you to explore underneath that view menu. Let's take a look at what we've got in tools. So if we click on tools again, we have our find, which is just going to pop out that navigation pane. So if you want to search for anything in the document, you can just type it in and it's going to highlight much like it does in any other view mode. We also have under tools a smart lookup. So if I was to highlight a specific word, in this document, so let's say employment, go to tools and smart lookup, it's going to search for that word, it's going to pop open a pane on the right hand side, and it's going to basically search the internet and pop up any entries which relate to that particular word. So you can see in here I have some Wikipedia entries, and then also I have some results of the web search. 
So that's a nice way of being able to select someone's name or a place name or anything in your document and then explore it further on the internet without leaving the bounds of Word. And then finally in here, we have a translate option where it's going to pick up the word that I've got selected and I can choose a language to translate it to. So let's just say Dutch and there we go. And if I wanted to, I could even select insert to replace the English word with the Dutch word in the document. So a few nice options in there as well. And then of course, finally, we have our file menu and that just jumps us back to our regular backstage area. Now, if you wanted to go even further here and get rid of this blue bar running across the top, if you click on the icon right in the top right hand corner, which says auto hide reading toolbar, if you click that, it's going to get rid of those menu options. So really, all you have now on the screen is your document. You can go through and read. And to get them back again, I'm just going to click that button once more. So that is pretty much the options that you have when it comes to read mode. Now, everything I've shown you there is really related to being able to focus entirely on the document that you're reading without any distractions. And focus is such an important point when it comes to using Word. So often it's very easy for us to lose focus. We have many different distractions constantly coming at us from email notifications. We have the internet at our fingertips and we can very easily go off down a rabbit hole and lose focus on what we're doing. And with that point of focus in mind, Microsoft brought in a couple of new features which are really going to help you focus on the document at hand. And you'll find these features in this group called Immersive. And the first option we have here is Focus. And if we hover over and take a look at the screen tip, it says that when you're working in this mode, it eliminates distractions so you can focus entirely on your document. So let's jump in here and see what we have. So the real aim of focus mode is to enhance your document viewing experience by hiding all of the ribbons and distractions on the screen and allowing you just to concentrate on the content of your document. And you can see here that is pretty much literally all I have on this page. I have a plain black background and just my document. Now, of course, you can pull down those ribbons. If you move your mouse to the top of the screen, the ribbon will drop down again and you can make any selections that you need. But one thing that you'll notice is when you are in focus mode, if you go back to the view ribbon, you have an additional option that's been added and that is background. So this will allow you to change the background that you're using when you're working in focus mode. And I will say these backgrounds did used to be a lot more interesting in older versions of Word. We used to have things like a wooden coffee table background, which was quite nice. Now we just have these solid fill colors and you can go in and select whichever one is going to suit your eyes the best. So I'm going to choose dark gray. And really that is the extent of focus mode. It just clears everything out of the way, allowing you to focus on your document. Now, if you want to come out of focus mode, you can go back to your ribbon and just click the focus button once more. Or alternatively, if you press the escape key on your keyboard, that will take you out and back into print layout view. And then finally, we have the immersive reader. And the immersive reader is part of Word's learning tools. And the idea of it is to help with reading fluency and comprehension. Now, when we jump into here, you'll notice that a lot of these look fairly similar as we had access to a lot of these options when we were working in read mode. So we can change our column width and this changes the line length to improve focus and comprehension. We can change the page color, which can make text easy to scan with less eye strain. We can choose to focus in on a specific line. So I can say one line, three lines, five lines, and this is all dependent on where you're actually clicked on the page. We can increase the amount of space between words, characters, and lines with the text spacing option. We can show the breakdown between syllables to improve word recognition and pronunciation. And then of course we have that read aloud option again, which lets you hear your document as each word is highlighted. So some really useful tools within the immersive reader as well. So hopefully now you have a greater understanding of some of the tools available to you when it comes to reading and really focusing on the document at hand. 
That's it for this module. I will see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're down into section 3 where we're taking a look at the different views that you can work in when using Word. And in this module, module 3, we're going to be taking a look at print layout and web layout views. Now I currently have a document open on the screen and I'm clicked on the view tab. And as we know from previous modules, we can switch between our different views in the first group here, the views group. Now, the first thing you'll probably notice is that the view that I have currently selected is highlighted in gray. And this is normally the default print layout view. And if you're following along with me and you're not currently in this view, I would ask you to switch to it now simply by clicking on the print layout command. Now the major benefit when it comes to print layout view is that you can basically see how your document is going to look if you were to print it. So it allows you to better judge things like the margins, the spacing that you have throughout your document, page breaks, section breaks, and lots of other visual elements. And if you see anything that looks a bit strange, then it allows you to adjust them accordingly. And even if this is a document that you don't necessarily intend to print, you'll probably find that working in print layout view is going to be most suitable for you the majority of the time. Now, one other thing you'll notice with print layout view, if I scroll down to where we move on to the second page, you'll see that we have a gap in between our pages. So it makes it really easy for me to see where one page ends and the next page begins. It's also showing me that bottom margin as well. Now, if you didn't want to have any space between these pages, you could jump into File Options. And in the Display area, this first option here, Page Display Options, we have Show White Space Between Pages in Print Layout View. And you can see the screen tip says, Show the top and bottom margins, including the content of headers and footers. So if I was to untick this option and click on OK, what you'll now see is that I don't have any space between those pages and I'm not seeing the header or the footer. So this is sometimes a nice option if you are maybe just reading a really long document and you don't want to have to keep scrolling past a very large header or footer, you just want to read down the page, then that option can be quite useful. Now in this case, I'm going to turn that back on because I do want to see where one page ends and the next page begins. Also remember that if you want to switch into print layout view, you can utilize the little buttons on that status bar next to the zoom slider. So now let's jump across into web layout view. So now we're looking at our document in a completely different way. You can see that this view, you don't have margins, spacing, page breaks, and other elements which you might find distracting or disruptive when you're reading your document. And basically, Web Layout View is designed to show you what your document is going to look like if you were to upload it to the internet and publish it as a web page. It gives you a much more compact version of your document, and you can see that we don't really have any page breaks, section breaks, line breaks, or anything that's distracting us from reading this document. It's also worth noting that you don't need to switch back into Print Layout View if you want to make any edits to your document. If you are working in Web Layout View, you can simply edit your document in this view as well. So that is pretty much all there is to Print Layout and Web Layout View. Hopefully that gives you a greater understanding of the difference between the two and helps you make better decisions when it comes to establishing which one is going to be the best option for whatever it is you're doing at the time. In the next module, we're going to explore the final two views that we haven't yet looked at, and that is outline and draft view. So please join me for that. Hello everyone, and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're down in section three, where we're currently looking at how you can work with views in Word. And in the previous modules, we've taken a look at print layout and web layout view. And we've also seen some of the new modes like read mode, focus and immersive reader that really help you focus on the document at hand. In this module, we're going to finish up this section on views by taking a look at the final two views available in Word, and that is outline and draft view. 
So let's start out by switching into Draft View. Now Draft View is a view that displays just the text in your document. So you won't see any margins or page breaks, and you also won't see any images or any other visual elements. It enables you to continuously scroll through your document without any interruption, and page breaks are marked with a very faint dotted line. Now, one of the things that I really like about Draft View is its ability to show you what styles you have applied to each line in your document. Now, in order to view the styles, you need to turn on the Draft pane. So let me just show you where you need to go in order to do that. I'm going to jump up to File, and we're going all the way down into our options. And we want to jump straight across to the Advanced area. Now, if we scroll down, all the way down to this display section, you're looking for this option here. So where it says style area pane width in draft and outline views. Now, if you have that set to zero centimeters or zero, then you're not going to be able to see that style area pane. So all you need to do is change this to something like two centimeters. Click on OK. And now you can see down the left hand side, we have our style pane visible. Now, if this is a bit too narrow or a bit too wide, you can adjust it simply by dragging it in or out. But what you'll see now is that I can see every single style that I have applied to each line. So I can see that this top sentence here is a heading one. We then have a paragraph of normal text. We then have a heading two, so on and so forth. So the kind of situations where I would utilize this would be if I have a long document that I'm currently trying to add styles to, I find this view particularly useful when I'm doing that because I can see what I've applied and it just makes it a lot easier for me to ensure that everything is consistent and I'm applying the correct styles to the correct lines. Once you've finished using that styles pane, you don't have to jump back into options to turn it off. You can just grab the edge once more and just drag it all the way over to the left hand side and it will disappear. So that is draft view. Let's now jump across into outline view. Now it's worth noting that you can turn on the styles area pane for outline view as well. So let's jump up to file again, go into options, back into advanced. and I'm just going to turn that styles area pane back on again, like so. Now, outline view is useful if you just want to view the headings and subheadings and text in your document without images or other visuals. And it's a really good view to work in if you need to do some reorganizing of your document. Now, you'll see that as soon as I switched into outline view, this view comes with its own contextual ribbon. So if you have a look now, you'll see that I have a new ribbon to the left of the home ribbon called outlining. And on this ribbon, I have some controls which allow me to adjust what I'm seeing in this particular view. What you'll also notice is next to my different headings, I have these collapsible and expandable buttons. So in this outline tools group, in this first section here, this is where I can change the level heading for a particular item. So currently, if I just take this first heading one as an example, I'm clicked in the heading one. If I wanted to change that to a heading two, I could say level two. And you can see now that that has changed. And I have all of my different level headings in here that correspond to the heading levels. I also have demote and promote buttons. So I can click on promote to pull that back up to a heading one. And then I have a specific button to promote to a heading one and a specific button to demote to body text. In the next group of outline tools, this is where I can specify which levels I want to show in my outline. So for example, if I'm only interested in seeing the level twos, I can select that level and now it collapses up anything that's body text or heading three, four, and I'm only seeing those heading twos. If I say level three, I'm also going to get thrown in there now anything that I have marked as a heading three. I also have in this drop down and all levels, which is going to bring everything back again. If I want to turn off any text formatting, so maybe I have a lot of formatting in the document, making it quite hard to read, I could untick the show text formatting box, and it's just going to put that into normal text. And I also have a show first line only option, which is just going to show me the first line of any of my paragraphs. 
So if we take this one as an example, this first normal paragraph, if I say show first line only, I'm now only seeing the first line of that particular paragraph. So this view is a good view to work in if, if you have a reasonably large document that has lots of heading styles contained within it. Sometimes it's easier to jump into this view, collapse up everything that you don't need to make it easier for you to edit your document. And once you've finished working in outline view, you have a close outline view button just here. And that will take you back to print layout view and you can continue editing your document. So that is pretty much it on the subject of views. Hopefully you've got a good idea now as to what each view is, which will help you make a better decision when it comes to which view to work in for a particular task. That's it for this module and that is it for this section. We have one exercise to do and then we're going to move on into section four where we're going to be talking about working with tables. So please join me for that. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We've made it down to exercise three and in this exercise we're going to practice the skills we've learned in section three when it comes to working with views. Now this is a reasonably straightforward exercise. So the first thing I want you to do is open the exercise three document from the exercises folder. I'd like you to switch the document into read mode and change the page color to sepia. Once you've done that, I'd like you to come back to editing the document. What I'd then like you to do is switch to outline view and turn on the styles pane. And I want you to make sure that you've set the styles pane to two inches. Now the final part of this exercise is optional. It's not content that we've covered in this particular section, but at this stage in a word advanced course, these are definitely skills you should know. So if you do want to practice your skills a little further in Word, the final part of this exercise is to replace all of these numbered items with the heading three style. Now, just a little tip on this. If you have the styles pane open, you're going to be able to see what styles are currently applied to these numbered items. And you can use that information to very quickly change all of those styles to a heading three. Now, as I mentioned, that last part is completely optional, so see how you go with that. If you want to go through this exercise, you can pause the video now. If you'd like to see the answer to this exercise, then carry on watching this video. So let's take a look at the answer to this exercise. The first thing I asked you to do was to switch into read mode and change the page color to sepia. So I'm going to go up to the view ribbon and into my views group and switch to read mode. Now to change this background page color to sepia, all we need to do is jump up to view, go down to page color and select sepia. I then asked you to go back to editing the document. So again, we're going to go up to view and select edit document. I then asked you to switch into outline view making sure that you can see the styles pane. Now currently I can't see my styles pane, so I need to go into the backstage and turn that on. So let's jump up to file and down to options. And we want to select advanced from this list. And we're gonna scroll down until we get to the display section. And you can see here it says style area pane width in draft and outline views. And currently that's set to zero centimeters. And what I've asked you to do is change this to two inches. So I'm gonna go just above, change the measurement to inches, and then I'm gonna type in two and click on okay. And now you'll see the styles pane in the left-hand margin. Now the optional part of this exercise was to replace all of these numbered items with a heading three style. And a little tip I gave you was that when you've got the styles pane showing, you can see which styles are applied to each paragraph. So I can see here that I have the list paragraph style applied to all of my numbered items. So a quick way of changing everything that's marked as a list paragraph to a heading three is to go to the home ribbon, jump into the advanced options for styles. I'm just gonna make this a little bit bigger I'm going to find the list paragraph style, which is towards the bottom here, 
click the drop down, and I'm going to say select all seven instances. So very quickly, that's going to select all items where list paragraph is the style. Now I have them all selected. I can simply jump up to my styles gallery and very quickly apply a heading three. I'm going to close down my styles pane and switch my document back to print layout. And there we go. That was what I was looking for. I hope you got on OK with that. I will see you in the next section. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're down into section four and in this section we're going to explore some of the more advanced features of working with tables in Word. Now tables are an extremely useful feature and probably something that you utilize already when you're putting together a document. Tables help us organize our information into columns and rows, making the information a lot easier to read. Tables also have their own contextual ribbons where you can change the layout and apply formatting. And you can format tables to your heart's content so that they really stand out from your document or are in line with company branding guidelines. And in this first module, I want to start out by showing you how you can create your own table styles. Now, before we dive straight into that, we're going to do a little bit of a recap and create a table from some data that I have imported into this Word document. So essentially what I have here is some sales information, which originally existed in an Excel spreadsheet. And what I want to do is I want to put this information into this Word document and organize it in a nice table. So all I've really done to pull this across is I've opened up the Excel spreadsheet and I've copied and pasted it with no formatting into my Word document. So if you ever have this situation where you have a bunch of text on the screen and you want to put it into a table, there is a really nice feature in Word called Convert Text to Table, which allows you to do this simply and easily. Now with this data, you'll see in this first line here, this is basically my column headings. And then I have my data for those column headings underneath. But what you'll also see is that it's not quite lined up. Every single field is separated by a tab character. Now, how do I know that? Well, if we turn on our show hide markers, I can see these little arrows indicate that that is a tab separating each of the fields. And this is quite important for an accurate conversion. If you have some consistency with the character that's been used to separate each field, then Word should do a pretty good job at converting your text into a table. Whereas if you have a mixture of different things separating the fields, then you might find that you have to do a little bit of rearranging after you've done the conversion. But our data looks pretty good, so I'm going to turn off my show hide markers, and we're going to convert this text to a table. So all I need to do is highlight everything. I'm going to jump up to the insert ribbon and click the lower half of that table drop down. And I'm looking for this option here, convert text to table. And essentially what it does is it looks at my data, it looks at where I have those tab spaces, and it tries to work out how many columns and rows I'm going to need. So it's worked out that I need seven columns, so that would be right, country, product, units sold, manufacturing price, sale price, and gross sales. And it's worked out that I also need 18 rows. I'm going to say create me a table with fixed column width so all of my columns are even. And at the bottom here, I tell it that my text is separated with tab characters. I'm going to click on OK and let's see how it's done. Well, not too bad. It's guessed that I've got more columns than I actually have. So I'm simply going to come into here, highlight the column that I no longer need. And on my table tools layout ribbon in my rows and columns group, I'm going to select delete column. So now that I've deleted that column, it's left me quite a lot of space. The table doesn't automatically resize to accommodate that blank space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to auto fit this table by selecting the entire table up to the layout ribbon and we have some auto fit options. So auto fit to contents will basically modify the table so that each column is as wide as the widest item in the table. I can auto fit to the window 
which will expand the table so that it's flush on either side with the left and right margin. Or I can choose a fixed column width so all of my columns are exactly the same size. Now in this case, I want to auto fit to window. And there we go, my table is now a lot more evenly spaced. And if I wanted to, I can go in and I can make some further adjustments simply by dragging these columns over. Now looking at my table and looking at this first column, I can see that this would probably fit a little bit better if I change United Kingdom and United States of America to UK and USA respectively. So this is where I can utilize find and replace. So up to home, we're going to go all the way across to the editing group and we're going to select replace. And I'm going to say find United Kingdom and replace with UK. I'm going to replace all and we're going to do the same but we're going to find United States of America and replace that with USA and replace all. So there we go with a few edits my table is now looking a lot neater. So once we're at this stage I'm probably going to want to jazz this table up a little bit and make it stand out by applying some kind of table style. And we have a whole host of table styles available on the table tools design ribbon. And it's this large group in the middle. We have numerous different options and it really depends how we want our table to look. So we have some plain table styles. You can see as I hover over, I'm getting that live preview in the document in the background. I have some grid table styles. So this is where we can start to apply some colors. These table styles will give our heading row a color. The next row will give the first column and the heading row a darker color. And there is a whole host of different table styles that you can apply if you scroll through the list. So let's just apply something fairly straightforward. I'm going to apply this grid table four accent five style. Now it's worth noting that when you do apply a table style, because the table style might make certain words bigger or might make them bold, you might find that you'll need to come back into the table and just rejig some of the widths of these columns again to accommodate the newly formatted text. And also here, I'm not particularly interested in having my countries showing in bold. So I'm going to select them all and utilizing my mini toolbar pop up, I'm going to deselect bold. So reasonably quickly, I've been able to use Word's inbuilt table styles to very quickly format a table of data. Now that's all well and good, but what if you want to create your own table style, which maybe aligns more to your company or branding colors or house style? Well, you can definitely do that as well. You'll see right at the bottom, we have an option to create a new table style. And this is going to allow us to define how we want each element of the table formatted. It's then going to save it as a table style, which we can then reuse. So let's quickly create a new style and apply it to our table. So the first thing I need to do here is give my new style a name. So I'm going to call this Deb Table. The style type, well, I'm doing a table style, so I'm going to select table from that list. And then I can basically choose a style to base it on. And this is really like a starting point. So in here, we have lots and lots and lots of different table styles. And if I select one of them, you'll see in the preview window below what that looks like. So if you want to utilize one of these as your starting point, you can do that. And then you can format the various different elements. So I'm going to start with table grid light. And now we can go in and format each of the individual elements of the table. So in the apply formatting to drop down, you can see we have whole table, header row, total row, first column, so on and so forth. So you just go through and select where you want to apply the formatting and then set the formatting properties. So I'm going to start out with the whole table. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the font for the entire table to this font just here. And I'm actually going to make it slightly smaller because that is quite a large font. And I'm happy with the font color and the borders. But what I am going to do is I'm going to center everything like so. I'm now going to go back up to my apply formatting to drop down and I'm going to define how I want the header row to look. 
So I want my header row to be in bold. I want the background fill of the header row to be, let's do a dark green color. And I want the font to be white so it stands out. I'm going to go back up to my apply formatting too. And I could do total row, first column, last column. But I'm going to say even banded rows. And I'm going to choose my fill color, which is going to be a lighter green color. And I could carry on going through applying formatting for each element of my table. Now I'm happy with the way that looks, so I'm going to leave it just there. But I have a final selection to make at the bottom here. I can choose to make this table style available only in this document or in new documents based on this template. Now I'm not using any specific template for my document. So when you don't select a template, you're using the normal dot dot template. So pretty much most documents that you create are going to be based on the normal dot dot template. So if I was to select this option, new documents based on this template, pretty much every time I create a new blank document, my table style is going to be available. So I'm going to select this option and I'm going to say, OK. And what you'll see now is that in our table styles drop down, we have a new group at the top called custom. And this is where you'll find any table styles that you've created. And I can just click it to apply it to my table. Now I can see here once I've applied it that that first column is again in bold. So what I want to do is jump back into my table style, modify it and remove bold for that first column. So up to table styles, right click your mouse and you have an option for modify table style. So now I'm going to say apply formatting to first column. And what you'll see here is that in this window, it doesn't actually show as being in bold. But if it's showing in bold in your table, then just toggle it. So it appears to be on in your modify style box. Click on OK and you'll find the reverse happens. Now, a couple of other things I can also do in this right click menu. I could set this table style as default. So whenever I create a table, it's going to utilize this style. I could also choose to apply the table style, but clear out all of the formatting or apply and maintain formatting, which is basically just the same as clicking on the style. And of course, if I no longer need the table style, I have a delete table style option in here as well. So that is how you convert text to a table and also create and apply your own table styles. In the next module, we're going to delve a little bit more into formatting and we're going to talk about table breaks and repeat headings. So please join me for that. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're down in section four where we're taking a look at some of the more advanced options when it comes to working with tables in documents. And in the previous module, we took a look at how you can convert text to a table and then create your own table style. Now, in this module, we're going to delve a little bit more into table properties, and I'm going to show you how you can split a table and also how you can repeat table headings. So in this document, I have a similar table to in the last module, but this one contains a lot more information. You'll see that this table runs across three pages. Now there's something very important to note when it comes to dealing with a larger table like this. So I'm going to select the table and I'm going to right click and jump into table properties. Now there's an option in here in the rows section that says allow rows to break across pages. And currently I have that ticked and you'll probably find that you also have it ticked because it is the default setting. Now, when you have this option ticked, what that basically means is that if you have a row, for example, this bottom row of page one, if this row contains a lot of information, the row will essentially break across both pages. So let me show you an example. I'm just going to make this row a little bit wider by adding in some returns. So now essentially what I have is this one row breaking across the pages and that's being controlled by that little setting in table properties. So let's go back and select the entire table again. Now another way of selecting the entire table is to jump up to the layout ribbon and in this first group click the drop down underneath select and choose select table. We can then jump into table properties using the properties button. 
and it takes us back to that same dialog box. So now if I was to untick allow rows to break across pages and click on OK, what you'll see now with this final row is that it will shift the entire row down onto the next page. So I no longer have a row splitting across two pages. So that's a really important point to note when you're dealing with tables that run across multiple pages. Now I'm going to control Z to undo and put that row back on that first page. Now another thing you can do when it comes to a very large table is that you can actually split that table up. So if I decided that I wanted to split this table into two, all I need to do is select the row where I want it to split, jump up to the Table Tools Layout ribbon, and then in the Merge group, I have a Split Table option. And you'll see it splits where I was clicked. And what it's also done there, because this is now a new table, it's automatically applied my table style and made the first row a heading row. Now, I don't actually want it to look like that. So what I'm going to do here to fix that is I'm going to jump up and select the entire table again. I'm going to go across to the design ribbon and in the table style options, I'm going to untick header row. And that will remove that header formatting. So now essentially I have two tables in my document. This first one, which is a fairly small table, and then this second one, which spreads across the rest of the pages. Now another little cool trick here that's worth knowing is that if you put a table into a blank document, it's going to insert right at the top of the page, which means that if I then want to go in and maybe add a title to the top of this document, I can't click. There's nowhere for me to click my cursor in order to add the title. Now you could get around this by copying and pasting the table further down the page, but there is a much easier trick to get a blank line above any table that's inserted at the top of the document. Make sure that your mouse is clicked in the first table cell, so just before where it says country, and then if you press Control shift enter that is going to put a blank line above the table for you. And now I can add in my title, like so, and I might want to give this some formatting, and I'm going to make this a little bit bigger, like so. So now I've got this table split into two. What if I want to do the reverse of that? What if I decide that I now no longer want them split and I want to re-merge them together? Well, again, there is a cool little keyboard shortcut that can do this for you very simply. So the first thing you need to do is once again, select the bottom table. And then to merge it with the top table, if you do Alt, Shift, Up Arrow, it's as simple as that. Now the final thing I want to show you with this table is how you can repeat the header row across multiple pages. So in order to demonstrate this a little bit clearer, I'm going to change the way that I'm viewing my document. So I'm up in the View ribbon, I'm going to go to the Zoom group and I'm going to say that I want to view my document as multiple pages. So this is going to put my three pages side by side, and this makes it a lot clearer to see. So you can see that on page one I have my column headings there, so country, product, units sold, so on and so forth. But those currently don't repeat across the other pages. And sometimes it can be a bit confusing if you're looking at data where you can't actually see those column headings to know what information you're looking at. So there is a very simple way to get those column headings to repeat across all of your pages. Now I'm going to go back to zooming into 100%. So I'm going to select the row that I want to repeat. So in this case, this is the header row. I'm going to right click my mouse and go into Table Properties. And the option that you need to select is this one just here, Repeat as Header Row at the top of each page. So let's put a tick in the box, click on OK. And now if we look down, I can see that I have those header rows repeated across all of the pages. So it's as simple as that. Now that option will repeat whichever row that you have selected, so that doesn't necessarily have to be the header row. If you have a different row within your table that you want to repeat at the top of each page, then all you would need to do is select it and run through the same process again. And that is pretty much it for this module. We've explored how we can split up a table and how we can join it back together again, how we can add a blank row above a table, 
and also how we can get those header rows to repeat across multiple pages. I hope you found that useful. I will see you in the next module. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're down in section four where we're looking at working with tables in Word documents. And so far we've seen quite a few really useful tips and tricks when it comes to manipulating tables. In this module, I want to talk to you a little bit about how you can work with formulas to do calculations with table data. Now formulas are more commonly associated with Excel, but you do have a selection of formulas that you can also utilize in Word. And the good news is the functions and the formulas should look very familiar if you are an Excel user, because they are pretty much exactly the same. So to add up numbers, we use the sum function, to find the minimum value, we use min, the maximum value, max, so on and so forth. However, there is a slight difference when it comes to how you select the data that you want to perform the calculation on. So in this module, I'm gonna run through a few different ways that you can utilize formulas. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a totals row to the bottom of this table. So I'm going to press control end to jump me all the way to the bottom of my table and I'm going to quickly add a new row. Now there's numerous different ways that you can add rows into tables, but by far the quickest way is just to click your mouse just outside the last row of the table on the right hand side and then press your enter key and that's going to give you a brand new row. So I'm going to add a total row in. And I'm going to format this very slightly. So I'm going to make it stand out by applying some bold font. And I'm also going to give this a top border to separate it from the rest of the data. So I'm going to go into my borders group on the table tools design ribbon. I'm going to select the width that I want the border. So I'm going to say one and a half points. And I'm going to choose the pen color. We're going to have this as a dark green. And then the border that I'm going to add is just going to be a top border, like so. So now we have a real separation between our table data and our total row. Now in the last two columns of my table, I have sale price and gross sales. And it might be that I want to perform some calculations on these two columns. So let's start with the sales price. I'm going to click in that last row in that column. And we're gonna add in a formula, first of all, that's basically just gonna add up everything in this sales price column. So if we jump up to the table tools layout ribbon, in that final group on the end, the data group, we have an option to add a formula. So let's click it. So this is our little formulas dialog box, and you can see that Word has made a guess as to what I might want to do with these numbers. And it's input the formula into the formula field for me. So it's doing a simple sum calculation, but instead of selecting cells like you would in Excel, it's got the word above, which basically means it's gonna sum all of the numeric values above where I'm clicked, which is essentially the entire column. And it probably won't surprise you to know that if we had our table laid out in a slightly different way, I could utilize the word below to sum everything below. I can say sum everything to the left or sum everything to the right. I can even combine two and say sum everything to the right and to the left. So you can use these directional words in order to essentially select the range that you want to sum. Now I'm going to stick with above in this case. I can then choose what I want my number format to be. So if I look at my number format in this column, I can see that I have two decimal places. So the number format I'm going to want to use is going to be this one just here that has those two decimal places. Now the paste function box at the bottom, this essentially shows you all of the functions that are available for you to use in a formula in a word table. And we're going to look at a couple of these other ones in a moment, but for the time being, I'm happy with my sum calculation. I'm going to click on OK, and there we go. Now, unlike Excel, we don't have an autofill, so we can't essentially drag this formula across in order to total the gross sales column as well. So there's a couple of ways that we can get around this. We can either click 
in the gross sales column and repeat what we've just done by adding in the formula. Alternatively, I could copy the formula, control C, and do a control V to paste it in. Now you'll notice that it hasn't updated, but if I click and then right click and select update field, that will refresh it and give me my new total. So that's a quick little workaround. Now let's go back to this field. I'm just going to delete out that value and let's add in another formula. Now, another way that you can do this is instead of using the words above, below, left and right to essentially make your selections, you can almost do cell references with word tables. Now, this isn't quite as intuitive as something like Excel, but let me show you how you can do it. So I'm going to cancel out of here for one moment and scroll to the top of this last page. Now, the way that you can utilize cell references is basically to count the number of columns in your table. So essentially in Word, the first column is column A, second column B, C, D, E, and F. So that is the first part of my cell reference. I then need to tell Word which row I want to utilize. Now, the problem here occurs because unlike Excel, the rows in our table are not numbered. And that might be fine if you have quite a small table, you can just count down. But in my table, I have a lot of rows. So how can I find out what my row numbers are? Well, unfortunately, there isn't a great way to do this. You either do have to count down or, for example, if I want to see how many rows I have in this table, what I can do is select the entire table right click my mouse and jump into table properties and you'll see when we click on that row tab it says rows 1 to 124. So I know that I have 124 rows in my table. So if I was adding up something towards the end of this table that's probably going to help me work out which row number I need. As I said, not particularly intuitive, but I'm just trying to show you some ways that you could possibly think about doing this. So just as an example, I know I've got 124 rows. Let's add up row 123 and 124 of the sale price column. So the sale price column is A, B, C, D is column E. So I'm going to jump up into my formula. And this time I'm going to replace the word above and we're going to sum row 122 and 123 because 124 is the actual totals row. So that's going to be E122, comma E123. We're going to choose our number format, which is decimal places. Click on OK and it's given me the answer of $22, which I can see very clearly is the sum of both of these numbers. Now I'm going to delete this out again and let's jump back up to our formula button. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you have a whole host of different functions that you can utilize in Word tables. So for example, I could count the number of items I have in this particular column. So what I can do is delete out the current formula, being careful to leave the equal sign there and choose a different function that I want to use. So this time I'm going to utilize count and I'm just going to say count everything above, click on OK. And you see it's given me $122. I'm probably going to want to go in there and just change that number formatting to just a plain number like so. And just to show you one final example of a slightly more complicated formula, we're going to jump back into our formula button. We're going to remove what we have in there and this time we're going to do an if calculation. So I'm going to select if. Now if you don't know what if is, if you're not an Excel user, if basically does a logical test and it will give you one of two answers. For example, if you have some students that have all taken a test, you might want to say if student A receives a mark of greater than 70%, then he gets an A. So that is a logical test with an outcome. I'm just going to utilize this to show you very quickly how you can do an if calculation in your word table. So let's do something pretty basic here. I'm going to say if the sum of, and let's use those cell references again, E122, 
and E123, if that is greater than 20, then I want you to put 20 in the cell. If it's not, I want you to put a zero. Now again, if you're not used to Excel formulas, then this will probably seem a little bit strange, a little bit complicated, but let's just read through this formula again. So we're saying if the sum, so the total of E122 and E123 is greater than 20, then I want the number 20 to appear in the cell. If it's not, then I want a zero to appear in the cell. Now these are the two cells that we added up previously, so I know the result is going to be 21, which essentially is greater than 20. So what I'm expecting to see when I click OK here is the number 20 in this cell. And I'm going to make sure I have my number format set to an integer. And I'm going to say OK. And there we go. So a few different examples there of utilizing formulas in your word tables. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you in the next module. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We've made it all the way down to exercise four and in the preceding section we've been talking about working with tables. And in this exercise we're going to get a chance to practice all of those skills that we've learnt. So on the screen here I have my finished document. So this is what we're working towards. This is what I want you to replicate in this exercise. So what I have on the screen here are two different tables. I can see that they have some table formatting applied and I can also see that each of the tables has a totals row. So when you're working through this exercise, if you need a reference point as to what I'm after, I want you to essentially recreate this. So let's see what we need to do. So this is our starting document. It's exercise four in the exercises folder. And what I currently have here is one long table. It has about 30 or so employee names. It has their department. Then we have a blank column and then we have their salary. So the first part of this exercise, I want you to remove the blank column from the table and then auto fit the table to the window. Once you've done that, I want you to split up this table. So you'll see that the first half of this table contains employees in the finance department and the second part of the table contains employees in the sales department. So essentially, I want all of the finance employees in one table and all of the sales employees in another table. So I want you to split this table into two separate tables. Once you've done that, I want you to make sure that the second table has a heading row the same as this row that I currently have highlighted. And then once you've done that, I'd like you to apply a table style to both tables. And if you want to go a little bit more advanced with this, I would encourage you to create your own table style. And then finally, I want you to add a totals row at the bottom of each table and add a formula into the salary column that's going to calculate the total of all staff salaries. So quite a few tasks for you to practice there. As always, pause this video as needed, but if you'd like to see my answer, carry on watching this video. So let's take a look at the answer. The first thing I asked you to do in this exercise was to remove the blank column from the table. So I'm going to select my column, right click, and I'm going to say delete columns. I then asked you to auto fit the table to the window. So I need to select the entire table, go up to my table tools layout ribbon, and in the middle here, I have an auto fit option, and I want to say auto fit to window to resize that table. I then asked you to split this table into finance and sales employees. So I'm going to go down until I find the first sales employee. And I'm just going to select that entire row. I'm going to jump back up to my table tools layout ribbon. And in the merge group, I have my split table option. So I now essentially have two separate tables. Now my second table currently doesn't have a header row. So I'd like you to add one of those. So again, we're going to right click go to insert and say insert rows above and then I'm just going to add in those column headings. 
I then asked you to apply a table style of your choosing to both of these tables. And the advanced option here was to create your own table style. So I'm going to select my first table up to the table tools design ribbon. And if I was creating my own table style, I would need to click the drop down in the table styles gallery and select new table style at the bottom. And at this point, I could give my style a name and then set the options for my table. The simpler option for this would be just to select a table style from the drop down gallery. So I'm going to choose my custom table style and I'm going to apply this to both of my tables. And the final thing I asked you to do was to add a totals row to the bottom of both tables and use a formula to calculate the total salaries for each department. So let's first add in a new row. I'm just going to click at the end of the table and hit enter to add in that row. I'm going to type in total, tab across to that final row, and then I'm going to go up to the layout ribbon and insert a formula. Now the formula that I've got in here, the default is correct. It's just going to sum everything that's above and I'm going to choose a number format. I want the dollar currency sign and two decimal places after and click on OK. I'm going to do exactly the same for the second table. Hit enter, type in total, tab tab, click on formula, select my number format and click on OK. And there we go. If you got something that looked like this, then you are doing pretty good so far. That's the end of this exercise. I will see you in the next section. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We've made it down to section five and in this section we're going to explore the wonderful visual world of graphics and pictures. Now whilst content is king when it comes to Word documents, it's also extremely important to think about how your documents look and make them engaging for your reader by utilizing pictures, text effects, icons and graphics. And in this first module, we're going to take a look at how you can add interest to text by utilizing word art. So in this document in front of me, I just have a circle shape with a nice image in the middle. And this might be some kind of logo for a travel company or maybe some kind of image that I want to use in the heading of a newsletter. What I want to do here is I want to add in some nice text onto this picture. And I'm sure we're all aware of the numerous font formatting options that we have available in Word. You can find them all on the home ribbon in the font group. Now, I don't want to actually concentrate on those. I just want to show you a different type of formatting that you can apply to any text. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually insert a text box because I want to be able to move this piece of text over the top of my image. So I'm going to click on the insert tab. And over in the text group, our first option here is text box. And you'll see that we have quite a few pre-formatted text boxes that we can insert into our Word document. So it really depends what you want your text box to look like. Now, I just want a simple text box, so I'm going to select this first option just here. Now, this simple text box just has default formatting. And you can see that I get some test text within a nice little text box, which I can pick up, drag and drop wherever I want to on the page. And of course, I can edit this text. So I'm going to add in the name of this travel company, which is Go Explore Travel. Now, currently, my text looks a little bit dull. But as we all know, we have many options available to us on the home ribbon in the font formatting group. But what I want to go through in this module is I want to introduce you to some of the word art options. So let's jump across to the insert tab. And again, over in this text group, you can see that we have a drop down for word art. Now, all word art is, is a quick way of applying different types of formatting to a piece of selected text. Now, the word art gallery is reasonably limited, but I like to see these as more of a starting point because every element or every property of the word art can also be customized. So I'm going to go in and let's just select this second one here, fill blue accent color one with a shadow. 
And there we go, you can see I get another text box which is showing me my newly formatted word art. So I can then drag and drop that and place that wherever I like. Now, as I mentioned before, once you have added some word art into your document, you can then jump up to the format tab and you have this word art styles group. If we click the drop down in the gallery, you, you can change your text to any one of the options that you see available here. And as I hover over each one, I get this kind of live preview so I can see what that's going to look like when applied to my text. Now it might be that I want to change this to gradient fill gold accent color four. So let's do that. And my text has changed. I also have other options in here to customize this further. So if I quite liked the style, but I didn't particularly like the font color, I can go in and I can change the fill color. I also have some gradient fill options down here, which I can choose from. So if I was to change this to a green color, and then go back up and say gradient, I have different variations of a green gradient. Now I'm actually gonna change this back to blue. And you can see I still have a yellow outline. So again, if I wanted to, I can jump up to my Word Art Styles group and change that text outline to something else. So let's just do a darker blue. And what I also have in here is the ability to add some text effects to my Word Art. So if we click on text effects, I can add a shadow and you'll see that change in the live preview. I can add an inner shadow or a perspective shadow as well. We have lots of other options in here. So reflection can be quite a nice one. We have glow, which will put a nice glow around the selected text. We can make it a bevel texture. And I have to say probably out of all of these, this is the one I use the least. And we have some 3D rotation options as well. So it really depends how you want your text to look. Something else that we also have is this transform utility. So this allows you to warp your text in various different ways. So if I just show you one of these follow path options, let's click this arch just here. You can see what that's done to this particular selected text. So I could then drag that down and into my logo. And when I click away, I can see that yes, that looks quite nice. And if I wanted to, I could also warp this a little bit more. So by utilizing this little orange handle, if I drag this down, you can see I'm drawing a path like so. And then if I decide that I don't want it inside the picture, I can move that to just above and I can make any editing changes to this piece of text that I need to using my word art styles group. Now I'm going to drag this back down and just place it within my logo. And don't forget that whenever you see that little arrow in the bottom right hand corner of any group, if you click the arrow, it's going to take you into more formatting options for your selected item. So a lot of these are repeats of what we already have in this word styles group. So for example, I can add shadows from here. I can also add different types of reflection, but I have some additional options. So I could add a shadow and then I could do things like change the transparency, change the size, so on and so forth. So I have a little bit more control when it comes to the text effects that I'm adding. I can change my text fill and outline from here as well. So if I wanted to switch it to a gradient fill, I could definitely do that and I can adjust my gradient options. So let's just click this end gradient stop and I'm gonna change that color to a darker blue. And I'm gonna adjust these gradient stops and you'll see as I do this, it adjusts it very slightly in my logo. I also have similar options for the text outline as well. So if I didn't want any outline, if I say no outline, it's going to get rid of that. Now, I don't like that because it kind of blends a bit too much into the background. I'm going to say solid line, but I'm going to take the width of that line down very slightly. So it's a little bit more subtle. And then finally, we have a text box option. And this is where I can choose my alignment position and also the text direction. So if I was to change this to something like rotate all text 90 degrees, you can see what we get there. It's a little bit of a mess because of the warp that I have on there. Now, one thing I'll say about word art is that some of the options that you have are not particularly useful when it comes to creating professional documents. 
Most of the time when I'm utilizing word art, I'm doing some kind of fun personal project. So maybe it's some kind of newsletter or an invitation to a party. So just bear that in mind when you're utilizing word art. That's it for this module. I will see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. This is still Deb and we are down in section 5 where we're taking a look at graphics and pictures. In this module I'm going to talk to you about filling shapes with pictures because this is a really nice effect and I get so many questions about exactly how to do this correctly. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples. Now what I have open on the screen here is a template for a newsletter. And this is just a template that's available in Word that I've modified to suit the travel industry. So this might be some kind of newsletter that goes out to all of our customer base every single month. And it gives them updates on what trips are upcoming and also some useful information. So this newsletter currently is made up of quite a large header. So everything you can see in the top half here that looks like it's slightly greyed out is actually the header. And if I double click right at the top of the page, it takes me into that header. And I can now go in and edit the individual elements. Now what I want to focus on here are these three pictures on the left hand side. What I've done here is I've drawn a rounded rectangle shape and then I have filled it with a picture. Now I've seen people try to fill shapes with pictures many, many times. And I've seen people try all kinds of weird and wonderful things to get the picture to fit exactly inside the shape. So I'm going to show you a quick trick on how to make this really easy. So I'm going to close my header and footer and let's move down our newsletter. So what I've got here are two shapes essentially, which we're going to fill with pictures. The first one is this shape that looks like a very large tab shape. And then we have a circle. And all I've done to get these is jump up to the insert ribbon, go into shapes, and I've selected the rectangle top corners rounded for this first shape. And then the second shape is simply an oval. Now one thing to note with this oval, and I'll just quickly click it and show you, if I just select that shape and start to draw, I get a very free form oval shape. If I want it to be exactly a circle, what I need to do, and let me just select that again, is hold down the shift key as I drag and it gives me a nice equal circle. So that is how I got this circle shape in my document. So what I want in here essentially is in this top rounded rectangle shape, I want to fill this with a picture of the featured trip, which is Rwanda. So what I've done is I've actually saved off a picture already that I want to use within this shape. So once you have your picture saved off, all you need to do to fill this shape very neatly is right click on the shape and jump into the format shape option. And you'll get this pane pop out on the right hand side and under the fill section, you want to make sure you select picture or texture fill. And what you'll see get filled in there first of all is the last picture that you utilized. So for me, that was the picture of Morocco that I used up in this header. Now don't worry about that too much and also don't worry about the fact that it looks very stretched and distorted. We're going to fix that with the method that we use. So what I want to do now is I want to go down and I want to choose my picture source, which in this case is my local drives because that's where I have my picture saved off to. I'm going to select insert and I get a choice from a file, online pictures or from icons. So if you didn't have a picture saved off, you could jump into online pictures and you could search for gorillas. And essentially this will do a search of the internet. Now you can go in and choose a picture that you want to add, but I will say something about inserting pictures into documents is that you need to be careful of the copyright on the picture. Always make sure that you have Creative Commons only ticked at the top because that will list pictures that you can utilize in your documents. I will say that even if you do check this box, it's always worth double checking exactly what the license is on a picture before you use it. 
If it's a picture that nobody's going to see apart from you, then you're probably okay to add pretty much any picture. But if this document's going to be shared or used in promotional material, then you really need to be careful of the copyright. And just on that note, if you are looking for free pictures that you can freely use in any of your documents or any of your PowerPoint presentations even, then I would suggest that you check out a couple of different websites. The first website that is amazing for free stock photos and videos is pexels.com. It has a very simple search interface. You just search for what you're looking for. So let's say gorillas, hit enter. And we have all of these pictures come up and these are all free to download and use. So all you need to do is select the picture you want to use and you have a free download button at the top. So this is a great website for images. Another website that's really good is unsplash.com. So this works in a similar way. Again, we just have that search bar, very simple, type in gorilla, and it's going to pull back all of the images that you can utilize. So a couple of really good resources there if you're looking for images. So I'm going to cancel out of here because I'm going to use a picture that I have saved off to my local PC. And the picture I'm using is actually from that Pexels website. So I'm going to save from a file and I'm going to use this picture just here. Click on insert and you can see it inserts it into the shape. Now again, look at how that image is distorted. And this is where people get a bit stuck. They manage to get to this stage and insert the picture, but then they see that the picture looks pixelated, blurry, distorted, and they don't really know how to fix that. Well, it's very simple. We just need to use our fill utility. So with the shape and the picture selected, I'm going to jump up to my picture tools, format ribbon. And the option we want to go to is in this end group here, the crop button. And I'm going to click the lower half. And what I want to say is I want to fill the picture in the shape. And it kind of looks like this. So what I can then do is because I want to have the gorilla's face in this, I'm going to drag the picture down. Like so. And once I have it in the position that I want, I'm going to go back to my crop button and I'm going to say crop. And there we go. So now the image is no longer distorted. So I've got one picture in place in my newsletter and things are starting to look really nice. I have one more that I need to do and that is this picture down here. So currently where I have this empty circle, you can see just above it says speak to our Africa continent specialist Ed O'Mara now. And what I want is a picture of Ed smiling and ready to take your call. Now, once again, I have a picture of Ed saved off to my PC. So I'm going to select my shape, right click and jump into format shape. And we're going to go through the same process. I'm going to say fill with a picture or texture fill. It's going to fill it with the last image I used, but we're just going to jump straight down into picture source say insert from a file and there is Ed. Once again, our picture is distorted. So we're going to jump up to picture tools format, go into our crop tool and select to fill the picture within the shape. And there we go. Now, if I wanted to make him a little bit bigger, I can drag the picture out or in. I can move it around and just get it in the position that I want it to be in. So let's move it just there like so. I'm going to say crop and crop. And there we go, a perfectly cropped picture. Now I've removed that picture of Ed because I want to show you a slightly different way of doing this. Let's imagine that Ed has now left the company and has been replaced with a different Africa continent specialist and her name is Claire Stone. So now I want her picture to be filled in this circle. Now, another way that I could do this is if I had a picture of Claire Stone elsewhere in this document, I can utilize it to fill the shape as opposed to inserting it from a saved picture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump down to the second page and we're just going to insert a picture of Claire Stone. 
And there we go. So this might be elsewhere in the document. I want to take this picture and I want to use it to fill this shape. So what I could do is click on her picture and copy it, Control C. As soon as I copy it, that picture is now saved to the clipboard. So when I come to fill my shape, when I select it and go to my format shape pane and select picture or texture fill, in my picture source, instead of choosing insert, I can now choose the clipboard option and it's going to fill it with whatever I have collected on my clipboard last. Now that picture is pretty good, but I am going to go up to the format ribbon and do my crop and fill and just move her over very slightly. And maybe I will make this picture a little bit bigger so that she's closer into the camera like so and click the crop button. I can then safely go in and delete out this picture if I need to. So that is how you insert a shape. You fill it with a picture using the insert method and also the clipboard method. I hope you found that useful. I will see you in the next module. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're down in section five where we've been exploring the options that we have when it comes to graphics and pictures in your documents. And in the previous module, we took a look at how you can fill shapes with pictures. Now in this module, I want to talk to you a little bit about file size when it comes to a document that contains multiple images. One thing you need to be careful of if you do have a document like this that has a lot of graphics in it or photos that you've added is that the file size can get really huge. So if we take a look at this particular document that I have open on the screen, which is our travel newsletter, I've got quite a lot of images in here. Now these ones at the top seem fairly small, so you might think, well, they're not going to take up too much space. This one's a bit larger, but all in all, but on the face of it, these images wouldn't seem to increase the file size by a great deal because they're not absolutely huge. However, let's jump in and take a look at what the file size is currently at. If we jump up to the file tab and go down to info in the properties section, I can see the size of this particular document. And currently it's a whopping 43.6 meg. Now that is a pretty large file. And what you will notice is that if you do have a document which has quite a few pictures in it, you'll start to notice some lag. So when it comes to things like saving, it will take a little bit longer. If you have this document automatically uploading into OneDrive or cloud storage, you might find you get a delay as it does that. So what can we do about this if we want a nice document with lots of really high quality images in it? Well, there is something we can do to help keep that file size down. And that is an option in Word called Compress Images. So what you need to do is you need to click on any image in your document. So let's click on our image of the gorilla. I then get access to my drawing tools and picture tools tabs at the top. And again, I can utilize either of these. So I'm going to jump into picture tools and in the adjust group, you'll see you have an option to compress pictures. And as I hover over, it says compress pictures in the document to reduce its size. So if I click this option, I get two compression options at the top. I can choose to compress just the picture that I'm clicked on, which is what I currently have selected. Now the second option in here is a really important one, delete cropped areas of picture. If you're trying to reduce the file size of your document, it's a good idea to have this option ticked. Because if you don't, essentially what happens is that when you crop a picture, like we did with this gorilla picture, if you remember, we went up to the crop tool, we filled and then we cropped. If you don't have this option selected, even though you can only see the cropped area, it means that the entire high definition picture is still floating around in the background of this document and adding to that file size. So always make sure that when you are cropping pictures that you select delete cropped areas of picture to keep that file size down. You then have some options with regards to the resolution of the pictures in your document. And of course, the higher the resolution, the more space that's going to take up, the bigger the file size. 
So sometimes it is a bit of a balancing act with regards to the quality of the original picture and trying to keep that file size as low as possible. Now, I always like to select this top option, which preserves the quality of the original picture. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to untick the apply only to this picture option because I want to compress all of the images in this particular document. I'm going to click on OK. So let's go and take a look at what our file size is now. I'm going to go back up to File, into Info, and look at that. We're down to 15.3 megabytes, so quite a difference there. We've managed to shave off about 25 meg of file size. If I want to compress it even more, if I go back, I may decide that I don't need a super, super high quality. So I can click on a picture again go up to Format and into Compress Pictures once more. I'm going to take the tick out of this top box and I'm going to utilize this Print option. So it says Excellent Quality on most printers and screens. So I'm going to say Print, which is a slightly lower resolution. Click on OK. I'm going to save my document. And let's take one more look. File, Info. And now we're down to 12 megs. So very quickly, we've managed to shave off a lot of that file size. And if you do that, you'll find that your document works more efficiently and you won't get that lag in as much. So just be aware of that, particularly if you have longer documents which contain lots of images, make sure that you choose to delete the cropped areas and also compress all of the pictures to a quality that's suitable for you. That's it for this module. I will see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. In this section we are looking at graphics and pictures in documents. And in the previous module I showed you how you can reduce your file size by compressing all of the pictures in your document. In this module I want to move on to talking about reusable content. Now in Word you have the ability to essentially save off images and text and reuse them elsewhere in your documents. And this is a really good way of being a little bit more efficient if there is a certain image or maybe a certain piece of text or quote that you use constantly throughout your documents. Sometimes it's a bit tedious to keep having to type it over and over again or insert the same image. Instead, what you can do is utilize quick parts in Word, which will essentially allows you to save off your content into a organizer and reuse it when you need it. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. So on the screen, I still have my travel newsletter open. And what I want to do is I want to take this picture of Claire and I want to reuse this in a different document. And maybe this is a picture that I have to reuse all the time. So when I'm sending out PR relating to the company, I like to show a list of all of my consultants with their picture. So maybe I find that I'm constantly inserting the same picture over and over again. And that isn't the most efficient way to work. So what we're going to do is we're going to save off Claire's picture to our building blocks organizer. So all we need to do is click on the picture. And we're going to go up to the Insert tab and all the way across to this text group. And you'll see one of the options that we have is Quick Parts. And if I hover over, it says Insert Preformatted Text, Auto Text, Document Properties and Fields anywhere in the document. To reuse content in your document, select it and save it to the Quick Part Gallery. And that is exactly what we're going to do. So we're going to click the drop down. And one of the options that we have right at the bottom is Save Selection to Quick Part Gallery. So let's click that and it allows us to create a new building block. So essentially I have to give this Quick Part a name. So I'm going to call this CS for Claire Stone. Now I could call this her entire name, but I'm keeping it fairly short because I want to show you an even quicker way of reinserting the content a bit later on in this module. So for now, I'm going to call it CS. I can choose which gallery I want to save it into, and we have a whole host of different galleries in here. So this is really just a way of categorizing the content that you're saving off. 
Now I'm just going to save this to quick parts. The category is going to be general, but again, you could go in and create your own category. So maybe I want one for images and click on okay. I can give this a description. Photo of consultant Claire Stone. I'm saving it into my building blocks template. And when I want to insert it, I'm going to choose to insert the content only. Now I have a couple of other options in here. I can choose to insert the content in its own paragraph or insert the content in its own page. So if I was to select this bottom option, for example, when I reinsert this image of Claire, it's going to give me a new page with just that image on. Now I don't want that. I just want to insert the content only. So it's only going to insert the image wherever I'm clicked and I'm going to click on OK. So now I have that image saved off into my quick parts gallery. So what do I do if I want to reuse this piece of content? Well, let's jump across to a different document. So in this document, I have a page that's called our consultants and I just have a table in this page. And in this table, I have a picture of two of our other consultants and I want to add Claire Stone into the top just here. So instead of having to go and recreate the shape with the filled image or maybe copy and paste the image from somewhere else, I can just insert it using my quick part. So I go up to insert across to quick parts and you can see it there at the top CS. And as I hover, it says photo of consultant Claire Stone. So all I need to do is select and you can see it's put that piece of content in here. Now you'll also see that it hasn't inserted it where my mouse pointer was clicked. And that's related to the layout options of this picture. So when I click on it, you'll see this little icon pop out to the side. And this is where I can choose my layout options. And currently I can see that this one is set to in front of text. So what that basically means is that when I save this image as a quick part in my previous document, this was the layout option I had set on that picture. And if I want to go back and double check that by clicking on the image and clicking the little icon, I can see that yes, I have in front of text saved on this picture. So it's bringing across that layout option as well as the picture. Now in front of text basically allows me to move this picture and drop it wherever I like on the page so I can put it on top of text on top of other images. So Word isn't really in control of where that image is placed. Hence why it's just put it basically down at the bottom of the page in this particular document. So all I need to do to get it to jump up to where I was clicked is just change that layout option to in line with text. And you'll see it will pop up to where my cursor was clicked. And if I want to reuse that in another document, I do exactly the same thing, just up to quick parts and I can select it from my list. Now, if you have a lot of quick parts, you might find that this list starts to get very long. So another way that you can insert it, so let me just delete out Claire again, is if we go to quick parts, I can go to the building blocks organizer. And this is where I'll find all of the different building blocks that I can add. And you can see that there are a lot of things in Word that by default are set up as building blocks. So things like templates are essentially building blocks. Headers and footers are building blocks. Page numbering is a building block. Now, if I'm looking for my particular building block, I know it's called CS. So what I might want to do here is order the names of my building blocks alphabetically to make it a bit easier to find. So I'm going to click on the name column heading and now I can scroll through looking for my CS building block, which is just there. I can see in the preview window what that looks like and I can insert it from here by clicking the insert button. And once again, because of those layout options, I need to change this to inline with text to get that to pop back up. Now, an even quicker way that I can do this is let's delete that out again. If I know what I've called my building block, so in this case CS, all I need to do to recall it is type in the name, so CS, and press the F3 key. 
And once again, you'll see it inserts it. And I'm going to pop that back up by changing the layout. Let's take a look at one more example of saving a piece of content. So in the previous example, we saved off an image, but you can also save off text. So at the bottom of this document, I have a line of text, and this is a quote from a magazine, highly experienced travel specialists that care about your trip as much as you do. And this is a quote I use often in any PR material that I send out about the company. So this might be something that I want to save off. So once again, I'm just going to select the piece of content that I want to save. I'm going to jump up to the insert tab and across to quick parts. And I could do the same thing, save selection to quick part gallery, and then choose which gallery I want to save it to. But if it's a piece of text, I could also save it to the auto text gallery automatically. And all that does, it's basically the same window, but it just selects the gallery auto text. So it's a little bit quicker. And I'm going to give this a name. We're going to call it uh, outsider quote. I'm going to create a new category. And I'm going to call this quotes and my description quote from outsider magazine. I'm going to save this into my building blocks and I'm going to choose insert content only and let's click on OK. So now if I jump across to my other document, and scroll up to the top. I'm going to put a little line in here and we're going to pull through our quote. So once again, I can go into my quick parts option and this time I can go to auto text and I'll see it listed there. So that's a quick way of inserting it. Also remember, I could type in outside a quote and press F3 in order to get that to insert. So this is what we call reusable content. And of course, if you want to manage any of your content, if you jump back down to your building blocks organizer, you can find your quick part. So let's find CS again. And I have an edit properties box so I can go in, I can change the name, I can change where I've got it saved, the description, all of those kinds of things. So pretty much everything I can modify. And if I decide that I no longer want it, I also have a delete button down here as well. So I'm going to delete out CS, click on close, and it doesn't actually affect the image in the document. It just deletes the quick part, so it's not available for future use. So the final thing I might want to do on this page to make it look a little bit nicer is just remove the borders of this table. So let's quickly do that. I'm going to select the table, jump up to the table tools design ribbon, and I'm going to go to borders and I'm going to say no borders. And there we go. We have a very nice looking document. That's it for this module. I will see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're down in section five where we're taking a look at how to jazz up our documents a little bit with graphics and pictures. And in this module, I'm going to introduce you to something that's reasonably new. When I say reasonably, it was released in Word 2013, and that is icons and 3D models. So let's start out with icons. So on the screen here, I am starting to design a brochure for a company called Bytech. And this company buys and sells laptops. And this first page is a very simple design. We just have a background image. We have some formatted text and then I've drawn three circles, which are just shapes and added text boxes inside them. What you also might notice is that I've changed the orientation of this page to landscape. And what I'm aiming to do here is I want to make this first page look a little bit more interesting by utilizing icons as opposed to the text that we currently have. Now you'll find your icons on the insert ribbon. In the illustrations group, you should see a little option there that says insert an icon. And the screen tip says insert an icon to visually communicate using symbols. And you'll see this a lot when you're looking at different websites, brochures, documents. These days, it's a lot more modern to utilize images, icons, vector graphics, as opposed to words. 
So let me show you how you can utilize icons to jazz up this first page of the brochure. Now I want to put an icon in each one of these three circles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this first circle and what I can see immediately is that I've grouped these circles together. So when I was moving these into position and aligning them, I grouped them. So the first thing I want to do is I want to ungroup these objects. So I'm going to right click, go to group and select ungroup. Everything is now an individual object. So I'm going to click on the first circle. I'm going to go up to insert and click on the icons button. And what this will do is it will open up Word's icon gallery and you'll see all of the icons that you have access to to insert into your document arranged by category. And the categories are listed in alphabetical order, so you can jump to any particular category that you want. Alternatively, you can use the scroll bar on the right hand side just to have a browse through all of the different categories. Now, there aren't thousands and thousands of icons in this gallery, but there are enough in there that you can usually find something that's appropriate for what you want to do. Alternatively, if you have an idea of what you want to insert, you do have a search bar at the top where you can search. So if I was searching for shopping, I can type in shop and it gives me all of the relevant icons. Click the cross to clear the search. Now this first icon I want to insert is going to represent the About Us section of this brochure. So when I'm thinking about About Us, I'm thinking about people, the people who work at this company. So I'm going to type in people into my search box and straight away it brings me back all of these options. Alternatively, I might want to type in something like us and again, I get a few different options. Now, I quite like this icon, pretty much represents the about us section. So I'm going to select the icon and then click on insert at the bottom. Now you'll see on my first page, I have the boundary. So this is where my icon actually is, but I can't see the icon because it's hidden underneath the background layer that I have. And you'll see we have that little layout options box once again. So here I want to change this from in line with text to in front of text. And that's going to pull that icon to the front. So I now have my icon. And the good thing about these icons is that you can edit them. So if you don't like the color, you can definitely change the color utilizing that graphics tool format ribbon. So what I might want to do here is change the color of this icon to white. So I'm going to jump up to graphics fill and select white from the palette. I also have outline options, so I could outline it in black or a different color. So maybe let's try a bright blue, something like that. And I can also resize it. So if I drag out and drag in again, it's a resizable graphic and it doesn't distort in any way. I'm going to drag it across and I'm going to place it in there. Now looking at it, I don't particularly like that blue outline. So I'm going to go up to outline and I'm going to say no outline. And to me, that looks a little bit better. So now I have my graphic. I don't really need my text. So I'm going to go in and delete out my text box and I'm going to make this graphic slightly bigger. And what I want to do now is align this graphic directly in the center of this circle. So for this, we can use our alignment tools. I'm going to select the icon, hold down my shift key and also select the shape. I'm going to jump up to my format ribbon and in the align group, I'm going to say align middle and also align center. And now I know that that graphic or that icon is dead in the center of that circle. Now let's do the same for the next one. This time I want an icon that represents shop. So up to insert and into icons and I'm going to type in shop. And I think I'm going to use this little icon just here, the shopping basket and insert. And once again, we just need to change that layout to bring that to the front. Now this time I'm going to have a slightly different color. Let's go up to graphics fill and I'm going to have a nice bright blue color or aqua as it's called. Now I need to resize this and really to keep things consistent, I want this to be the same size as the previous icon that I inserted. 
But it's a bit difficult to judge that when you're just dragging those resize handles. So one way that you can do this is if you click on the first icon and jump up to the graphic tools format ribbon, in the last group, it's going to show you the size of that current icon. So I can see it's 5.08 centimeters high and wide. So then what I can do is just click on the second icon and manually change it to match. So we want 5.08 and there we go. And I can now drag that down. I'm going to delete out this text box that says shop. I'm going to drag that over and I'm going to center it within the circle. So let's select the circle as well. Up to format, down to align, align middle and align center. Like so. And then finally, I want an icon to represent contact. So once again, insert icons and this time let's type in contact. Now I'm not too keen on those search results, so I'm going to try something else. So I'm going to type in phone and let's just use this little image of a phone. Insert. I'm going to pull it to the front by bringing it in front of text and I'm going to change the fill. And this time I'm going to go into more fill colors because I want this kind of pinky red color. I'm going to jump straight across to custom and let's go over here. I'm going to drag that down a little bit. And yes, that is the kind of color that I want. Click on OK. Close the layout options. And once again, I want to make sure that this is exactly the same size as the other two icons. So I'm going to jump straight up to height and width. And once again, change this to 5.08 and hit enter. Let's delete out our text box that says contact. Drag our icon over and once again, I'm going to select by holding down shift both the icon and the circle up to format into a line, a line center and a line middle. And there we go. So very quickly, we've been able to add these really nice looking modern icons, which look so much slicker and cleaner than having text all over the screen. So icons are a great way to add a visual element to your documents. Let's now take a look at something a little bit different, and that is 3D models. So I'm going to scroll down onto page two of this brochure, and this is where we have our product page. And on the left hand side, we just have a little text box that's showing us some information about the X-Pro 5.0 HD laptop. And it might be quite nice to have a picture of the laptop that you can move around and see all the different elements that make up that laptop. And 3D models are exactly what they say on the tin. They're pictures that you can insert into your documents, but they have an interactive element. You can click on the picture, you can spin it around and get a 360 view of the picture. So let's see how they work. We're going to jump up to insert. And in the illustrations group, we have a 3D models option. I'm going to click the drop down and I can choose to insert one from a file. So if I have some kind of 3D model saved off, I can do that. Alternatively, I'm going to select one from an online source. And this brings up your online 3D model gallery. And much like the icons, all of the models are categorized. So if you want to, you can have a little browse through. So if we click on animals, you can see all the different 3D models that we can insert. Alternatively, we do have a search bar at the top, which allows us to search for whatever it is that we're looking for. So I'm going to click the back arrow to come out of the animals category, and I'm looking for a picture of a laptop. So I'm going to type in laptop and hit enter. And here we go. I have a whole host of different laptop images. So I think I'm going to select this one and I'm going to insert it into my page. Now, these 3D models are quite intensive when it comes to their size. So sometimes there is a little bit of a delay from when you select the model to when it actually inserts into your document. Now, mine was pretty quick, which was good. And I'm going to make sure that I have my layout options set to in front of text, which I do. And I'm actually going to drag this down and place it on this second page. Now I'm going to resize this again, so I'm going to drag it out. 
like so. And when I say these models have an interactive element, I'm talking about this little round circle in the middle. If I click, I can literally drag the model around so I can see everything related to this particular picture. So if I'm trying to demonstrate a product and I want to show the different ports on the side, I can hold it at that angle. Or if I want people to see the front of it, I can do exactly that. Now these 3D models also have their own contextual ribbons. So if you click at the top on the format ribbon, you can see we have lots of different options related to this 3D model. So I can rotate it by using different views like so. And I can also change my 3D model so I can go back in and select a different one from online sources. I can reset the 3D model. So if I've done lots of changes to this, if I've resized it, rotated it, and I just want to reset it back to how it was when I inserted it, I can choose to reset the 3D model or reset 3D model and size. And then I have all of the regular options that you'll find when it comes to inserting pictures. So things like bringing it to the front, sending it to the back. So sending it behind the background, essentially, which I don't want to do. So I'm going to bring that to the front and I can choose how I want my text to wrap around this particular object and also the position. But currently I'm pretty happy with how that looks. And I really like the fact that it is interactive so people can come in and they can move around the product. So 3D models are another great way of adding visual elements into your documents. And if I jump up to view and choose multiple pages, I think you'll see that this document is really starting to stand out and look a lot more interesting than it was before we added in these images. That's it for this module. I will see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. This is still Deb and we are into section five where we've been looking at graphics and pictures in Word documents. In this module, I want to introduce you to the concept of captions. And this module really leads into the next module where we're going to construct a table of figures. Because in order to construct a table of figures, then every image in our document needs to have a caption. Now, what you'll see on the screen in front of you is I have a basic document here for a clothing company called Pink Moon. And throughout this document, I have some images or some figures, as we're going to call them in this module. So if I scroll down, you'll see that I have a little Excel chart. And if I scroll down a little bit further, I have essentially a table which is showing me the best selling products. And the reason that we add captions to pictures is to essentially label them. A caption is just a numbered label that you can apply to any objects, equations and tables within your document. And this makes your image easy to reference within your text as there is a label attached to the specific object. So in this module, I'm going to show you how you can caption your pictures in your Word document. So let's go back up to the top to our first image, and that is the image of the chart. Now, this is an Excel chart, but I'm going to click on it. I'm going to jump up to the References tab. And right in the middle, you see I have a group called Captions. And the first option we have there is Insert Caption. If I hover over, it says label your picture or object. Once you've added a caption, you can reference your object anywhere in your document by inserting a cross reference. And that's another really important point as to why you might want to add captions to your objects. If later on in this document, I reference this table, I can insert a cross reference that's going to jump me back to this specific table. And we're going to talk more about cross references later on in this course. But for now, let's insert our caption. So I have the captions dialog window come up. And the first thing it's asking me for is the caption for this particular object. And it's automatically put in there for me figure one. Now, if I want that label to say something different, I can go down to my options underneath and I can choose equation, figure or table. So it really depends what it is you're captioning. Now, this is a chart, but I don't have a chart option. But what I could do is I could create a new label. 
call it chart, and click on OK. So now it says chart 1. I could also change the way it numbers as well. So by default, this is going to go chart 1, chart 2, figure 1, figure 2, so on and so forth. But if I wanted something different, I could click on numbering and I could choose a different way of numbering from the drop down. So if I select ABC and click on OK, it's now going to say chart A. Now I actually don't like that. I'm going to switch that back to 1, 2, 3 and click on OK. I can then choose the position for this particular caption. So at the moment, I'm going to have it appearing below the selected item, so below my chart. But of course, the other option I have in there is above the selected item. I'm going to keep mine on below. And if I really wanted to, I could also exclude the label from the caption. So if I don't want it to say chart one, then I could check this little checkbox and it will just get rid of that label. So now I've got my options set, I can type in a caption. Like so, and click on OK. And what you'll see now, if I scroll down, I now have that caption appearing below my chart. So let's scroll down the page and let's add some more captions to the rest of these images. I'm going to select my image jump up to the References tab and insert caption. Now this isn't a chart, so I'm going to change my label to figure. I'm still going to have it below. And this caption is going to say flamenco dress and click on OK. And let's just finish these off. Hopefully you're getting the idea now. I'm going to keep this one on figure. And we're going to say biker jacket and OK and then finally insert caption slogan T and click on OK. So super simple to insert captions and essentially label all of the images in your document. And I would recommend that you do this as it does give your document a lot more of a professional feel like you've taken the time to really provide as much information as possible. So it's pretty much as simple as that. Now we're going to move on from this in the next module where I'm going to show you how you can use these captions to create yourself a table of figures. So please join me in the next module for that. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. This is Deb and we are down in section five, taking a look at how we can add pictures and images into our Word documents. And in the previous module, I walked you through how you can add captions or labels to the objects in your Word document. And following on from that, I'm now going to show you how you can use those captions and labels to create a table of figures. Now, if you're not sure what a table of figures is, it's basically what it says on the tin. It's a way of listing and organizing the figures, pictures, tables in your Word document by creating a table of figures that looks very much like a table of contents. So it basically lists out all of the figures that you have in the document and you have the option of adding a page number as a clickable link so that it makes it super easy for you to navigate and jump to specific images in your document. Now, the only prerequisite for inserting a table of figures is pretty much what we've already done. You need to make sure you go through your document and add captions to all of the objects that you want to pull up into that table of figures. So we've already done that. We have our captions for our chart just here, and then we have our captions for our pictures a bit further down. So I'm at the stage now where I can create a table of figures. Now, in general, you'll either put this table of figures at the beginning or right at the end of the document. In this example, I'm going to put mine at the beginning of the document. Now, I always like to put a table of figures, a table of contents, indexes on their own separate page. Keep them separate from the rest of the content. So I'm going to click my mouse at the top of the document and just put a page break in here. And a quick way of adding in a page break is Control Enter. That's going to push my content down onto page two and give me a blank page at the top. 
And also what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in a little title that says Table of Figures. And let's do a little bit of formatting. I'm going to change the font so it matches the document font. And I'm also going to make it a little bit bigger. And there we go. So let's enter in our table of figures. Up to the References tab, and in the Captions group, we have an Insert Table of Figures button. And the screen tip there says, add a list of captioned objects and their page numbers for quick reference. So, Insert Table of Figures. So the first thing you'll see on this Table of Figures tab is that on the left-hand side, I have a preview of what my Table of Figures is going to look like. And on the right-hand side, I have the same thing, but it's the web preview. And then, of course, I have some options underneath which are going to allow me to modify the look and feel of this table of figures. So currently, it's going to show my caption, then the dotted tab leader, and then the page number. So if I didn't want to show these page numbers, I can untick the Show Page Numbers box. And if I didn't want to right align the page numbers, I could untick that and it moves them so that they're flush against the captions. Now I do want my right aligned, so let's turn that back on. I then get to choose how I want my tab leader to look. So I've got dots selected, but I could choose to have no tab leader, a dashed line, or a solid line. And I'm going to stick with my dotted line. And then finally at the bottom, I have some general options which are going to allow me to customize the style of my table of figures. So if I click the drop down in the formats area, I have a few different choices in here. So you'll see as I select each of these, the print preview is going to change. So that is classic format. Distinctive is slightly different. We have centered, formal, and finally, simple. Now I'm going to choose classic format, but you can see there classic format doesn't have a tab leader. Now I do want a tab leader, so I'm going to select the dotted tab leader. And then finally at the bottom here, we have the caption label. So this is where you specify what you want your table of figures to include. And when I click the drop down, you'll see we have those different caption label categories. So we have chart, which is the one that I created, equation, figure, and table. Now in my document, I have an Excel chart with the caption label of chart, and then I have three pictures with the caption label of figure. Now unfortunately, I can't select them all in one go and put them in my table of figures. I have to select what I want to insert first, so that would be the chart, click on OK, and it's going to pull through that chart caption. So now I need to essentially go in and create another table of figures to pull through the rest of the images. So up to insert table of figures, I want to make sure I have my classic options selected and my tab leaders. And this time I want to select figure as my caption label. Click on OK and it pulls through those other figures. Now one thing you need to remember when it comes to a table of figures, and even with things like a table of contents, you're moving into the realm of working with fields. And fields are essentially placeholders that store and display data. So if I was to click on this first table of figures and right click, you'll see one of the options I get in here is toggle field codes. If I click that, it's going to show me the underlying code that's controlling this table of figures. So this is essentially how Word knows what to pull through into this table of figures. And when you become a more advanced user of Word, knowing how to manipulate these underlying field codes is really important because it allows you to essentially customize things like tables of contents, table of figures, to your heart's content, utilizing these things here called switches. Now, I'm not going to delve too deep into this at the moment, but I just wanted you to be aware of exactly what's going on under the surface when you insert a table of figures. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to right click and toggle the field code to put that back again. 
Now, once you've entered in your table of figures, if you decide that you want to change anything about the style or maybe the tab leader, then you can simply select the table of figures again, right click and jump into edit field. Now the table of figures is considered to be a table of contents field. So you can see that it's highlighted in this long list of field codes. So in order to edit it, we're going to click on table of contents and it jumps us back to our table of figures window. And I can come in here and I can make my changes. So I'm going to make sure that I still have my classic format selected. But this time I want to have a solid fill tab leader. I'm going to make sure that it's picking up my chart captions and I'm going to click on OK. And Word is going to immediately ask me if I want to replace the selected table of figures. I'm going to say yes. And there we go. So I now have my updated table with my solid tab leader. So pretty simple to insert a table of figures and also make changes to it and then update. The final thing I want to show you in this module is how you update a table of figures when you add a new figure with a caption into your document. Now, if we scroll down to the bottom of this document, you'll see that I've actually added a new image. But currently, this one doesn't have a caption. So let's have a look at the whole process from start to finish. I'm going to click on my picture, up to references and insert caption. I want the label to be figure and I want the position to be below selected item. And my caption is going to say Wonderlust hat and click on OK. So I've added my caption. I'm going to control home to jump up to my table of figures. And now all I need to do is select this bottom table right click and say update field and it's going to ask me if I want to update the page numbers only or update the entire table. The kind of scenario where I would only update the page numbers would be if I'd moved an item around. So for example if I had moved the flamenco dress picture onto a different page essentially I haven't added a new item but the page number has changed. So in that instance, I could just update the page numbers only. However, in this scenario, I've actually added an entire new image with a new caption. So I'm going to want to update the entire table. Now, what I always say to people is if in doubt, just update the whole thing. And it's also worth knowing that there is a useful keyboard shortcut for this, and that is the F9 key. Click on OK. And as you can see, it pulls through that figure. So that is it. That is how you create a table of figures in your Word document. I hope you enjoyed that. I will see you in the next module. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're down to exercise five now. And in this exercise, we're going to practice some of the skills that we've learnt in section five relating to pictures and graphics. And on the screen here, I have a finished document. So this is what we're aiming for. And I essentially want you to recreate the different elements of this document. So let's take a look at the finished document first of all. So I've opened the exercise five file from the exercises folder. And you can see here we're back on our seven facts about Henry VIII document. But I've made some changes to this document that I'd like you to recreate. So you can see here what I've done is, first of all, I've added a picture of Henry VIII to the top of this document. This picture has a caption and it also has square text wrapping. If we scroll down all the way through to page three, what you'll see is that I've now filled each of the circles with a picture of one of Henry VIII's wives. I've given these pictures a caption and I've also moved them into a two column by six row table. Now, when you're filling these shapes with these pictures, I want you to make sure you're utilizing that crop and fill utility so that the pictures aren't distorted in any way. Another little tip is that it's helpful to set the text wrapping for each of these pictures to inline with text as it makes it much easier to move them into the table. You'll also notice that I've given these pictures a caption as well. And everything in this table is aligned to the middle. 
And then finally, I have a table of figures, which just tells me which page each of my figures is located on. So now we've seen what the finished document looks like. Let's take a look at our starting point. So this is our starting point. You can see that we don't have any of these images added in. So we want our picture of Henry VIII to go at the top here with a caption. And remember what I said about the text wrapping. And then as we scroll down, you'll see that we just have these blue circles. I want you to fill each of these with the wives of Henry VIII. And all of these images are saved off into the exercise files folder. I want you to make sure they're not distorted by utilizing the crop and fill utility. I then want you to insert a two column by six row table, move all of these pictures into the table and make sure that everything has captions. And then finally, I want you to add a table of figures to the bottom of this document. As always, pause this video where needed because there is quite a lot of information to remember. But if you want to see my answer, then continue with this video. So let's take a look at how I transformed this document. So the first thing I asked you to do was to add a picture of Henry VIII into the top of this document. So I'm just going to place my cursor on a blank line, jump up to insert and into pictures. All of the pictures are saved off in the exercise files folder. So I'm going to select good old Henry VIII and click on insert. Now this is quite large, so I'm going to resize this picture down by holding down my shift key and just dragging that in. And what I'm also going to do is I want this text to wrap around it. So I'm going to change my text wrapping options to square. I'm then going to move my picture of Henry VIII into position like so. Now, another thing I wanted you to do was to caption all of the pictures in the document. So I'm going to click on my picture of Henry VIII up to references and click insert caption. My label is going to be figure and I'm just going to type in Henry the eighth. I want it to appear below the picture. Click on OK. And there we go. So now let's move down to the wives of Henry the eighth. And what I asked you to do was fill each of these circles with a picture of one of his wives. So I'm going to click on the first circle, right click and go down to format shape. I want to click on fill with a picture. And I'm going to select insert. I have all of my pictures saved off. So I'm going to select from a file and click on the first one and Berlin. Now she looks like she's sized pretty good, but just to make sure there's no distortion, remember we have the crop and fill option. And we can then move that into the correct position. Once we're happy with it, click on crop and we have a perfectly sized picture. Let's do the next one. Picture or texture fill, insert from a file. I'm going to select Anne of Cleves. And once again, I'm going to say fill and make sure that there's no distortion in that picture and click crop again. Let's do one more together and then I will do the rest off camera. So insert from a file, Catherine Howard this time. I can see she looks a little bit distorted there. So I want to go up to crop, down to fill and adjust where necessary and click on crop. Now I'm going to fill the other three pictures in exactly the same way and I'll see you back in a moment. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert a two column by six row table. So let's jump up to insert, down to table, two columns, six rows. Now what I want to do is essentially move each one of these pictures into one row of this table. Now the easiest way of moving these pictures is to ensure that you have the text wrapping set to in line with text. So I'm going to quickly apply that to all of these pictures. Like so. So now once we've done that, we can drag them into this table fairly easily. So let's click on the first picture, drag, drop, and you can see it kind of snaps into that table. Click, drag and drop, 
And we're going to do that for each of these pictures. Like so. Now what I want to do is make sure that everything in my table is centered. So I'm going to select my table up to my table tools layout ribbon. And in the alignment group, I'm going to click on align center. So the final couple of things I've asked you to do in here is add captions to all of the pictures. So we already have a caption for Henry VIII. So let's go through and do captions for his wives. Click on the first one up to references and insert caption. This is figure two because Henry VIII is figure one. And we can now type in our caption of Anne Boleyn. Let's do one more up to insert caption. And this one is Anne of Cleves. Click on OK. Up to caption. This one is Catherine Howard. Click on OK. Now I'm going to do exactly the same for the other three, but I'm going to do it off camera just to make this a little bit quicker. And there we go. So now that I've done this, you'll see that it's actually moved this table down to the next page. So I'm going to put in a page break just here, control enter, just to keep everything together. So now I have all of my figures in my document. The last thing I want to do here is add in a table of figures. So let's do a page break, control enter to get onto the next page. And I'm going to type in table of figures and let's format this. So on the home ribbon, I'm going to say heading one for my table of figures. So now all I need to do is insert my table of figures. So up to references into the captions group and insert table of figures. Now I don't mind how you insert it, but for this example, I'm going to choose the classic format. And I'm going to say that I want dotted tab leaders. Click on OK. And there we go. A lovely looking table of figures. So that is the kind of thing that I wanted you to end up with. And this whole exercise gives you a really good opportunity to practice all of those skills that we've learned in this section. I hope you got on OK with that. I will see you in the next section. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. This is Deb and we are all the way down in section six now. And in this section, we're going to explore the wonderful world of text boxes. Now, I've already been using text boxes throughout this course, but now is the time to focus in on them because there's so much more to text boxes than just adding text. Now, as we already know, there are a couple of ways that you can enter text into a document. You can click in your document and you can start typing. But when you add text in that way, you're very much restricted to where you can place that text. I type my text on a line. I have a left and right margin. But aside from that, if I decided that I wanted to pick up this paragraph of text and move it somewhere else, I am quite limited in where I can move it. I can copy and paste it elsewhere, but it's always going to be flush with that left hand margin. Text boxes give you a lot more flexibility when it comes to the placement of your text and also the types of text that you can put into your document. So in this first module, I just want to introduce you to the text box gallery and show you all of the options that you have when it comes to adding text boxes into your document. Now I have a very basic document in front of me here, and this is all about going vegan. I've got some regular text in here and I also have a picture. And what I want to do is I want to add a text box next to this picture that lists out the benefits of a plant based diet. So you'll find all of your text box options on the insert ribbon and all the way over in the text group, you'll see there you have a text box option. And if we hover over the screen tip says got must see content, put it in a text box. A text box brings focus to the content it contains, and it's great for showcasing important text such as headings or quotes. And if we click the drop down, this opens up the text box gallery. And you'll see that we have quite a few built in options available for us to add. So a lot of the time you might just reach for that simple text box, but there is so many more things in here. So if you're adding a quote, we have text boxes specific for quotes. 
we have things like sidebars and text boxes that contain different formatting. So throughout this section, we're going to dive in and out and utilize some of these, and then I will leave the rest of them for you to have a play around with. But just be aware that you do have a built-in gallery of options, and it's definitely worth taking a look in here as opposed to just grabbing that simple text box every single time. And right at the bottom, you have access to more text boxes from office.com. And you'll see as I hover over, I have four more options available from the office website. I also have the ability to draw my own text box. So this is a good way to get the exact size of a text box that you want. So what you'll notice is that if I just add the simple text box, it gives me a text box of a very specific size. So if I now have a lot of text I want to add in, I'm going to have to go in and adjust that. However, if I delete that out, what I could do is draw my own text box and I can really specify the size that I want. Now what you'll see is that when I draw that text box, I get my layout options button. And this is where I can choose how this object or this text box interacts with the text around it. So if I click this, you'll see currently I have it set to in front of text. And you can see here the different options that you have. So these blue lines represent how text is going to wrap around that text box. So if I was to select in line with text, it's going to push it all the way over to the margin. And then any new text that I add is just going to push that text box down. Or I can click underneath the text box and carry on typing. What I can't do is click next to the text box and start to add text because the layout option I have selected is in line with text, which means my text will be above and below the text box. Now I'm just going to undo all of that junk text that I've just put in. And let's take a look at some more of our layout options. So this option just here, this is square wrapping, which means I can move it over and if I just pull it up to this first paragraph, you'll see what happens to the text. It wraps around the text box in a square fashion. If I change this to tight, the text is still wrapped around the text box, but I have a tighter margin. So the gap between the text box and the text is smaller. I then have through, and that basically means these sentences are going to run through the text box. So you can see it says, according to a report compiled by global data called top trends, so on and so forth, the text basically runs through that text box. I then have top and bottom, which again is kind of similar to inline with text. But the difference here is that with top and bottom, I can still freely move my text box around. Whereas when I have it set to inline with text, I can't do that. I then have a behind text option. So that will allow the text to flow over the top of the text box. And then finally, we have the in front of text option. So again, this just allows me to place this text box on top of the text. So those layout options are really important because it controls how your text flows around your text box. Now I'm going to make this text box a little bit smaller. I'm just using my resize handle to drag that in and holding down my shift key to keep the aspect ratio like so. And I actually might just drag that out, make it a little bit wider and place my text box utilizing those guidelines. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some text into my text box. So I actually already have some text saved off to my clipboard. So I'm going to click inside my text box, press control V to paste those in. So now, because this text box is its own individual object, I can format it however I want to fit in with the rest of the format of the document. So all I need to do is select the text box, up to Drawing Tools and the Format ribbon, and I can utilize any of my formatting options on this ribbon. So for example, I can change the shape fill. So let's do a nice light green color. I can choose a shape outline, which I might choose to be dark green. And let's change the weight of that as well. We could do a nice thick border, something like that. And I also have my shape effects option in there as well. So if I want to add things like shadows, reflections, glows, I can do that. Now I'm actually going to remove this border. I think it's going to look better with no outline. 
like so. So now, very quickly, the health benefits of a plant-based diet stands out from the rest of my text because I put it in a text box and then gone ahead and formatted that text box. And putting it in a text box and choosing the correct layout option allows it to kind of float on the page, which means I can place it exactly where I need it to be. So let's take a look at another example of a text box. So you'll see partway down this page, I actually have a quote in my document. And I want to make this quote look a little bit nicer and stand out a little bit more from the surrounding text. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to cut this text out, Control X. I'm gonna press enter to give myself some space and I'm going to insert a quote text box from the text box gallery. Now I have a few options in here for quotes. I have an Austin quote there, a banded quote, and these are all a bit different in terms of their look and feel. But I'm gonna choose this one here, the filigree quote, which is quite a ornamental, fancy style of quote. So let's click it, and you can see that it's added this text box in. Now it hasn't added it in quite the correct position, so I'm just going to move that like so. Now in this case, I don't really want this moving around all over the page. I do want this flush with the margin. So what I'd probably do here is change my layout option to inline with text. And I'm gonna drag the text box out so it goes across the whole page, like so. Now I think I need to add a little bit more room in underneath and give it some breathing room. But I think you can agree, it's very, very pretty. So now what I can do is I can paste in my quote text, Control V. Now because I've just done a very simple paste, it's pasted it in with the formatting of the original document. Now I want this to match the formatting of this specific quote box. So I'm gonna choose my paste option and I'm gonna say merge formatting, like so. And I also have an option underneath where I can cite my source. So this quote has come from a website called Rush. So very quickly with a couple of clicks, I've really been able to make this quote stand out from the surrounding text. And each of these elements is editable. So if I wanted to change the color to make it fit in with my green color scheme, I can select the element up to picture tools and format. But what you'll notice here is that I don't have an option to fill. However, we can get around this. If I do want to change this to a greeny color, I can do that by going to the adjust group and just adjusting the color. And it's this recolor group that I want to use. I'm gonna use a dark green accent. And I'm gonna do the same for the rest of these. And once I've filled those two pictures, I can do the same for the text. I can highlight it, go to my home ribbon, and select green accent six, which is the same color, like so. I think you'll agree that looks really, really nice. So the main point of this module is really just to introduce you to that text box gallery and show you that there's so much more you can do with text boxes than just adding some simple text. In the next module, we're gonna explore this a bit further. We're gonna utilize some other text box styles and I'm gonna show you how you can do things like adjust the text box margins. That's it for this module. I will see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. This is Deb and we are down in section six where we've been taking a look at utilizing text boxes in our documents. And in the previous module, I showed you how to enter in a couple of different types of text box from the text box gallery, and also how you can format those text boxes. In this very short module, I just want to expand that idea a little bit and just show you a few more formatting options when it comes to aligning text within your text box and also setting margins. Now, I'm still working in my document about plant-based diets. And if you remember, this is the document where we added in our simple text box and also our quote text box. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna add in one more text box. And this text box is going to contain another quote, which I'm going to highlight in the document, like so. So let's jump up to the insert ribbon and go across to our text box group. I'm gonna click the drop down to pull up the text box gallery, and I'm going to select a different type of text box. So let's scroll through our list 
And I'm going to use this here, the retrospect quote. And you can see already from this preview that this is a quote box that is aligned to the right hand margin. So let's click it and there we go. Now again, if you click on that text box, you'll see you get your layout options button pop out to the side. And currently I can see that my text wrapping is set to square. Now I might be happy to keep that. It just means that when I move this text box, my text is going to wrap round it in a square fashion. Or if I actually wanted to move this text box over so that it's flush with the left hand margin, I could click in line with text like so. Now I'm actually quite happy having it as square and I'm going to grab it and I'm going to move it over here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut and paste into the text box the text that I want to use. So let's highlight the paragraph and control X to cut. I'm going to click within the text box and control V to paste. Now you can see that it's brought across with it that white background color. So what I'm going to do is go to my paste options and I'm going to select keep text only to remove that. And then I am free to move my text box wherever I want to place it. So I think I'm going to put it just there and I'm also going to make it a bit taller. So now I have my text in my text box and I've set the size that I want for this particular text box. You can see that the text is kind of bunched up towards the top. So this is where I might want to modify my alignment options or change my margins. And you'll find all of these options in the right click menu. So if we right click and go down to format shape, we get our format shape pane open up on the right hand side. Now the first thing you'll notice is that we have two tabs at the top, shape options and text options. So which one of these you choose really depends what it is you're trying to format at any given time. So if I stay clicked on shape options, any changes I make are going to affect the actual shape of the text box. Now I want to make alignment changes to the text. So I'm going to select text options and I'm not interested in changing the text fill or outline or the text effects, but I do want to jump into the text layout and properties. And this is where you'll find all of your alignment and margin options. So currently you can see that the vertical alignment for my text is set to the top of the text box. So what I might want to do is set it to the middle like so. I can also change the text direction. So I have this set to horizontal, which is exactly what I want. But if you wanted to, you could rotate your text 90 degrees or rotate all text 270 degrees. Now in this case, I just want horizontal. You also have a couple of little check boxes under here. And this first one, do not rotate text. If I was to select this, if I was to go in and rotate this text box, instead of the text moving with it, the text is going to stay where it is. So that is what that little option controls. I also have an option for resize shape to fit text. And you'll see if I click that, what happens to my text box is that it resizes so that it accommodates the text without too much space above or below. And then finally at the bottom, I have options to adjust my margins. So currently my left and right margins are both set to 0.25 centimeters, but I could increase that and you'll see my text move. So I'm going to set these to one centimeter on each side. I can also increase my top margin, which I'm going to set to 0.7 and the same on this side like so. And then my final option is wrap text in shape. Now this is selected already for me, but if I untick this, it's just not going to wrap that text around. So very quickly, I've been able to make some alignment changes and control the way the text is looking within that text box. One other thing I might want to do here, which isn't available in the format shape menu, is just center align all of the text. Now for this, I can just utilize my normal alignment tools on my home ribbon, which I would use to center text. So those are just a few additional options that you have when it comes to laying out how your text box and the text within it looks. That's it for this module. I will see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're down in section six where we're exploring the wonderful world of text boxes. And in the previous modules in this section, I've showed you how to insert different types of text boxes from the text box gallery 
format them, and also how to adjust the alignment and the margins. In this module, we're going to explore one other type of text box that we haven't looked at yet, and this is the sidebar. So if we jump straight up to the insert ribbon and open up our text box gallery, what you'll see is for the most part, these text boxes that we have are simple text boxes, quotes, or sidebars. And we have lots of different types of sidebar styles. And of course, all of these can be modified to match your existing color scheme. Now a sidebar differs very slightly from a quote text box. A quote text box is really there to highlight any quotes that you might have in your document, whereas a sidebar is something that you're more likely to add which contains supplementary information. So maybe some additional information that you want to add to the document that stands out from the body of the text. And as you can imagine, it's very simple to enter a sidebar text box and modify it. So let's jump in and let's choose this top sidebar just here, the Austin sidebar. And I can see that this is a right aligned sidebar with accent bars at the top and the bottom. So I'm going to select it to insert that in and you can see immediately what that's going to look like. And it runs all the way down from the top to the bottom of the page. So this is a great way to add supplementary information. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to replace this test sidebar text with some text that I've got from the Vegan Society website. I'm going to click to select and I'm going to do a control V to paste that in. I'm then going to add in a sidebar title. So I'm going to call this vegan stats and I'm going to do some formatting to this text. So I want this text to match the text that I have in the document. And I can see that currently in this sidebar, my font is Calibri and the size is 11. The rest of my document is a different font with a different size. So I'm going to highlight all of my sidebar text and I'm just going to change that so that it matches. I'm just going to do a little bit of tidying up and remove some of these sources that I don't actually need in my document. And right at the bottom, I'm just going to add source the vegan society. Now I'm going to make this in italics just to differentiate it from the rest of the text. Now I also know that some of these are bullet points, so I'm going to highlight and then just apply some bullets. Now one thing you can do with these text boxes is you can change the size of them. So if I click, you'll see that I get my resize handle. So if I wanted to give this a bit more room, I can drag it out. And I can also drag the bottom up if I wanted to. Now I'm quite happy having it running to the bottom of the page, but just be aware that you can resize as you would a normal text box. Now, if you do resize, you may notice that this shape at the top doesn't resize with it. So you may have to do some minor adjustments just here. So I'm just going to drag that out, but I can also change this shape to a different color so that it matches more in with the color scheme of this document. So I've been using a greeny colored color scheme. So I'm going to jump up to drawing tools format, and I'm going to change the shape fill to green accent six. I'm also going to change this title text color to green as well. And then the rest of this text, let's highlight it. And let's just make sure that that is black. And there we go. Very quickly, we've been able to add some additional information that really stands out from the document in a sidebar. And as with the other text boxes, if we want to make any changes to the alignment and the position of the text within the text box, we can right click, go down to format object, and then we have our text options and we can make our modifications. So for example, with this top margin, I'm going to take that down very slightly and also the bottom margin as well. And right at the bottom, I'm going to just drag this out on both sides and change the color of that to green. And there we go. So let's zoom out a little bit and take a look and see what that looks like. So I think you'll agree using these different styles of text boxes for quotes and sidebars can really help important information stand out from the rest of the text in your document. That's it for this module. I will see you in the next one.
Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. This is still Deb and we are down in section 6 where we're taking a look at text boxes. And in the previous few modules we've seen how to add in text boxes of different types including simple text boxes, quotes and sidebars. We've seen how to format them and we've also seen how to align the text within a text box and also adjust the margins. In this module, I want to talk to you about linking text boxes together. And the process of linking text boxes is a reasonably simple one. And all we're doing is creating multiple text boxes and setting the text to flow across all of the text boxes. So for example, you might have four or five different text boxes on your page and you want a paragraph of text to continue across all of the text boxes. So let me show you how to do it and also show you some of the issues that you may come across when utilizing this feature. So I'm still in my document about veganism and I'm going to work down on page number four. Now the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to work on a blank page. So what I'm going to do is put in a couple of page breaks. So I'm going to press control enter to push that section down onto the next page. And then I'm gonna click again and control enter to push it down another page. So essentially what I have now is a blank page in the middle. I'm then going to copy to the clipboard the text that I want to put in my text boxes. And that text is going to be these bullet pointed items under the heading a few tips. So I'm going to highlight and I'm gonna do a cut control X and that's going to place that on the clipboard ready for me to paste. So my aim here is really just to add text boxes to make these key tips stand out from the document. So I'm going to start to add in a few different text boxes. So let's jump up to the insert ribbon, go across to text box and for this I'm just going to use those simple text boxes. I'm going to take my first one and I'm going to place it where I want it to be and also make it the size that I want it to be. So this one I'm going to drag down a little bit and I'm going to delete out the test text that's in there. I'm going to add another text box and you'll see that we will be doing this a few different times. And I'm going to drag this one down and I'm going to pull that across pull it down. Let's add one more and put it on the other side. Now I'm not being too careful where I place these. You can be a lot more intricate than I am. And then I'm going to add one final text box, which I'm going to place right at the bottom here. Let's move that down very slightly. Drag it across and drag it down. And I'm going to delete out all of the test text from within these text boxes. So I've kind of planned out where I want my text boxes to go. Now I'm going to click in the first text box and I'm going to paste in that text that we copied to the clipboard, Control V. And what you'll see is because of the size of the text box, there's not enough room to accommodate all of the text. So it's kind of flowing outside of the text box and I can't see the rest of it. So what I'm aiming to do here is get this text to flow throughout the other text boxes. So all we need to do is select that first text box, jump up to the format ribbon, and in the text group, you have an option for create link. Let's click it and you'll see that your icon changes to a little mug. At least I think it's a mug that looks like it's pouring something out of it. So I'm just going to click on that second text box and you can see it now flows through. I'm going to do exactly the same with the second one. I'm going to select the text box, create link, and click on the third text box. And let's repeat this. Click on the text box, create link, click on the text box. Now this still doesn't look amazing. I might need to do some adjusting here. What I'm aiming for is each point to be in a separate text box. So this first one looks okay, but I'm just going to drag that up a little bit and then drag these ones up. And this is where you need to do a little bit of reorganizing. Click in the second text box and make sure that I've got all of that point, which ends just there. Click in the third text box 
I'm going to drag that down. Now I can see here, if I move this one out of the way, this one's got quite a lot of text in it. So I want to drag it all the way down to the end of that point. And then this final text box contains the final point. So I'm going to drag that down like so. So now essentially I have my text flowing through these text boxes with a different point in each text box. Now I'm going to do some formatting to tidy this up and make it look a bit nicer. I'm going to remove the bullet points like so just by clicking and then deselecting bullets. And I might even want to jump in here and change these margins. As you can see, I have quite a bit of space between the left hand edge of that text box and where the text starts. So remember, you can click, right click, go into format shape. And with your text options, you have the ability to adjust your margins. So let's take that left hand margin down to zero and the same with the right hand margin. And I'm going to select all of the text boxes that are remaining this time and do exactly the same. So right hand margin and left hand margin like so. Now another thing you might want to do here to really make these stand out is you might want to format them in different colors. So I'm going to select the first text box. I'm going to jump up to my drawing tools format ribbon and I'm going to utilize my shape fill and I'm going to make this a light green color. Now there's something you'll notice when I do this, whilst it's filled the shape, the text has this white background. And the first time this happened to me, it did drive me crazy for a little while trying to work out what's going on here. And you may come across this problem if you cut and paste information from an outside source. So this information originally was cut and paste from the Vegan Society website. And what it's done is it's brought across with it whatever formatting was applied when it was on that website. So what I'm going to need to do here is I'm going to need to clear the formatting in order to remove that white background. But of course, when I do that, it's also going to clear the rest of the formatting. So I'm going to need to do some adjusting. So what I'm going to do first so I can do these all in one go is hold down my shift key and select all of the text boxes once again. Now I'm going to go to my home ribbon and in the font group, we have a clear or formatting button. So let's click it and you can see what it's done there. So it's cleared the formatting. I've got rid of that white background, but it's also changed the rest of the formatting. So once again, I'm going to go in and I'm going to reapply the formatting that I had. So select all of the text boxes and let's apply the correct font and let's make it the correct size like so. Now you'll see that once I've removed that formatting, again, I might have to do some minor adjustments. I can now see that my text is very, very close to the left hand side. And that's because I adjusted it previously before I removed the formatting. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make these bold again. So these first little items, the key points were in bold, like so. Now I'm going to select all of the text boxes once again. I'm going to right click and go into my format object into my layout and options. And I'm actually going to increase that left margin. And I think about there is going to suit me. And then of course you can go in and readjust the size of the text boxes if you need to. So a little bit of fiddling around there, but I wanted to show you what can happen in a realistic situation. A lot of the times when we do things, it doesn't always work perfectly the first time and we need to do a little bit of adjusting. So I thought that might be quite interesting for you to see more of a real life example. Now, another thing you might find a bit odd is you might think that now you can come in and select that second text box, jump up to the drawing tools format ribbon and change the shape fill. But what happens is it's going to change that first text box. You need to change the color from your format shape pane. So I'm going to go into my shape options, into my fill, and I'm going to change the color from here to a light blue. I'm going to do the same for the next text box. We're going to have this one as a yellow. And then finally at the bottom, let's select it. And this one is going to be a light gray color. So there we have it. That is how you create multiple text boxes and get your text to flow through the text boxes. Now, if you want to do the reverse of that, if you decide you no longer want them to flow, you can break the link. 
So if I click on this second text box and jump up to my drawing tools format ribbon, you'll see now in the text group, I have an option to break link. And this says it's gonna break the link between this text box and the next one. All of the text will be placed in the selected text box. So essentially when I click this, it's gonna break the link between the take notes text box and the understand your own expectations. And it's gonna put all of this text into this first text box. So let's click on break link. And that is exactly what has happened. So then I could go in, delete this text box. And now I have everything back in this particular text box. You'll also see that it's removed it from the final text box. So it might be that I want these two points in that second text box. But then I want the rest of them to appear in this bottom one. So let's move that up and just make that a bit bigger. Click on the text box, create link, and click to select the bottom text box. And then make any resizing adjustments that you need. So pretty easy to do. I hope you found that helpful. I will see you in the next module. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We've made it all the way down to exercise six. And in this exercise, I just want you to practice some of the skills we've learned in this section in relation to text boxes. So I have up on the screen here, my finished document. And essentially what I want you to do in this module is recreate it so it looks something similar to this. So this document is about the history of yoga. And you can see throughout this document, I have some different styles of text boxes. So starting at the top here, I have a quote text box. I then have three plain text boxes in this document. And these three text boxes are all linked together so that when I paste in the information, it flows through these text boxes. And then finally, I've also added in a sidebar text box. Now I'm gonna start you off with just this basic document, but the information that's contained within these text boxes, you'll find that in a file called yoga.txt that's in the exercise files folder. And I've put all of the text in there so that you can easily copy and paste it across. So see how you go with that. And if you want to see my answer, carry on watching. So we're starting out with our plain document and we're gonna go in and add in those text boxes. So the first one I wanted you to add was a quote text box. So I'm going to place my cursor where I want this text box to go, jump up to insert and all the way across in the text group, I'm gonna click the text box drop down. Now, I didn't really mind which quote text box you used, but for reference, the one that I used was this one here, Austin quote. So now I have my text box and I want to add some text into this. Now, as I mentioned, there was a file called yoga.txt saved off to the exercise files folder. So let's pull that up. And you can see here right at the top, it has the yoga quote that I need to copy and paste. So I'm going to select it, control C to copy, click in the text box and control V to paste that in. Simple as that. The next thing I wanted you to do was add in three plain text boxes and link them all together. Now again, I didn't really mind where you place these on the document. So let's just jump up to insert across the text box. and I'm gonna select simple text box. I'm gonna move that into position and I'm just gonna drag that down a little bit like so and drag that across. And I'm going to delete out the text that's currently in there. Now I'm gonna add in two more text boxes. So let's just add one here. Drag that down a bit and again, drag that in. And as I said, it doesn't really matter where you place these or the size of them. And then let's add in one last text box. Drag it over to the side. And let's just put it like that. And once again, I'm gonna delete out all of the text that's in these text boxes. So to link these together, you need to click on the first text box, go up to the shape format ribbon, and you'll see in the text group, there's a create link option. So let's select create link 
and you'll see as soon as you do that your cursor changes to a little cup. So I'm going to scroll down and click in the second text box to link those two. I then need to do exactly the same to link this text box with the third one. So let's select the text box, create link, scroll down and create that link. You'll see as soon as I do that in my text group, I now have a break link option if I want to unlink those text boxes. So now I've done that, it's time to copy and paste the text in and see if it flows through. Once again, I have this text in the text file. And it's this text at the bottom that's, that says paste into linked text boxes. Select it, control C to copy, go to that first text box and control V to paste and you'll see that that text flows through all three of those text boxes. Now, the final thing I asked you to do was add in a sidebar. So I'm going to put this on the second page. I'm going to go up to insert across the text box. And again, I didn't mind which one of these sidebars you choose, but I'm going to choose this one. I'm going to give this a title of yoga facts. And then once again, the text for this sidebar is located in that text file. So I'm going to select it, control C to copy, control V to paste that in. And that is pretty much what I was looking for. As I said, I'm not too concerned about the placement of these text boxes and if it looks exactly the same as mine. The point really was to practice inserting the three different styles of text box and also linking text boxes. I hope you got on okay with that. I will see you in the next section. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. This is Deb and we are now down into section 7. And in this section I'm going to be talking about page layout and how to divide up your document. Now page layout is really just a term used to describe how each page of your document is going to look when it's printed. And in Word you can adjust all of your page layout options, so that might include things such as the margins, the paper size, the orientation, how many columns of text you have, how headers and footers appear, and a host of other things. A master in these is going to be really beneficial to you when it comes to putting together a really nice looking, attractive, well laid out document. And we're going to go through a lot of the options that you have in relation to page layout in this section. But in this first module, I really just want to start out by introducing you to the page layout ribbon, because layout is where you're going to find all of these options. So it's important that you understand what each group of commands means. Now, before we jump across to that ribbon, let's just become familiar with the document that we're going to be using over the course of this section. And this is a book template. So we're going to pretend that I'm writing a book. Let's jump up into view and go into multiple pages so we can see what we have. So at the start here, I have a dedication. I have a blank page ready to insert a table of contents. And then I have the contents of my book. So we start with a four word and then we go into acknowledgements and introduction. And then we start our different sections. So part one, we then have our different chapters, which may or may not contain various different subheadings until we get all the way down to chapter nine, where the book ends, and then we have an appendix on the end. Now, obviously I'm using test text in this, but this is pretty much the type of layout you would have if you were putting together a book. Now this layout is by no means finished. We have lots of things that we need to sort out and fix in this document to make it flow a little bit better. But I just wanted to give you an overview of what we're dealing with here. So let's zoom back out to 100% and let's jump across to the layout ribbon and take a look at some of the commands that are going to help us with this. So we're going to click on layout and it's mainly these first two groups that we're interested in. So the first group here is the page setup group and this essentially controls how your text flows in your document. So the first option that we have is our margins option. So our margins are those bars of blank space that run down the left and the right hand side of the page. And by default, mine is set to normal and you can see the actual measurements of those normal margins. But if I thought that that was a bit too wide, I could jump into narrow 
and you'll see how that changes the look and feel of my document. I have moderate, which is slightly different again, wide margins, which makes my text very small running down the center of the screen, and then I have mirrored margins. Now you would use mirrored margins to set up facing pages for double-sided documents such as books or magazines. So the margins on the left page are a mirror image of those on the right page, which would mean the inside margins are the same width as the outside margins. And then finally, you have a custom margin options in here. So if you don't find anything in those inbuilt margin settings that suits you, then you can come into here and you can set the measurements for each of your margins. That's top, bottom, inside and outside. You also have the ability to set the gutter margin as well. So the gutter margin is a term in Word used to designate an additional margin added to a page layout to compensate for the part of the paper that's made unusable by the binding process. So if you imagine in facing pages in a layout, so if you imagine a book, the gutter margin is on the very inside of both pages because that's where the book is bound. Now, if you're not intending to put your document into a book, then you don't necessarily have to have a gutter measurement, but just be aware of what it is and how that can be useful to you. Moving along, we then have orientation. So I'm working in portrait mode for this book, but if you wanted to, you could switch to landscape mode. But one thing to bear in mind is that if you don't have any section breaks or page breaks in your document, then every single page in your document is going to be flipped around into landscape mode. Now I'm going to show you a bit later on in this section how you divide up your document so that you can have some pages landscape and some pages portrait. But for now, I'm going to switch that back to portrait mode. Moving along, we then have sizing options. So this is related to the size of the paper if you intend to print this document. Now in the US, letter size is fairly standard, whereas in the UK, we would choose something which is kind of similar in sizing, but we call it A4. And we have lots of other different types of paper. So if you work in the legal industry, you use a very specific size of paper, you have a legal option there. And if you can't find the paper size that you use in your particular industry or country, we do have more paper sizes at the bottom where you can go in and define the width and height of the paper that you're using. So this is extremely important if you intend to print your document. The last thing you want is to create your document in Word on one paper size, and then when you go to print it on your actual paper size, bits of text will be cut off or the layout will look a little bit strange. So always make sure you go in there and check you have the correct paper size selected. We then have an option for columns. Now by default, you're going to be typing in a one column layout. However, if you want to, you can switch to multiple columns, which gives you more of a newspaper style layout. Let me show you a very quick example. Let me scroll down to a page that has more text on it. I'm going to click my mouse, go up to columns, and let's say two columns. You can see now that the text flows around like a newspaper style. And I also have an option in there for three column layouts. Now, I probably wouldn't want to add in any more columns in this particular layout because then the text is just going to get a bit hard to read. You also have a couple of other options in here. You have a left column layout. So that is going to give me a smaller left column and a larger right column or the opposite of that, a right column layout. And of course, if you want to customize this, if you jump down to more columns, you have all of your preset options at the top or you can define how many columns you want. And you can get really granular about this. So I've got, let's select two columns, and you can see below I have some width and spacing options. So I could jump in here and specifically define the measurements for each of my columns, how wide I want them to be, and also how wide the spacing is in between the columns. Now if I select the two column layout from the presets, you can see the width of each column is going to be 7.62 centimeters with a 1.27 centimeter gap running down the middle. I could also choose to separate my columns with a line. And then underneath, you'll see that I have this equal column width option selected. So when I select this option, it means that both of my columns are gonna be of an equal width. Now, if I wanted one to be wider than the other, I could untick this column and you can see now 
column number two has become active just above and I can jump in here and define exactly how large I want that second column. But for now, I'm happy with equal column width. And finally, I get to choose if I want to apply these columns to the whole document or just from this point forward. So if I was to select this point forward, it means from wherever my mouse is currently clicked. Now at this stage, I'm going to say whole document, click on OK, and that is pretty much the result of the options that I've selected. Now I don't want this page in two columns, so I'm going to go back to my columns drop down. I'm just going to say one. Moving along, we have an option for breaks, and this is where we come to insert our page and our section breaks. And we're going to be doing a lot of work on this over the next few modules. So I'm going to hold off from talking about this too much at this moment. We then have a line numbers option. So if I select continuous, you can see I get my line numbers and we actually utilize this earlier on in the course. I also have some other options here. So if I want to restart those line numbers on each page, I can also do that. I can restart them after each section or I can suppress them for the current paragraph. And again, as always, we have more line numbering options just here. So it's going to jump you to the layout tab and right at the bottom, we have an option for line numbers and you can come in here and define where those numbers start from. So maybe you don't want them to start at one. You can definitely come in here and change that. And you can also specify how much you want it to count by. So if I didn't want it to go one, two, three, four, five, maybe I wanted it to go up in two. So it goes two, four, six, so on and so forth. I can do that in here as well. So a few options when it comes to line numbers. Now I'm actually going to say none because I don't need them. And then we have our hyphenation options. And if we hover over, it says when a word runs out of room, word normally moves it down to the next line. When you turn on hyphenation, word hyphenates it instead. So just like you see in books or magazines, hyphenating helps create more uniform spacing and save space in your document. So you have your hyphenation options in here. I don't have mine turned on, but you could set it to automatic or manual. And then of course you have some more hyphenation options at the bottom there. So I could say automatically hyphenate my document, click on OK. And if you just look in the document at an example here, I have a couple of words actually on this line. It's hyphenated the word passages because it's split over two lines. And the same thing with the word versions. Now, I actually don't like that because these aren't true hyphenated words. So I'm probably going to want to set this to none. So it just pushes the word onto the next line as opposed to hyphenates it. And then the final group that we have here are our paragraph options. And these are also very important to understand. So let's go up to our first page where we have our dedication. I'm going to click my mouse in front of the first line of text. Now, if I wanted to indent this text, I can choose to indent it like so. And you'll see as I do that, it moves it in from that left margin. I can also indent right, which as you would expect, goes the other way. And then this is where I can adjust how much space I have before and after lines of text. Now, sometimes when you're working in a document, you might find that some lines of text look closer to the title than maybe other lines of text on different pages. And that is normally due to the before and after spacing that you have set. So because I'm clicked on this line of text, I can see that it has eight point spacing after and no spacing before. So if I was to up the before spacing, Look what happens. It gets further away from that title because I've got more space before the line where I'm clicked. Similarly, if I was to click at the end of dedication, it's shown me that I have eight points after. So there is a little bit of a wider gap between the title and the text. But if I up that, you can see again, it pushes that paragraph down and I can pull it all the way up to zero points. So it's directly underneath. Or if I go down one more, I'm going to set it to auto which will just invoke words auto setting for the spacing in this document. Also remember that with both the page setup group and the paragraph group, we have additional options lurking underneath these little arrows in the corner. So this one here is going to jump me into my paragraph settings where I get a few additional options to the ones that I have on the ribbon. So I have an indents and spacings tab and you can see that currently I have this piece of text centered. I don't have any indentation on the right and the left. 
I can also modify my spacing options. I also have a line and page breaks tab at the top. And again, we're going to be going more into these options as we go through the course. And with page setup, let's just finish off by diving into there. We have three tabs, margin, paper and layout. This is where we can manually set all of our margins. We can also change our orientation from here. And also if we want to set up, if we want mirror margins, two pages per sheet or a book fold. And you'll see as I change these underneath, it gives me a little preview. Our paper options we've seen, this is where you adjust your paper size. And then finally, we have our layout options where we can control things like our headers and footers and our page alignment. Now, as I said, we're going to be dipping in and out of all of these options as we move through this section. But hopefully that gives you a good idea of the layout ribbon and these really two important groups of commands, page setup and paragraph. That's it for this module. In the next module, we're going to start to talk about page and section breaks. So please join me for that. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're down in section seven where we're taking a look at how we can divide up our document using our page layout tools. And in this module, I want to talk to you about a really important subject and that is breaks. And breaks is one of those subjects that I find people can get easily confused about. Now, breaks are particularly useful if you've ever struggled to get the formatting of a long document looking like you want it to look in each section. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, what do you mean? What's a section? How do I create a section? Well, in this module, I just want to give you an overview and an introduction to breaks before we move into how we can apply the different styles of breaks to our document. So what I have open on the screen here is a document just called Intro to Breaks. And I've gone in and I've added some different types of breaks into this document so you can see how they work. Now, I'm pretty much going to be working predominantly on the layout ribbon. And all of the different types of breaks that you can select, you'll find listed under this breaks option in the page setup group. And as you can see, we have quite a few different types of break divided down into two sections, page breaks and section breaks. So let's talk about section breaks first of all. Now, when you're working or when you create a document, if you just open up a blank document and start typing, you're essentially working in section one, page one. And if you're wondering what section and what page you're currently typing in, you can see that information in the bottom left hand corner in the status bar. So currently I'm clicked in the first paragraph and you can see it's telling me that I'm working in section one, page one of eight. Now, if you don't see this down here in your status bar, if you right click your mouse somewhere in a blank space on the status bar, that's going to pop up the customize status bar menu. And this is where you can control the kind of information that you see in that status bar. So you want to make sure that you have section and page number selected. And then you'll be able to see that additional information in the bottom left hand corner. And this becomes more and more useful as you add more and more breaks into your document. It really helps you visualize in your mind exactly where you're at. Now, if I move a bit further down the document, I want you to keep your eye on the status bar in the bottom left hand corner. Look what happens if I click a bit further down that first page. You can see that it's changed to section three. So I'm now working in section three on page one. If I click my mouse a bit further up, it's telling you that I'm working in section two on page one. So essentially what I have on this first page is three different sections. Now, something else I would recommend you do when you are working with sections and breaks is go to the home ribbon and turn on your show hide markers, because this is going to show you on the screen exactly where your section breaks and your page breaks are. So this makes it a little bit clearer as to how this first page is divided up. You can see above this section break, I have my first section. So essentially this first paragraph is in my first section. I've then added a section break and I have section two, which is this little section just here. I've then added another section break on the end. And this final couple of paragraphs is section three. And then I have another section break, which is jumping me to the next page. 
Now you might think, okay, I understand that, but why is it necessary for me to add section breaks into my document? Well, it's necessary if you want to have a different format, a different orientation, different headers and footers in certain parts of your document. So if you look here at section number two, you'll see that I have a three column column layout applied just to this section of the document. If I hadn't put a section break above and a section break just after, when I selected the text and changed it to three columns, the entire document would have changed to three columns. So because I wanted to be very specific about which paragraph I was applying the columns to, I needed to section it off first. So now anything I do in this section is only going to affect that particular section. So if I click in my section two where I have my columns, jump up to the layout ribbon and go to my columns option, I can now change that to two columns and it's only affecting that particular section. Let me show you another example. Let's scroll down. Now you can see at the end here, I have another section break and then the next page is a completely different orientation. So this page is portrait and this page is landscape. And once again, if I had a document that had no section breaks in it and I clicked on this page and I went up to orientation and changed it to landscape, the entire document would change to landscape as opposed to just this specific page. So I need to again section off the pages that I want to change the orientation of and then apply the orientation to those sections. Now in this case, I only wanted one page to be landscape. So I have a section break before, and then I have a section break after, and then on the next page, we are back to portrait. And then another final example of why it's good to use section breaks is when it comes to things like headers and footers. So if you look at my document, in the footer, I have some page numbers. So we have the first page number one, second page number two. I then have a title and then this page is back to number one. So on this page, which is page three, I actually wanted those page numbers to start again from number one and not continue through. So in order to achieve that, I had to put in a section break and then unlink this page number from the previous page number. And once again, we'll get into this a little bit more when we get to that specific module. But hopefully this is showing you some of the reasons why you might want to section up your document. And when we look in our breaks drop down, you'll see that we have four different types of section break that we can add. Section break next page, which will allow you to insert a section break and start the new section directly on the next page. We have a continuous section break, and you see that I've used that one just here and also just here. So continuous will put in a section break, but it won't push everything below it onto a new page. It will keep it on the same page. Whereas a section break next page, everything after it is going to be pushed onto the following page. We then have a section break even page. So it's gonna put a section break in after every even page and the same for odd page as well. And then of course, we also have page breaks. And this is where essentially you can mark the point at which one page ends and the next page begins. So if I show you very quickly, let's scroll down to, let's say here. If I decided that after this second paragraph, I wanted to push everything below it onto a new page, I could add in a page break. So I can jump up to breaks and say page break. And you can see there, it's put in my page break marker and everything else is now on the next page. If I control Z just to undo that, another quick way of adding a page break is to press control enter on your keyboard. And then we have a couple of other different types of page breaks. We have a column break, and this is for use if you do have your document divided up into columns, it's gonna tell where to move the text following the column break in the next column. And then we have an option for text wrapping, and this is mainly related to web pages. So these are all of the options that we're going to be exploring in more detail over the next few modules. But hopefully that gives you an overview as to what breaks are all about and why they can be useful to you. That's it for this module. I will see you in the next one.
Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're down in section 7 where we're talking all about breaks in Word documents. And breaks really help us when it comes to laying out our document exactly how we want it to be. And in the last module I gave you a brief introduction as to the difference between page and section breaks and also how you might use them and why they might be useful to you. So what we're going to do now is we're going to work on our book template and I'm going to go through and do some tidying up. Now, as I mentioned before, if we go into view and multiple pages, there are lots of things I need to do here with regards to the layout. Now, I have added in some page and section breaks already, but we're going to go through and tidy up the rest and also add in some other things that you may not be familiar with to really jazz this document up. So let's zoom back out to 100% and start at the top of our document. Now I'm going to pull up the layout ribbon because again we are predominantly going to be working with this particular ribbon. Now the first page here I have my dedication. Now I wouldn't really start my book with this on the first page. I'm probably going to want to have some kind of cover page which shows the title of the book and possibly my name as the author. Now I could create this page manually, but one thing you may or may not be aware of is that in Word we have some inbuilt cover pages that we can insert. So let's jump across to the insert ribbon and in the first group here, the pages group, you can see that we have some cover page options. And when I click, I can see the cover page gallery. And this has lots of different cover pages that I might want to add in. And of course, I can then further customize them to suit the color, the font, the size font that I want. So I'm going to add in a cover page in a moment. But before I do that, I want to start adding in some section and page breaks. Now, the first thing I'm going to do to help me with this is turn on my show hide markers. And I can see that I already have a page break just here, which is essentially pushing the table of contents onto its own page. Now, because I'm going to put a cover page in before this dedication, I want to make sure that I've clicked my mouse at the start of the title. I'm then going to go to insert down to cover page and I'm going to select this one here, the filigree. And there we go. Now, the good thing with cover pages is that they automatically put in a page break for you so that you just have the cover page on that first page. And because I've used this one before, it's kept in the title that I used last time, which is perfect because that is what this book is going to be about. However, you can, of course, jump in here and change this title to whatever you want it to be. And one thing I am going to do is I'm just going to change this text to a black font like so. So very simply, I now have my cover page. I then have my dedication on the second page, which is fine. And then my third page, I have a space for my table of contents. Now you always create your table of contents at the end once you've styled up your document. So I'm going to come back to this a bit later, add in my table of contents, but I always want my table of contents to be on its own page. Hence why I have a page break after the dedication and then a page break after the table of contents. Let's carry on scrolling down. This is where my book really starts. So I have my foreword in here. Now something else that you can see, which is quite common when it comes to books, is that I have what we call a drop cap. And that is the first letter of the first word is a lot larger than everything else. And you've probably seen this in various different books that you've read over the years. If you're looking for this option, you'll find it on the insert ribbon all the way over in the text group. You have drop cap. So you can choose to have no drop cap, dropped, or you can drop it in the margin. So that's just a little FYI. Let's scroll down. Now I can see here that I have the acknowledgements on this same page as the end of the forward. And what I want to do is put this on the next page. So the thing I probably want to do here would be to add in a page break. Now, a few different ways that I can do this, as I'm already on the insert ribbon in the pages group, I have a page break option just here. And you can see in the screen tip, it shows you what that keyboard shortcut is, control plus return. I'm going to click it. It's going to put in my page break and push everything down onto that next page. I then want the acknowledgements on one page, the introduction. I also want to add in another page break. So this time I'm going to utilize that shortcut key, control, return to push it down. Let's carry on scrolling through. 
Right, so now I have a kind of a title page. So this is my part one title page. And I want this to be on its own blank page. So once again, I'm going to click underneath this last paragraph and let's do it a different way this time. I'm gonna go up to that layout ribbon into breaks and I'm gonna say page break, like so. And there we go. Now, one other thing to note, as we did mention this before, if I click in front of where it says part one, if you look up in your layout ribbon at the spacings option, you can see that I have 186 points spacing before. So that is essentially why we have all of this white space above where it says part one. And that suits me because I wanted this to be somewhere in the middle of this page. But I just wanted to point that out as it was something that we discussed previously. So now we have chapter one. Let's go all the way down to the bottom of this chapter. And there we go. Now, even though I don't have a page break in here, chapter two is naturally on the next page. But what I want to do is make sure that I do have a page break in there. I'm going to delete out those carriage returns. So I like to always make sure that I do have a page break after each chapter. Let's scroll down again. This one I need to add one in, so we'll do control enter. And again, you can just delete out any erroneous spacing at the top. I'm going to do this for all of these different parts and chapters. So again, this part two needs to be on a new page. Control enter. And chapter four needs to be on a new page. So let's click in front of it, control enter to push that down. So I'm gonna go through this document, just adding in page breaks wherever necessary. So let me do that and I'll see you back here in a couple of moments. So there we go, I've now added in all of those page breaks. Now I'm right at the bottom of the document and I just wanted to show you another problem which you may find yourself with. And that is, if you ever find that you have just some blank pages at the end of your document, it's usually because you have some page breaks in there that you need to delete. So you can see here, I have a page break. And just to show you how simple it is to delete one, you highlight it, press the delete key on your keyboard, and it gets rid of that page break. I have another one up here, so let's highlight and delete. And another one just here, because this is in fact the last page, highlight and delete. And you can see now, this is the last page. Control Home to jump to the top of the document. So let's now take a look at how we might add in some section breaks. If I was compiling this book for real, I'm probably not going to do things like add in columns or change the pages to landscape because my book is all in portrait layout. But I'm gonna show you how to do it if you did want to do that. So I'm down on page four where I have my foreword. And underneath the foreword, I have some kind of quote listed just here. And then I have the start of my foreword. Now it might be that I want to put this into columns. So I don't want the whole page to show in columns. I just want this section of text just here. So the way that I need to do this is I need to section off these paragraphs from the rest of the document. So I'm gonna do that utilizing section breaks. So I'm gonna click just above this paragraph, I'm gonna go up to the layout ribbon, into breaks, and when it comes to selecting which section break I need, for this one, it's going to be a continuous section break because I want the section to continue on the same page. I don't want it to move onto the next page, but I do want a section break in there. So you can see I've inserted it and it's a continuous section break. I now need to go to the bottom of these paragraphs, click, go up to breaks, and I'm gonna insert another continuous section break. So now I've sectioned off this portion of text. That means that I can click anywhere within this section, make some formatting changes, and it's only going to apply to this specific section. So in this case, I'm gonna jump up to columns, and I'm gonna put this in a two column layout. Now you can see there, it's put a line down the middle separating these columns, and that's because I had that setting turned on previously. So what I could do is jump up to columns, go down to more columns and remove the line between. And you can see at the bottom here, it's only applying these columns to this particular section. And click on OK. 
So now that I have this section in columns, if I scroll down, you'll see that as soon as that section ends, everything goes back to that one column layout. And we wouldn't have been able to achieve that if we didn't utilize section breaks. So now we're down to the acknowledgements page. And it might be that I want this page to be landscape, but the rest of the document in portrait. So if I was just to click on the acknowledgements page, go up to layout and change the orientation to landscape, you'll see it changes all of the pages to landscape. Now I don't actually want that. So again, I need to utilize section breaks to section off this portion of the document. So I'm gonna click just before acknowledgements, go up to breaks, and again, we're doing a continuous break. I'm gonna go down to the bottom, click at the end, and again, insert a continuous section break. So now I can click in this section, go to orientation, change it to landscape, and everything else remains in portrait. Another way I could utilize section breaks is if I wanted to change the margins on one specific page. So let's move down. I'm gonna delete out this page break because I no longer need that there. And maybe I want the margins to be narrower on this introduction page. So once again, I'm gonna click in front of introduction. I'm gonna to go to breaks and continuous, scroll down, click at the end, add another continuous section break to section off this portion of text. I need to click in the section and now I can go to margins and I can change these margins to narrow. And once again, you can see it's changed them for introduction. But as we move down to the next pages, we have those normal margins back. Now we've been working mainly with the section break continuous option. And I do find that is the one that I use most often because a lot of the time I want to keep the text on the same page, but just add in some section breaks. But remember, you do also have a section break next page option. So let's take a look at that. I'm gonna click at the end of this first paragraph. And if I was to select breaks, section break, next page, it's gonna add in a section break as opposed to a page break, but it's gonna push everything down to the next page. Let me just undo that, Control Z. And you have similar options when it comes to breaks for even and odd pages. So again, the even page is going to insert a section break and start the new section on the next even numbered page. So currently I'm on page 11. If I insert an even page section break, it's gonna push that down and start on page 12. And you have a similar option here for odd page. So the key points to take away from this module is always remember when you're working with breaks, it's useful to have your show hide markers turned on so you can see them. Make sure that you understand the difference between a page break and a section break, and also what situations where you might use each one of these section breaks. In the next few modules, we're gonna be delving more into page breaks and column breaks, so I will see you over there. Hello everyone, and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're down in section seven, where we're taking a look at the different ways we can divide up our document using sections and page breaks. And in this module, I want to start talking to you a little bit about using headers and footers with section breaks. So let's dive straight into a very simple example. Now the document I have in front of me is just a test document with some test text in it. It's six pages long, and what I want to do in here is I want to add a header. Now, currently, this document doesn't have any section breaks or any page breaks. It's just a plain document that I've put text into. Now, if you're not familiar with headers and footers, a header is this white area of space just above the title that you'll see at the top of every page. And the footer is the blank area of space at the bottom of the document. And these two areas are editable. So you can add information into the header and the footer and it will appear on every page. So for example, a lot of people utilize the header area to add maybe something like a company logo, or maybe to display the document title, or maybe something like the date and time or the author name. And it's very simple to add a header and footer. All you need to do is double click in the header area and it opens up the header section. And immediately what you'll see is that you get a header and footer tools contextual ribbon appear at the top. 
and you can utilize the options in the insert group on this ribbon to insert various different things into this header. For example, I can insert the date and time, like so. I can insert document information, so the author name, the file name, the file path, the document title. I can insert properties, which we're gonna go more into a bit later on in the course, and also fields. I also have access to insert any quick parts. So you can see there, I have a logo saved off as a quick part. I could select it to add that into my header. Now, if this logo is all I wanted in the header, I can close my header and footer ribbon. And this is what it looks like. So I might want to put a little bit of space in there, but you'll now see I have the logo up in the header and it appears on every single page. If I want to edit the header, I can double click to open it up and I get my ribbon back again. So I'm gonna jump in and just remove this logo. And a quick way of doing that is to go over to the header and footer group. I'm gonna select the header drop down, and right at the bottom, I have an option to remove the header. Now, another option I have in here is if I just wanted the company logo to be on this first page, all I would need to do is select this little option here, different first page. I'm then gonna go in and select my logo once more, close my header and footer. I have my logo on the first page, but not on any of the other pages. Double click to edit again, and let's go in and remove that header. So that's a very quick recap of how to add headers and footers in your document. Now you might be wondering, well, how does this relate to sections? Because that's what we're talking about in this section. Well, if you have your document sectioned up, it can greatly affect how your headers and footers are displaying. So let me give you an example using a page number. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add a page number onto every page. And page numbers you'll normally find in the footer area. So let's double click to edit our footer. And in the first group, you'll see that I have an option specifically for adding page numbers. I'm gonna select bottom of the page and let's keep things reasonably simple. I'm just gonna choose plain number two. We're just gonna put my page number in the center of my footer, like so. I'm gonna close my header and footer. And as you would expect, I now have a number one on page one. And then these will follow through. So then we have page two, page three, page four, page five, so on and so forth. So all looks good so far. Now remember, this is a document that doesn't contain any page breaks or any section breaks. Now if I was to add a page break into here, so let me just click here, do a control enter. Everything will renumber. So this is now page two, this is now page three, so on and so forth. Just gonna control Z to undo that. Now, when we start dividing up our document and creating sections, it might be that we don't always want the numbers just to flow through the pages one, two, three, four, five. For example, you might decide that you don't want a page number on the first page. And that's particularly common if you have something like a cover page. So let's insert a quick cover page. And I'm just going to choose Facet from the gallery. Now, most of the time, you're not going to want a page number on the cover page. It might also be that your second page is a table of contents. You might not want a page number on that either. So essentially, with this document just here, I don't want a page number on this page, but I want this page to start at one. So I'm going to double click in my footer. And I'm just going to remove this footer like so. So let's see what happens this time now that we have a cover page. I'm going to double click in the footer area. I'm going to untick different first page and I'm going to add in my page number. Now you'll see here I get a zero on my cover page and then I have number one, number two, number three, so on and so forth. So what essentially I want to do here is I want to remove the page number from that first page. Now this is a pretty easy thing to do because it is the first page. So all we would need to do is jump up to our design ribbon again and select different first page. And you can see it's removed the number from the cover page and my next page starts at number one. So that's a fairly straightforward thing to do if you just want a different first page. So let's now take a look at a scenario where it gets a little bit more complicated. I'm gonna add a blank page after this cover page. So I'm gonna click my mouse just above where it says company history. 
and I'm going to go to the insert tab and I'm going to utilize the blank page option in this pages group. I'm going to click and it adds in a blank page and you can see it's automatically put in a page break for me. Now it might be on this second page that I want to add a table of contents. So I'm going to type in table of contents. So now with the current way that I have my footers set up, you can see that the table of contents page is labeled number one, company history number two. Now essentially what I want to do is I don't want to have a number on the table of contents page. So you might think this is a pretty easy case of just double clicking on the footer and deleting out the page number. But look what happens when I do this. When I scroll down, you'll see that it's deleted the page number on every single page. And because the table of contents isn't the first page, that different first page option is not going to have any effect. So how do we deal with this? Well, you might think that if you go down to the company history page, double click the footer and add in the page number, it's going to number correctly. But again, it doesn't. This is page two and you'll see that it puts a number one on my table of contents page. So this is all a little bit awkward and we need to utilize section breaks in order to get this to work. So essentially what I want to do here is I want to section off where I want the page numbering to start. So I want the page numbering to start after the table of contents. Now I already have a page break in there, but I need to add a section break. So I'm going to say layout tab. We're going to go to breaks and I'm going to put in a section break continuous. I'm now going to go to my company history page, double click in the footer, and I'm going to add in my page number again. Now you can see here it's put a zero. And if I scroll up, you'll see that that table of contents page still has a number one. And this is being controlled by this option just here on the header and footer tools ribbon, the link to previous option. And you can see here it says link to the previous section to continue using the same header or footer. Turn this feature off to create a different header or footer for the current section. So essentially all of your headers and footers are linked throughout the document. So if you want a different header or footer, you need to unlink them. So I'm going to go down to the company history page. I'm going to highlight my page number and I'm going to unlink this page number from the other sections by clicking the link to previous button. So now that it's unlinked, I can go back to my table of contents page and I can delete out that page number. And you'll see when I scroll down, I still have my page numbers on the next pages. Now there's one other thing I need to fix here, and that is that this page is starting at zero. And I actually want the company history page to start at number one. So all I need to do here is a little bit of formatting on this page number. So highlight the page number, right click your mouse and go down into format page numbers. And in here I can choose a different style or number format if I want to. Now I'm quite happy with one, two, three. But at the bottom here under the page numbering group, it says start at and then currently it has zero. So I'm going to use my arrows and I'm going to put that up to one. Click on OK, close my header and footer. And now if we go to the top of the document, we should have it looking how we want. So I have my cover page. It's got no number, table of contents that has no number. And then my document actually starts with the correct page numbering. So if you do divide your document up using sections and you need to sort out the page numbering or anything else in the header or footer, remember to unlink from previous section if you want something different in the following section. I hope that all makes sense to everybody. That's it for this module. I will see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. This is still Deb and we are down in section seven where we're taking a look at dividing up a document using section and page breaks. And in the previous module, I showed you how you can work with headers and footers and section breaks. And in this module, I just want to show you another example, but this time utilizing page borders. So we're still working in our company history document and we're going to move down to page number two. 
Now what I want to do in here is I want to add a nice page border to this page and the following page only. And once again, I need to do this utilizing section breaks. So page borders you will find on the design ribbon over in this end group, the page background group. And it's the last option just here. Now, as we've seen before, if we don't divide up our document into sections, then our page borders are going to appear on all of our pages. So if I click page border, and I'm just gonna do a basic box border just here and click on OK, you can see this is the effect that I get. So I have my page border and it's on all of my pages. Now I'm gonna control Z to undo that because that's not exactly what I want. I only want to have a page border on, the, on this page and the following page. So I need to add in some section breaks. So I'm gonna to go to the page before this one. I'm gonna click my mouse at the end of the final paragraph and I'm gonna insert a section break. And we're gonna do a continuous section break and then I'm going to scroll down to the end of the second page and I'm gonna add in another continuous section break. So essentially now I've sectioned these two pages off. And if we look down in our status bar in the bottom left hand corner, you can see that I'm working in section three. So now that I've sectioned it off, I can safely go up to my design ribbon, go to my page borders option, and we're gonna do a slightly fancier border. So I'm gonna choose the dotted style. I'm gonna set the color to purple and the width, let's make it two and a quarter points. And you'll see over in the preview pane exactly what that's gonna look like. And this is an important section here. So it says apply to whole document. Now I only want to apply it to this section and click on okay. So now you can see I have my purple dotted border if I go to the page before, I don't have a border, which is good. If I go to the page after, I do, and then we're back to no page border. But now that I've done this, because I've added in more sections, you can see that my page numbering is now all messed up. So if we go to the top of the document again, the company history page is page number one, but this page is now also page number one. So the numbering has essentially restarted at this section. We then go to page number two, and then once again, we're back to page number one. So essentially what Word is doing is it's restarting the numbering after every section break. So we need to go in and fix this. So I'm gonna to go to the first page that has the border, and I'm gonna double click to jump into my footer. I'm going to select my page number. I'm gonna right click, and I'm gonna go into format page numbers. And I'm gonna select this option just here, continue from previous section and click on OK. So now you can see the number has changed to number two, number three, and then we're back to one. So we need to do exactly the same here. I'm gonna select the number, right click, format page numbers, continue from previous section. Close my header and footer, and now I should have my page borders and also correct page numbering that flows through those sections. So that is how you add page borders to specific parts of your document, and also how you can update the numbering once you've added in more sections. That's it for this module. I will see you in the next one. Hello everyone, welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're down in section seven where we're taking a look at dividing up our document using section and page breaks. And in the previous module, I showed you how you can add page borders to a specific section in your document and then reorder the page numbering. And in this module, we're going to take a look at another example. We're gonna utilize our book template and we're gonna add headers and footers that contain document properties and fields, and we're gonna get them to display on exactly the pages that we want, utilizing as section breaks. So just a reminder of this document that we're working in, it is our book template, how to create an online training course. And if you remember, we have a cover page, we then have a dedication, a table of contents, which is currently blank, and then we have our document. And this document is 44 pages long. And currently, I don't have any page numbering, I don't have anything in the footer or in the header. 
Now I want to start out by talking to you about document properties and fields. Now both of these you'll find under quick parts. So let's jump across to the insert ribbon, across to the text group, and we're going to click the quick parts drop down. And we've looked at some of these in previous modules. We've seen how to save items off as a quick part and reuse them. But what we haven't really touched on are these two options here, document property and field. Now these do differ very slightly. If I hover over document property, you'll see that I have a list of different properties in the menu. And I can utilize these and add them into my document. Now what you may have not noticed already is that when we inserted this cover page, this cover page actually has its own document properties. So if I scroll down to the bottom where we have this date, the company name and the company address, if I click on the date, you'll see just above it says date and it appears in this little rectangle box with a drop down, which allows me to select the date I want to add. This is a document property and this is the date property. I have the same thing if I click on Simon Says It, you can see that this is the company document property. And if I click on the address, this is the address property. So you'll see these used quite frequently in any templates that you download or cover pages that you add. Now you can add your own document properties throughout your document. And if I just show an example of why they're useful, let's jump down to this page just here. Now, maybe I wanted to add in the company name and the company address down here. What I could do is jump up to Quick Parts, go to Document Property, select Company, and what you'll see is that it will remember the company that you've set previously. So Simon Says It was used earlier on in this document on that cover page just here. So it's recognized that document property and it's automatically added it for me. So that makes things a lot quicker and simpler. If I then wanted to add in the company address, I could go back to Quick Parts, down to Document Property and select Company Address. And again, it's going to pick up the last address that was used. So this is a nice, really quick way of adding in content that you've used previously. Now, of course, if I wanted to change this, I could. I can just come in here, I can delete out what's there, and I can edit it with something else. If I just press delete and click away, it just says company address. And I'm gonna do the same here. I'm gonna delete out Simon Says It and click away. So if you are designing something like a template and you want people to enter something specifically into the document, document properties are a great way of kind of adding in a placeholder and guiding people towards what they need to put in there. So let's delete these out and let's utilize one of these in our header. Now, I don't want this to appear on the cover page, the dedication or the table of contents. So I'm going to double click on my header on the third page. And in my header and footer tools design ribbon in the insert group, you can see that I have document info and this will allow me to add in any of those document properties. So maybe I want the author of this document's name to be listed in the header. So I'm going to select author and you can see there that it's picked up my name. I'm going to close my header and footer and see what that looks like. So let's scroll up. It looks like I've got it on the table of contents, the dedication. It's not on that cover page, but it is on a couple of pages that I don't want it to be on. So again, we're going to need to utilize as section breaks. So I'm going to undo control Z to remove that document property field. And what I now need to do is essentially section off the rest of this document from the first few pages and then unlink my headers. So let's go up to the previous page where we have our table of contents. And after the page break, I'm going to insert a continuous section break. Now I want the author name property to appear throughout the rest of the document in that header. I just don't want it on the first few pages. So I don't need to add in any more section breaks, just this one after the table of contents. So now I have my section break after my table of contents. I've essentially sectioned off the first three pages from the rest of the document. So now if I want to add my document property into my header, I can double click on the first page where I want to add it. And you can see here it says first page header section two. 
I'm going to go up to my header and footer tools design ribbon. I'm going to untick different first page and then I'm going to add in my document property, which is author. So now I have my name as the author in the header. And if I scroll up to take a look at what the previous pages look like, you can see that I have it on the table of contents page, the dedication page, but I don't have it on that cover page. So essentially what I need to do is I need to remove it from the dedication and the table of contents page, but keep it on the rest of the document. So again, we're going to select our document property and we're going to unlink this header from the previous section by toggling off link to previous. So now when I scroll up, I'm going to safely delete out the author on the table of contents page. And you can see that that's removed it from the other pages. Close my header and footer, and now I should find I only have it from this page going forward. Now another thing that you can add into your documents are document fields. And fields differ very slightly from document properties because fields are something that can be updated. So if you've ever entered a table of contents into your document, which we are going to do in the following modules, you'll know that a table of contents can be updated by right clicking and selecting update field. Because essentially what is controlling that table of contents is a field called TOC. And that's the only thing you really need to know about fields, that they can easily be updated by right clicking or pressing the F9 key. So let's take a look at the different fields that we have access to. I'm going to jump up to the insert ribbon, go across to quick parts again, and this time we're going to select field. Now all of the fields, and there are a lot of them, are categorized into different groups. So for example, document information, which is the category I currently have selected, has all of these fields within it. So things like author, file name, file size, so on and so forth. So all of these are things which can be updated. So if I was to utilize the file size field, obviously the more I add to my document, the greater the file size is going to get. So if I want to make sure that the file size is always showing as correct in my document, I can just update the field. Now it's also worth noting that aside from manually updating fields by right clicking or pressing F9, fields will refresh or update when you save or open your documents. And what I'll do is I'm not going to go through all of these, I'll leave you to have a browse through all of the different field types that you have. But what we are going to do is we're going to add one of them into our document. But this time, I only want to add it on the first three pages. So I'm going to go down to my cover page footer, double click to edit. I'm going to go up to my header and footer tools design ribbon, and I'm going to jump into document info. Down to field, which will open up my field dialog box. And the information I'm going to add here is the information relating to the save date. I'm going to select my date format and I want a short date format and click on OK. And there we go. We now have the date that I last saved this document listed in my footer. And I can see that that is correct because I have saved this document today. So if I scroll down, I've got it on the first page, but I don't have it on the rest of the pages. Now that's because I have a different first page selected on the design ribbon. So I'm going to untick that and add my field in once more. Click on OK, and now if I scroll down, I should see that I have it on all of my pages. Now remember, I only want this on the first three, so we're going to need to do some sectioning. So let's close the header and footer, and we need to section off these first three pages. So I'm going to scroll down to the table of contents page, and you can see that I already have a section break in there because we sectioned off the remaining document in the previous example. So I don't need to add in another section break. So all I need to do is scroll down to the next page, double click in the footer and unlink it from the previous section. Close my header and footer. And if I scroll up, I still have it there, but it means that now I can safely delete it Close my header and footer, and it will be deleted on the first three pages, but I'm going to have it on the rest of my document. 
Now, one final thing I want to go through with you here is how to add multiple items into your header and footer. So currently in this footer, I have my field, which is showing the save date. But if I also wanted to add in some page numbers, if I double click, go up to page number and select bottom of the page as we have been doing, and if I select plane number three, which is going to put the page number over on the right hand side, you'll see that it actually gets rid of that field. So I can't add my page number in that way. What I could do is I could press my tab key to move across to the right hand side. And then when I add my page number, I could say current position. And that's going to add a page number wherever my cursor is currently clicked. Another thing I might want to do if I have maybe three pieces of information that I want to add is I could utilize one of the footer templates. And you can see here the second one down is blank three columns. And that's going to give me three areas where I can add in information. So I'm going to click on the first one that says type here. And I'm going to add in my field, which is going to be save date. I'm going to click in the middle one and this time I'm going to add in a document property and that is going to be the title of the document. And in the third one, I'm going to add in my page number. I'm going to say current position, plain number, and there we go. Now again, you can see this page number is showing a zero. So all I need to do is select my page number, right click, format page numbers and start that at one and click on close header and footer. Now I'm going to turn off my show hide markers and let's take a look at our document. So we have a cover page with no header and no footer. We have a dedication, a table of contents, which we're going to complete later. And then we have the start of our document, which contains our header and our footer. So that is how you can utilize document properties and fields in your headers and footers and how you can use templates to add in multiple pieces of information. That's it for this module. I will see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're down in section seven where we've been looking at dividing up our document using section breaks and page breaks. And throughout this section, we've been looking at how section breaks affect other elements in our documents. And in this very quick module, I just want to show you how you can utilize another style of break, and that is the column break. Now, as we've seen previously, by default, when we're working in a Word document, we're essentially working in a one column layout. But we can change the entire document or sections of the document so that it flows in more of a column format, a newspaper style. And when it comes to breaks, you have an option for column break. And this is what I want to demonstrate to you very quickly right now. So we're back in our company history document, which just contains some junk text. And the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a section and I'm going to put that section into a different column layout. So I want this first paragraph to be in one column, which it is, but I want the next three paragraphs to be in column layout. So I need to section off these three paragraphs. I'm going to click my mouse at the end of that first paragraph. I'm going to jump up to break and I'm going to insert a continuous section break. I'm going to go down to the end of the third paragraph in this section, and I'm going to add in another continuous section break. So essentially, I've sectioned off these three paragraphs. I'm now going to change the layout of this section. I'm going to go up to columns and I'm going to say that I want a two column layout. And there we go. So the paragraph above is one column. We then have two columns and then it goes back to one column after the section break. Now, all that a column break is, is if you want to essentially break these columns. So I have this first little paragraph just here. And it might be that I want to add in a break or a column break so that everything below is pushed into the next column. And that's all a column break is. So I'm going to click my mouse at the end of this first paragraph in the first column. I'm going to go up to breaks and select the column option. And there we go. You can now see that everything else has been pushed into that second column. And we have our column break indicated after that first paragraph. 
So now that I've done that, I have this bit of blank space. And just for fun, I might want to add in a 3D model of whatever this document is related to. And we're just going to select the Earth. And I can then move that into the space that has been created. And remember, something else you might want to do here is if we go back up to Layout and into Columns, I'm going to jump down to More Columns and I might want a line between my columns like so. So that is it, just another tool for getting your document layout to look exactly as you want it to look. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next module. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. This is still Deb and we are down in section 7 where we've been taking a look at breaks, predominantly section and page breaks. In this module, we're going to take a look at a different way of dividing up your document, and that is by using master and sub documents. Now, you may or may not have heard of master and sub documents. They have been around in Word for a very long time, but they tend to be something that are not as widely used, mainly because I find people don't really understand what they are and why they are useful. And I will say they are only really useful if you are someone who works with very large documents. And I'm talking 100 pages plus. So the most obvious example of this would be if you are writing a book. So let's use that as our example. Now, if you are writing a book that's several hundred pages long, saving it as a single document can be impractical. So when you started writing your book, you just opened up a Word document and you've written all of your chapters in one document, causing your Word document to be hundreds of pages long. And what that means is that even performing simple tasks on that document, like editing, Copying, pasting, searching, even doing things like find and replace are less efficient the larger the document comes. Sometimes it's a lot easier to manage a large document if you split it up into smaller documents and then essentially merge them together, which is pretty much what the master and sub documents feature is all about. And that is exactly what we're going to do here. So in this example, we are going to run with that example of a book. And this is my book template from earlier with a title page of how to create an online training course. And then as I scroll down, you'll see at the start here, I have a dedication. I then have a foreword, some acknowledgements, and then some introductory text. I then have a part one cover page. And what I hope to have after this are all of my chapters that make up part one. Now, previously, I just had all of my chapters in this one document. What I'm going to do here, and you can see that I've already deleted them out, is that I've actually saved each chapter off into its own separate Word document. And you can see all of those files sitting just here. So I've created a folder on my desktop called Chapters, and then I have Chapter 1, Chapter 2, Chapter 3, so on and so forth. So essentially, I have a whole bunch of mini sub documents that I want to put into this master document. And what this means is that in future going forward, if I need to do any editing or if I need to do any formatting changes, I have my document divided down into smaller chunks, which is a lot easier to manage and also a lot easier for Word to process efficiently. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, if I've got everything saved off into different documents, isn't that going to make it a lot harder when I want to print or publish this book? Well, no, that is one of the features of master and sub documents. So what we're going to do here is after part one, I'm going to go down onto this blank page and I'm going to insert the chapter one sub document. Now, the first thing I need to do here is we need to work in outline view. So let's jump up to our view ribbon into our views group and click on outline. So I'm going to scroll up and you can see here I now have this document in outline view. I have my part one and it says write your part one title. Now, if you want to, to make this a bit clearer to see, you can also jump to home and turn on your paragraph marks so you can also see exactly where you have page breaks. So I have a page break after this part one cover page. So I want to make sure that my mouse is clicked just after that page break. Now, as soon as I jump into outline view, I get the outlining contextual ribbon. And the group of commands we're going to be working with are in this master document group. 
And currently I only have one that's available for me to access, that is the Show Document button. So when I click on this button, you'll see it gives me a couple of other options that I can use. The first one is Create and the second one is Insert. Now in this example, we're going to be using Insert because I already have my sub documents saved off. So let's click on Insert and you can see it takes me to File Explorer where I can then browse for my sub documents. So it's jumped me straight to the correct folder, which is brilliant. So I'm going to select Chapter 1 and click on Open. And you can see it puts that chapter into the master document. And in this particular view, in Outline View, this does look kind of ugly, but rest assured when you switch back to Print Layout View, the document's going to look completely normal. And when you print or publish it, it's going to look absolutely fine as well. Now let's just check that. Let's close Outline View to jump back to Print Layout View and see what our document now looks like. So I have my Part 1 cover page. Scroll down and there we go, I have my Chapter 1. But essentially, I'm working within a sub-document now when I'm clicking around in this area. Let's go back to the View Ribbon and into Outline View. And let's insert our next chapter. So I'm going to click underneath my first chapter, up to Show Document, click on Insert, and I'm going to select Chapter 2 and click on Open. And there we have Chapter 2. Now my final two chapters I'm going to put in after this Part 2 page. So I want to make sure I'm clicked after the section break, up to Insert, Chapter 3, Open, Insert, Chapter 4, Open. And I could carry on going. Now if I close Outline View again, you can see that in the document this is all looking absolutely fine. So nothing weird is going on here, even though it does look a little strange when you're viewing it in Outline View. And of course, if you see anything that looks a bit strange, like section breaks that shouldn't be there, you can of course delete those out. Now let's jump back to our Outline View one more time, because I just want to show you what the difference is when it comes to this Insert and Create button. So insert is if you already have a sub document saved off. You would use the create button if you want to create a sub document on the fly essentially. So if I click on create, you can see it opens up this little box here and this is essentially a sub document. So I could manually type my sub document directly into this section. And what you'll also see up in the master document group is that I also now have an unlink button. And this is essentially if you want to remove your sub document. So it says delete the link to the sub document and copy the sub document content into the master document. So if I click unlink, you can see that it's got rid of the sub document, the little box around the outside which denotes a sub document. And this junk text that I've just typed in is now part of the main document. I could do the same for the one above. So if I'm clicked in this sub document just here, so this is chapter four, you can see that the unlink button now becomes active again. And if I click it, it's going to remove this sub document and just make chapter four part of the master document again. Now, another advantage of creating your document in this way is that you're reducing the size of your main file. So if you have a master document that has 350 pages, that file size is going to be very large. By breaking it down into smaller chunks, you're managing smaller file sizes. So it means you're going to have less of an issue with things running a little bit slowly or maybe a little bit of lag when you're working in your documents. And when it comes time to print your book, if we just close out of Outline View, You'll see if we jump across to File and go down to Print, the document looks exactly as you would expect it to look. So utilizing master and sub documents is something to consider if you work with extremely long documents and you want to do it in a way that's really efficient and makes your life easier. That's it for this module. I will see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We've made it all the way down to exercise 7 and in this exercise I want you to practice the skills that you've learned in this module related to working with sections and breaks. 
Now, as usual, I want you to recreate what I have on the screen here. So let's run through the document so you know exactly what it is that you need to do. Now, you're going to start out with this template that I've created. And this first page is just a cover page. And then when we scroll past that cover page, we have the rest of our document. Now, some things I want you to note here and to make this a bit clearer, I'm going to turn on my show hide markers. So you can see here that after that cover page, I've changed the orientation of page two. So page two is in landscape. Now, this is the only page in the document that's in landscape. You'll see on page three, it continues on in portrait mode. So I want you to make sure that you've added the relevant section breaks in the correct places in order to be able to achieve this. What you'll also see is that on page two, I have added a header all about coffee, which is the document title. And I've also added a three column blank footer. And the information in here are all document fields. So the first document field I have here is the date. The second document field is the author. And then I have the page number. Now, remember, when you're inserting page numbers, which one of the options you select is extremely important. So if I just quickly remind you, if we click the page number drop down, make sure that you select the correct one of these. So think about where you're clicked and which option you need to use. As we scroll down a bit further, you can see we go back to portrait orientation. And then finally, on the last page, we have our text in two columns. So when you're doing this exercise, you really need to think about where you need to position those section breaks and the type of section break that's most appropriate for what you're trying to do. Now, when you've done this, you're probably going to find that your page numbering looks a bit strange. So you're going to have to go in and format those page numbers to get them flowing through the document correctly. And if this is the first time that you're practicing this, it can be a little tricky to get it right. If you need to, please go back and rewatch the video where we talked about adding headers and footers into documents. If you need to, please go back and refresh your memory by watching the video where we looked at adding headers and footers into documents. Now, if you manage to do all of that correctly, you should end up with a document that looks something like this. So you can see all of my page numbers are correct. I have all my sections split up nicely. I have that second page in landscape. And also you'll notice I don't have a header or a footer on that cover page. So that's another important point to note. See how you go with that. This one can be a little tricky. I will say that. So if you want to check out my answer, then carry on watching this video. OK, let's take a look at the answer to this exercise. So the first thing I would do here is I have my cover page and I know that I don't want a header or a footer on this cover page. So I'm going to scroll straight down to page two and double click in that header area. Now, the first thing I'll do so that I don't get any headers and footers on that first page is I would go up to my header and footer ribbon and make sure that I have the checkbox different first page selected, which I do. So now I want to add in information into the header first of all. And what we want in the header is the title of the document. So again, on the header and footer ribbon in the insert group, I'm going to go to document info and select document title. Now that's all I'm going to have in the header. Let's scroll down to footer and click. Now in this one, I want to add in the three column template. So on the header and footer ribbon in the header and footer group, I'm going to go to footer and select blank three columns. So now I can go through and complete the information. So let's click on the first field just here. And what I want in here is the date and the time. So up to insert date and time. I'm going to choose the top format and click on OK. The middle one here, I want the author name. So back up to document info and author. And finally, in the last one, I want the page number. So I'm going to go across to page number. And I said, be careful of which one of these you select. And that's because people have a tendency to go straight to bottom of page and then select one of these. But because we're using a template, that's not going to work. We want to make sure we select current position. So wherever we're clicked, that's where the page number is going to enter. That's where the page number is going to display. 
and I'm just going to choose that plain number and it's going to give me a one. So if I now scroll up and just check that first cover page, that's all looking good. I don't have a header or a footer, but I do have my header and footer on the next page and I can see that that's all flowing through quite nicely. So at this stage, I'm going to close my header and footer. Now currently in this document, we're just working in one section. I haven't added in any section breaks whatsoever. But that's going to change because we want to change the page orientation of page two. So for this, I need to start adding in section breaks. I need to isolate page two from the rest of the document in order to change the orientation. So I'm going to click just before where it says an Ethiopian legend, and I'm going to say layout breaks, and I'm going to insert a section break, but I'm going to put in a continuous section break. Now you'll see as soon as I do that, the header and the footer disappear off of this page only. And that's because this is a new section. So essentially this is page one of the new section. And if I double click in the header, because I have different first page selected, it's thinking that this is the first page and I don't want a header and footer. So all I need to do here to pull that back is just deselect different first page and click close header and footer to pull that header and footer back again. Now don't worry too much about the page numbers at this stage, we'll deal with those later. Now if I turn on my show hide paragraph markers so we can see what we have, so now I want to add in another section break to push any text that I don't want on the landscape page onto the next page. So on my landscape page, I only really want the information for an Ethiopian legend and the Arabian Peninsula. So I'm going to click my mouse right at the end of the text for the Arabian Peninsula. I'm going to go up to layout and into breaks and this time I'm going to add a section break, but I want it to push everything else onto the next page. So I'm going to say section break next page. And now because I've essentially sectioned off this text, I can click anywhere in this section, go up to my layout ribbon across to orientation and switch that to landscape. And I should be able to see that my cover page stays in portrait and every page thereafter is also in portrait. So now we've done that, let's take a look at our page numbering because things are starting to go a little bit crazy. So you can see here on page two, my page number is currently saying zero. And then on the final page, I have one, which doesn't really make too much sense. So what I'm going to do here is double click in this footer, select the page number, right click and say format page numbers. And I'm going to start this at page one and click on OK. Let's scroll down and take a look. So this page number is now correct. But if I scroll down, remember, this is a brand new section. It says zero. Now, because this is the same section from this point forward, all I need to do here is highlight the page number, right click, format page numbers and say continue from previous section. And you'll see that that will then follow on from whatever is in that previous section. So now it goes one, two, and three. So that's looking perfect. So the final thing I wanted you to do was to add in some columns for this last section called coming to America. So once again, I need to add in some section breaks. So I'm going to click just above, go up to breaks and say section break next page. I'm going to click at the end of this section and add in a break. And this time we're going to do section break continuous. So now I can just select all of this text, click on columns, and say two columns, and there I have my newspaper style layout. So that is pretty much what I wanted you to do. I wanted you to really have a play around with this because out of all of the things that we've gone through in this course, I find that this is usually something that people really struggle with. And I understand it can be very, very fiddly and take a little while to get the hang of what you need to do and when. So as with all of these things, practice makes perfect. Feel free to rewatch the video as many times as you like and utilize those exercise files to practice. That's it for this exercise. I will see you in the next section. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We've made it all the way down to section eight. And in this section, I'm going to talk to you about different types of links or hyperlinks that you can add into your document. Now, links enable you to link to external documents, web pages, email addresses, and even different sections of a document. 
and they're extremely useful if you need to reference maybe something on the web, if you want to provide a quick way for someone to jump to another Word document or Excel spreadsheet, or even if you just want to help people navigate efficiently around your document. So in this module, I'm going to show you an example of each type of link that you can add into your documents. So on the screen here, I have opened the employment contract. And this is a reasonably short document. It's only five pages long, but we're going to add in some links into this document to make it a little bit more informative and easy to navigate. Now, there are a couple of different ways that you can add links into documents. You can right click your mouse and you'll see that in the right click menu, you have an option for link. Alternatively, if you jump up to the insert ribbon, right in the middle there, we have a group called links. And one of the options that we have is link. So I'm going to say insert link. So now we get the insert hyperlink dialog box. And on the left hand side, we have three options that we can link to existing file or web page, place in this document or email address. And we're going to go through each one of these. So first, let's look at existing file or web page. So you would use this option if you wanted to create a hyperlink to maybe another document. So for example, the document we're in currently is an employment contract. So maybe I want to link to a Word document that contains the full description of this particular job. I would do that from this option. Now, alternatively, I could link to a web page from this option as well. And that's the first thing that we're going to tackle. Now you'll see at the top here, it says text to display. So what do you want to display in the document? So when you add the link to your document, what do you want it to say? Now, currently this field for me is blank. So I could come in here and type in the text that I want to display. Or alternatively, if I click cancel on here, maybe I want to link to the government website that contains all the information related to the Employment Rights Act of 1996. So what I could do is select the text, right click and jump into link. And this time you'll see that the text to display is now the same as the text that I've got highlighted. So that's a more efficient way of doing things. What I can then do is just jump straight to the address field at the bottom and type in the web address. Alternatively, I have a browse the web option just here. So this will open up an internet window and you can see mine has opened in Internet Explorer. I could then choose to go to the Employment Rights Act 1996. I can click on this link, which takes me to the correct government web page. And if I just close this down, you'll see that it automatically populates that address in the address field. I can click on OK. And there we go. I now have a hyperlink created and you'll see as I hover over it, I get that little screen tip that says control click to follow the link. Now, when you insert a link, it's going to show in this blue color and blue denotes that the link hasn't been clicked yet. You'll see in a moment when we actually click on the link, the link color will change. Now, unfortunately, you can't change the color of the clicked link, but you can change the color of the link prior to it being clicked. So if I wanted this to be red as opposed to blue, I can highlight the link, right click my mouse and I have a font option. And of course, from here, I can change the actual font, the font style, the size, the color, all of our usual font formatting options. So I'm going to change this to red, click on OK, and it's now appearing in red. When I hover over the link, I get a little screen tip that tells me hold down control and click to follow this link. So if I hold down control, you'll see that my cursor changes to a hand icon, click on the link, and it's going to open up a new window that jumps me straight to that specific web page. And what you'll see now is that now that I've clicked on that link, the link has changed to a purple color. Now, if I wanted to edit this link in any way, if I right click my mouse, I now have some additional options, edit hyperlink, open, copy and remove. So if I say edit hyperlink, it's going to pop open that box again and I can replace the web address or change the text to display. Now, something else that's worth doing is adding in a screen tip. Now, you'll see over on the right hand side, we have a button for screen tip and we've talked about screen tips throughout this course. Every time we hover over an icon on our ribbon, we get a screen tip. 
and you can add your own screen tips to links so that people know exactly what's going to happen when they click on that link. So I'm going to click on the screen tip button and I'm going to add in some screen tip text. Click the link to jump to the Employment Rights Act 1996 on the government website. Click on OK, click on OK again, and now when I hover over, I get that information just above in that screen tip. So it's always recommended that you do add these in for informational purposes. Now another even quicker way that you can add in a link to a web page is simply by typing the web address. So if you look at the line underneath, it says you, Marcus Bird, began working for Kramer Martin Chase LLP. And maybe I just want to add the web address of the company website after the company name. So if I type in www.kmcllp.com, all I need to do is press the spacebar or the enter key and it's automatically going to make that a hyperlink. And once again, I could go in, I could change the font color so that it matches the other hyperlinks that I have in my document. Now, another thing I could do is link to an external document. So if I move a bit further down my employment contract, I have a section here for brief description of the job. And it says underneath your responsibilities are set out in the job description attached to this statement. So if I have the full job description saved off in another Word document, I can add that in as a link as well. So let's right click and click on link. And we're going to stay on the same option, existing file or web page. But this time we're going to browse to find the file that we want to link to. So I'm going to click on my, so I'm going to click on the browse for file icon. I can see my document sitting just here so I can select it. Click on OK. I'm going to add a screen tip that just says full job description. Click on OK again and OK. And there we go. Now that link is kind of a little bit ugly. So you might want to tidy this up by editing it. So if I right click on the link and go to edit hyperlink, instead of it displaying the full path of where I've picked that document up from, I'm just going to change the text to display to job description and click on OK. And that now looks a lot neater. And if I hold down control, it's going to open up that document. Now, another cool way that you can link in documents is that you can link to different sections of the same document. So let's scroll down a little bit. And I'm going to go to this holiday entitlement section. And I'm going to add a piece of text underneath that says, see other paid leave. Now I have a section further down this document called other paid leave. So what I want to do is create a link that's going to jump me down to that specific section. So I'm going to select my text, right click and select link. And this time I want to choose the link to place in this document option. And what this will do is it will pull in all of the headings within your document. So again, this is really important that you have your document styled correctly with heading styles. So all I need to do now is scroll through my list of headings and find the heading that I want to link to. And I can see that it's this one just here, other paid leave. I'm going to add a screen tip. Click to jump to other paid leave benefits. Click on OK. OK again. And now I have a link. I'm going to highlight it. I'm going to right click and change the font color so that everything is consistent. And now if I hold down my control key and click on the link, it's going to jump me to that specific section of the document. And the final type of link I'm going to show you in this module is how to link to an email address. So let's scroll all the way down to the bottom of this document. And you can see that under disciplinary rules and procedures, it says if you're unhappy with any disciplinary decision taken in relation to you, you can appeal by writing to Jane Doe. Now it might be that I want the name Jane Doe to link to an email address. So I'm going to right click and select link. And this time in the link to area, I'm going to say email address. 
And what I can do here is type in the email address for Jane Doe. And I can type in a default subject if I want to. So I'm going to type in inquiry. I'm going to add a screen tip that says click to email Jane Doe. Click on OK. Click on OK again. And now I have a link. So when you click on the link, it opens your default mail app. And you can see exactly what it's done. It's populated the email address and also the subject. Now, a couple of final points when it comes to adding in links. When you're linking to an external web page, sometimes it's nice to be able to control how that web page opens. So, for example, this first link here that says Employment Rights Act 1996, I'm going to right click and I'm going to edit that hyperlink. And what I can actually do here is I can choose my target frame. So if I want that to open in a brand new window, I can click the drop down here and I can say new window. And I'm going to set that as the default for all of my hyperlinks. Click on OK. Click on OK again. And now when I click on my links, they're going to open in a brand new window. And of course, the final couple of options that you have, if you right click on any of your links, you can choose to open them from here. You can copy a hyperlink or you can remove a hyperlink altogether, which would just take it back to plain text. Now, there is one option that we haven't explored in this module, and that is how to link to bookmarks. But we have an entire section on bookmarks, so I'm going to cover that then. But for now, that's it for this module. I will see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome back to this course on Word 2019 Advanced. We're down in section 8 and in this section we're talking about adding links into our documents. And in the previous module I showed you all the different ways that you can add in hyperlinks to external web pages, external files, other sections of the same document and also email addresses. And in this module I want to show you how you can link to and update Excel spreadsheets from within Word. So I've created a document for the Fresh Fruit Company and we have a nice little image at the top there and then we have some junk text. And what I want to do is where we have the heading Sales Figures 2019, I want to create a column chart that's going to display my data for quarter one. And as always with Microsoft, there are a few different ways that you can do this. So first, let's take a look at how you create an Excel chart from scratch. So I'm going to scroll down and click my mouse just under the sales figures heading. I'm going to go up to the insert ribbon and in the illustrations group, you can see there that we have an option for charts. So if we click this, it's going to open up the insert chart dialog box. And for any Excel users out there, you will know that this is exactly the same as what you get when you're working in Excel and trying to insert a chart. So listed on the left hand side we have all of our different chart types and there's a whole host of them in here for you to choose from. Now I'm going to keep things reasonably simple and we're just going to select a column chart. I'm going to click on OK and what happens is it inserts essentially a dummy chart into the document and it also opens a mini Excel window which shows the spreadsheet that contains the data being displayed in the chart. Now, whenever you do this, you're going to get a default series and category set. And this is really just there so you can see what the chart's going to look like. But of course, you can modify this. So I'm going to change my categories to the different fruits that I'm selling. And you can see as I click away, if you look at the chart, it automatically updates. I'm now going to change my series and I'm going to say this is for January. February and March, because we're just interested in the quarter one figures. And again, when I click away, you can now see that that legend has updated with those months. I can now add in my sales figures. So let's just add in some dummy data like so. Now, obviously, you could make this window bigger and you can add in as much data as you like. Once you've finished adding your data, you can simply close that Excel window down and you now have a lovely little chart in your Word document displaying your data. And if you want to make any edits to this chart, if you click on the chart, you'll see that you get the Chart Tools Contextual Ribbon that's showing the design and the format tabs. 
So I might want to change the chart style or maybe even change the colors. I can edit this chart title simply by double clicking on the text box and adding in a new chart title. Like so. I can even go as far as to add different chart elements. So once again, I can utilize my design ribbon and this first group, I can select a different element to add. So for example, I might want to add some data labels on the inside end of my chart. And you can see that that actually adds the figures into those chart bars. I might want to add something like an axis title, which is then just a text box that I can edit. And I might want to add another one of those axis titles for the primary vertical, like so. And I also have a whole host of different formatting options on the chart tools format ribbon. So this is where I can go in, select a specific element and format it. So for example, if I wanted to change the color of these green bars, if I just select one of the green bars, it's going to select them all. I can then jump up to shape fill and I can choose a lighter color green. It's also worth noting that a lot of these options you also have on these three little buttons that pop out to the side. So if I click on the plus, this allows me again to add different chart elements. I could even do something like add a trend line. I have a button here for different chart styles. So I could choose some pre-formatted styles to apply to my chart. And then right at the bottom, I have some filter options as well. So this is where you can edit what data points and names are visible on the chart. Another option I have up on the design ribbon is the ability to change the chart type. So if I decide that I no longer want a column chart, I could click change chart type. I can select a different chart. So let's go for a bar chart, click on OK, and it's going to change that for me. Now, there are so many options when it comes to formatting your charts. I'm not going to spend too much longer on this, but hopefully that gives you an idea as to how you can create an Excel chart and insert it into your Word document from scratch. Let's look at this in a different way. Now, I'm going to click on my chart, press delete to get rid of it. What about if I already have a chart that exists in an Excel spreadsheet. Well, as luck would have it, I do. And this is it just here. So I'm now working in Excel. You can see my data at the top and then a small column chart that I've created based on that data. So because this data exists in an Excel file already, I don't need to create it from scratch in my Word document. All I want to do is link to the charts. Now there are a couple of different ways that I can do this. One way, which is quite simple, is I can select the chart in Excel, press Control C to copy it, jump back to my Word document, and then essentially paste it in. But instead of doing a regular paste, I'm going to jump up to my home ribbon, click the lower half of the paste button, and I'm going to say paste special. So now I have two options. I can choose to paste or I can paste a link. And I can also select exactly what it is that I'm pasting. So I'm pasting a Microsoft Excel chart object. Now the difference between paste and paste link is that if I choose paste, it's going to insert this as a drawing. And if I make any changes to the original source file, they're not going to update automatically in my Word document. Whereas if I paste a link, then any changes I make in the Excel file will automatically update. So let's select the paste link option and click on OK. And there we go. So there is my chart. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to update the original source document so you can see how this works. So let's do a split screen like so. And now let's make one of these figures really crazy so it stands out. Let's say 500 sales of pairs in January and hit enter. So you don't see this chart update as yet, but if you click on it, right click and say update link, it's going to pull through that new data. Let's go in and delete out this chart. And I'm going to show you one final way that you can insert charts into your Word document. If we go up to the insert ribbon, all the way over in the text group, we have an option to insert an object. Now from here, we have two tabs, create from new or create from file. So if I wanted to create a brand new Excel worksheet, I could, it doesn't necessarily have to be a chart. 
I could select Microsoft Excel Worksheet, click on OK, and it's basically going to open up this floating worksheet and I can then go in and add in my data. So that is one way that you can do it. Let's go back into Object. The other way is we can create from file. So again, if you have a file that already contains the data you want to use, you can browse and select it. And I can choose to create a link to the file or I can choose to display it as an icon. So we haven't done this one yet. So let's do display as icon, click on OK. And there we go. So now we have it inserted as an icon and we can double click and it's going to open that file up in Excel. So those are the different ways that you can create an Excel file from within your Word document or insert data from an Excel file that already exists. That's it for this module. I will see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome back to the course. We've made it all the way down to exercise eight. And in this section, we've been taking a look at adding links into our documents. So in this exercise, I just want you to practice some of those skills that we've talked about in relation to adding different types of links into a document and also linking to other objects. So let's take a look at what I'd like you to do. So the first thing I'd like you to do is open exercise eight from the exercise files folder. And you'll see here what this document looks like when it's finished. Now, I haven't completely finished off this document as I haven't added a link for all of these bulleted items, but I've done the first three so you can get the idea. And that's the first thing that I'd like you to do. Now, what you'll see here is in this bulleted list of items, these basically relate to the headings that I have throughout this document. So you can see here it says the following ribbon tabs are available in Word 2019. Then we have home. And if you look further down the page, you can see that we have a heading that says home tab. We then have insert and a corresponding heading for that, so on and so forth. So essentially what I want these links to do is when you click on them, it jumps you to the relevant heading within that document. And you'll see here, if I hold down my control key and click on draw, it's going to jump me down to that specific heading. So I want you to set up these links so that they jump to the headings in the document. Now, if you want to do a little bit of an extra practice, what I would say to you is when you're adding in these links, also add in a screen tip and the screen tip can say whatever you'd like it to say. So that's the first part of the exercise. Let's scroll down the document. So then we get to the bottom of this document and you can see here it says commands on the ribbon. And then I have a link in here to an Excel chart. And if I double click on this link, it's going to open up that chart in a separate window. Now this chart is contained in the exercise files folder. So what I'd like you to do is just to create this link within the Word document that links to this Excel icon. And then finally at the bottom, you can see here it says for more information, visit the Microsoft website. And if I hold down my control key and click on the link, that's going to navigate me through to the Microsoft homepage. So this last part of the exercise really gets you to practice linking to external sources. So that is pretty much it for this exercise. And if you'd like to see my answer, then carry on watching this video. So let's take a look at the answer to this exercise. The first thing I asked you to do was to add in some links to these bulleted items that were going to jump to the relevant section when clicked. So I'm going to double click on home to select it, go up to the insert ribbon and in the links group, I'm going to select link. Now for this one, I am linking to another place in this document. So I want to make sure I select that option in the link to menu. And then I have all of my headings listed here. So I want to link home to the section titled home tab and click on OK. So let's test that out. If I hold down control and click, it jumps me down to the correct section. Let's do the next one. So double click on insert. You could also right click your mouse and go to link right at the bottom. I'm going to link to the insert tab this time. And remember, I said there was an optional activity. If you wanted to add a screen tip in, you would click on screen tip and you might want to say something like, please click here. To 
jump to the insert section. Click on OK, click on OK again. And this time, if I hover my mouse, you can see there is my screen tip text. And let's make sure this works. Hold down Control, click to jump down to that section. Now that's all I'm going to add into here. You could have gone through and added links for the rest of these if you wanted to have a really good practice. But hopefully just by demonstrating those two, you've got the idea as to what I was looking for. So let's now scroll down this document because the next thing I asked you to do was to add in that Excel chart. Now for this, we want to stay on the insert ribbon and go all the way over to the text group and click the object drop down. I'm going to say I want to insert an object. I don't want to create a new one. I want to create one from file. And this is where I can go in and browse for my Excel chart. And as I said, you will find that in the exercise files folder. There it is. I'm going to select it, click on insert. And to get it to show as just an icon, I select the display as icon option. Click on OK. And there is our chart. Let's double click to make sure this works. And I can see that it does. The final part of this exercise was to link to an external website. So once again, I'm just going to double click on the word Microsoft, jump up to link. And this time I'm going to link to an existing file or web page. The text to display is Microsoft. And then I just need to type in the address. Like so. Once again, I could add in a screen tip if I wanted to. Click on OK. And there we go. So that is pretty much everything I was looking for in this exercise. If you're not a subscriber, click down below to subscribe so you get notified about similar videos we upload. To get the course exercise files and follow along with this video, click over there. And click over there to watch more videos on YouTube from Simon Says It.